Section 1 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Avai in January 2011. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 9 The Wonders of Microscopy. Part 1. The use of a lens for magnifying purposes is ancient, but the first compound microscope was probably made in 1590 by a Dutchman, Zacharias Janssen, whose invention was followed up by Galileo a few years later. But it did not become an effective instrument till towards the middle of the 18th century. In a simple microscope, we look at the object directly through a lens or through several lenses. This kind of instrument is often used for microscopic dissection. But in the compound microscope, we look through an eye lens or ocular at an inverted image of the object formed inside the tube of the instrument by an object lens or objective. In all ordinary microscopes there are two lenses in the eyepiece and three lenses in the objective, and all sorts of ingenious devices have been invented for making the most of the magnifying power without losing clearness and definition. An Invisible World of Life In the early days of microscopy, the instrument was to a large extent a scientific toy. The observers magnified objects and often drew them very beautifully, but without making them more intelligible. There is not much gain in seeing a minute object loom large unless we understand it better. This was a necessary stage. Soon, however, great steps were taken, and one of these may be called the discovery of the invisible world of life. The pioneer explorer was surely the Dutch observer Leeuwenhoek, 1632 to 1723, who discovered minute creatures like the rotifers or wheel animalcules, which are common in ponds, and the infusorians, which abound wherever vegetable matter rots away in water. He made numerous microscopes, and though they had neither tube nor mirror, they were sufficient to enable him to demonstrate his animalcules before the Royal Society of London the fellows signing an affidavit that they had seen the little creatures. It was Leeuwenhoek also who, in 1687, discovered bacteria, the very minute organisms which cause all putrefaction, are responsible for bringing about many diseases, and are yet of immense service to many living creatures. It was not till long afterwards that Pasteur and others demonstrated the importance of bacteria, but it was a great event in the history of science when Leeuwenhoek first proved their presence. It was literally the discovery of a new world with a teeming population, with incalculable powers for good and evil. It must have been a seed in the human mind, this idea of an intense activity going on all unseen until men stuck lenses of glass in front of their own. Another great event, though its importance was not recognized till afterwards, was the discovery of the male elements or spermatozoa of animals, which fertilize the egg cells, so that these may begin to develop. This discovery was probably due, in 1677, to a medical student in Leiden, Louis de Hamen, who showed them to Leeuwenhoek, but it was not till more than a hundred years later that the meaning of these sperm cells was recognized. And it is interesting to remember that it was not till 1843 that another medical student, Martin Berry, in Edinburgh, observed for the first time in the rabbit the fertilization of the mammalian ovum by the spermatozoon. In modern times, an extraordinary intensity of research has been focused on the usually microscopic egg cell and the always microscopic sperm cell. In the union of these, an individual animal has its beginning, and it is interesting to trace this modern study, so important in connection with heredity, back and back to the Leiden student's first glimpse of spermatozoa. But we must not lose the wood in the trees. 
one of the real wonders of microscopy, rising high above any mere curiosity collecting, is the discovery of a world of invisible life. There are the bacteria, which may be regarded as the simplest of living creatures, there are the yeasts and the simple moulds, there are the single-celled green plants which play so important a role in the economy of the sea by providing food for humble animals like water fleas. There are the one-celled animals or protozoa, such as the chalk-forming foraminifera, the infusorians which often serve as middlemen between the products of bacterial putrefaction and some higher incarnation in crustacean or warm, and the death-bringing organisms of malaria and sleeping sickness. There are also many-celled animals of microscopic dimensions, such as the wheel animalcules of the pond and the minute crustaceans which play so important a part in the circulation of matter by feeding on the microscopic algae and infusorians in the water and being themselves devoured by fishes. There are also the invisible early stages of many important parasites whose life history would have remained quite obscure if naturalists had been without microscopes. It seems hardly too much to say that the system of animate nature would be uncomfortably magical if the microscope had not enabled us to detect the missing links in many a chain of events. The liver fluke, which often destroys the farmer's sheep, is a relatively large animal, about an inch long, but it starts its life as microscopic egg which develops into a microscopic larva that enters a water snail and has a remarkable history there. The tapeworm, with which man becomes infected by eating bad beef imperfectly cooked, may be several yards in length, but it began as a microscopic egg which was swallowed by a bullock and hatched into a microscopic boring larva, which eventually became the beef bladderworm. In hundreds of cases, the microscope reveals the life history. In the course of a few years, a very serious bee pest known as Isle of Wight disease, has spread throughout Britain, causing havoc among the hives and greatly discouraging a lucrative and wholesome industry. The nature and meaning of this disease remained baffling until strenuous and patient microscopic work by Rennie and White demonstrated that the plague was bound up with the presence of an extremely minute mite in the anterior breathing tubes of the bee. And when the cause of a disease is discovered, it is not usually long before investigation also reveals a cure. Intricacy of Architecture in Small Animals Long before there was any microscope, the use of the scalpel, helped sometimes by the simple lens, had revealed the intricacies of the body in man and in animals. We may save ourselves from exaggerating modern achievements by recalling how much Aristotle, 384 to 322 before Christ, knew of animal structure. He dissected many a creature, such as the sea urchin, he saw the beating of the tiny heart of the unhatched chick, he described how the embryo of the smooth dogfish is bound to the wall of its mother's oviduct, and much more besides. And Aristotle had his successors, few and far between, who kept up the anatomizing tradition long before there was any microscope. But what the early microscopists did was to reveal the fact that the multitude of minute creatures which it was hopeless to try to dissect had an intricacy of structure comparable to that in larger and higher animals. One of the pioneers in this exploration was the Italian Marcello Malpighi (1628–1694), who described the internal architecture of the silkworm as animal had never been described before. He worked so hard that he threw himself into a fever and set up inflammation in his eyes. Quote, Nevertheless, in performing these researches, so many marvels of nature were spread before my eyes that I experienced an internal pleasure that my pen could not describe. End quote. He discovered, for instance, the delicate branching air tubes, or trachea, which carry air to every hole and corner of the insect's body, 
and it is plain from this instance that he discovered internal structures which made the insect at once more intelligible. This sort of discovery, we still call the excretory organs of insects Malphigian tubes, was characteristic of the man, and characteristic of a kind of investigation which continues untiringly to the present day. It makes for a realization of the unity of organic nature to disclosing creatures which will pass through the eye of a needle the presence of organs comparable to those in man himself. Much of Malpighi's work was done with a simple lens, but he had also his microscope with two lenses, and in any case his name may be associated with the great discovery that, as far as intricacy of structure goes, size does not count for much. It is a very striking experience to observe a minute animal like the rotifer hydatina, not more than a pinprick in size, and to find that it has a food canal, a chewing apparatus, a nerve center, various muscles, a delicate kidney tube, and so on. Yet it is such a pygmy when all is said. There are little beetles, trichopterygids, well represented in Britain, which are sometimes only one hundredth of an inch in length, practically invisible. Yet within that small compass there is the same kind of intricacy that is found in a Goliath beetle, brain and nerves, muscles and food canal, air tubes and kidney tubes, blood and germ cells. He would be a bold man who says he quite understands how there is all this intricacy within bulk so small. But this we venture to call the second wonder of microscopy, that great intricacy of structure may occur in a microscopically minute living body. Intricacy of Vital Architecture we have singled out the name of Malpighi in Italy as a pioneer in the exploration of the structure of minute animals, but we might have taken with equal justice Swammerdam in Holland, whose precision of minutiose observation has rarely been equalled. He is memorable not only for his anatomy of small creatures, but, like Malpighi, for his minute anatomy of larger ones, and here we might also include the early British microscopists Hook and Gru. For this was another line of advance, to disclose the intricacy of vital architecture that lay beyond the limits of scalpel and simple lens. Thus it was a great step when Swammerdam discovered in 1658 the blood corpuscles of the frog, when Malpighi demonstrated the air cells in the lung where the gases interchange takes place between blood and air, when Leeuwenhoek completed Harvey's theory of the circulation of the blood by demonstrating in 1680 the capillary connection between arteries and veins. Speaking of the tail of the tadpole, he said, quote, A sight presented itself more delightful than any mine eyes had ever beheld, for here I discovered more than 50 circulations of the blood in different places, while the animal lay quiet in the water, and I could bring it before my microscope to my wish. For I saw not only that in many places the blood was conveyed through exceedingly minute vessels from the middle of the tail toward the edges, but that each of the vessels had a curve or turning and carried the blood back toward the middle of the tail in order to be again conveyed to the heart." End quote. Such was the momentous observation of the fact that the arteries leading from the heart and the veins leading back to the heart are bound into one system by the intermediation of the capillaries. This is an easy illustration of the kind of service microscopy has never ceased to render, making vital activity more intelligible by revealing the intricacy of structure for it is in a study of the structure that we get a better understanding of the ways and means of life. It is not the whole story of the workshop to know the furnishings and the tools, but it is an essential part of the story. We hastily draw away our finger from a hot plate, a reflex action. It is only with the help of the microscope that the physiologist can tell how the message travels by sensory nerve cells to intermediary nerve cells 
and thence to motor nerve cells which command the muscles to move our mouth waters at the sight of palatable food it is only by help of the microscope that the physiologist is able to trace the message from eye to salivary glands and to show how in the cells or unit corpuscles of these glands there is a preparation of secretion which is discharged when the trigger is pulled by a nervous command the study of vital activity requires experiment and chemical analysis but it cannot dispense with the microscope so we venture to say that the third wonder of microscopy is the revelation of the intricacy of minute structure End of section 1section two of the outline of science volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox .org. read by avai in january two thousand eleven the outline of science volume two by j arthur thompson chapter nine the wonders of microscopy Part two The Stones and Mortar of the House of Life It is a long and tangled story which tells us of the gradual discovery of the cells or unit areas of which all but the simplest living creatures are built up, and of the living matter or protoplasm which these cells contain or portion off. The genius of the short lived French anatomist Bichat had analyzed a living body into a web of tissues nervous muscular glandular connective and epithelial but to schwann and schleiden virchow and gutzer is due the credit of a further advance the cell theory certainly one of the triumphs of microscopes with brains behind them the cell theory or cell doctrine states three facts one that all plants and animals have a cellular structure being either single cells or combinations of numerous cells two that every living creature reproduced in the ordinary way begins its life as a single cell and if it does not remain at that humble level proceeds to build up a body by the division and redivision of cells which eventually form tissues and organs and three that the activities of a many-celled organism are the coordinated summation of the activities of the component cells every animal virchow said appears as a sum of vital units not that we are to think of an ordinary animal as a colony of cells as a mob is a collection of angry men or even as a battalion is a coordination of disciplined soldiers it is nearer the truth to think of the fertilized egg cell a potential organism when we come to think of it dividing and redividing into cells so that the unified business of life may be more effectively carried on by division of labor as one of the greatest of botanists said it is not that the cells form the plant it is rather that the plant makes the cells the microcosm of the cell notably aristotle the early naturalists were content to study the outsides of animals like hearts and lungs bichat marks the deeper penetration to the tissues that make up the organs then came the recognition of the cells that compose the tissues finally there was the recognition of protoplasm which huxley called the physical basis of life it may be useful to place the different levels of study in a clear scheme the old picture of a cell was that of a little drop of living matter with a kernel or nucleus and sometimes with an enclosing wall but the revelations of the microscope have made this picture obsolete we have to think of a more or less unified minute area of great chemical diversity with complex particles and unmixing droplets restlessly moving in a fluid in the center of this whirlpool with its flotsam of reserve products and waste products there floats the nucleus a little world in itself 
inside its membrane through which materials are ever permeating out and in there are readily stainable nuclear bodies or chromosomes usually a definite number for each species and each chromosome is built up of bead-like microsomes strung on a transparent ribbon it begins to make one's head real cell nucleus chromosomes microsomes but it is all fact inside the nucleus there may be a nucleolus or more than one and outside the nucleus there is a minute body called the centrosome which plays an important part in the division of the cell this is not nearly all but it is enough to suggest how complex is the microcosm of the cell inside each of man's cells there are about two dozen chromosomes and one of the authorities on cell lore speaks of each chromosome having the corporate individuality of a regiment the really indivisible living units being the beads or microsomes which correspond to the man and to this must of course be added the fact that we have many millions of these cells in our body indeed we are fearfully and wonderfully made the beginning of the individual every many-celled creature which reproduces in the ordinary way starts on the journey of life as a single cell the fertilized ovum as we have made clear in a previous article the usually microscopic fertilized egg cell contains in some way that we cannot picture the initiatives or factors for the hereditary characters of the living creature in question but the microscope has begun to reveal the little world within the egg cell and it has been found possible to map out the way in which the factors for certain characters are disposed in the chromosomes thus in the case of the egg of the fruit fly called drosophila it is possible to say that the hereditary or germinal factor for say red eye or gray wing lies at such and such a level in one of the four chromosomes it would be difficult to find a wonder of microscopy greater than this yet this is but an instance of what goes on at a level of visibility which only the microscope can reach we know much in regard to the permutations and combinations which take place when the germ cell is ripening shufflings of the hereditary cards which throw some light on the origin of new departures we know something of the manner in which the paternal and maternal hereditary contributions behave in relation to one another when and after fertilization takes place we know much in regard to the sequence of events in individual development wherein the obviously complex emerges from the apparently simple and the implicit inheritance becomes an explicit individual in the seventeenth century william harvey the discoverer of the circulation of the blood wrote in regard to development Quote, although it be a known thing subscribed by all that the fetus assumes its original and birth from the male and female and consequently that the egg is produced by the cock and hen and the chicken out of the egg yet neither the schools of physicians nor aristotle's discerning brain have disclosed the manner how the cock and its seed doth mint and coin the chicken out of the egg End quote but although we do not understand today how the factors of an inheritance are condensed into the dimensions of a pinprick or how the fertilized egg cell segments into two and cleavage after cleavage continues with associated division of labor until an embryo is built up we do know why it is that like tends to beget like why certain hereditary characters are distributed in a particular way among the offspring and we also know the successive steps by which the process of development is accomplished it is this kind of knowledge we think which must be regarded as the crowning wonder of microscopy these fundamental questions of heredity and development will be discussed in a separate article but the point here is that the scientific study of inheritance can as little disperse with microscopy as with breeding experiments and statistics all three are essential manifold uses of the microscope 
everyone knows that fingerprints are sometimes of critical importance in the identification of a criminal. The details of the pattern of the ridges on the fingers vary from man to man. They are individual. Therefore, if a good impression is available on some surface which has been handled in the course of a burglary, let us say, it can be compared with the collection in the album of criminals' fingerprints, and identification may follow. The microscope has even subtler use in the detection of crime. If splashes of blood on the clothes of a suspected murder are declared by him to be due to the blood of a rabbit which he killed, it is usually possible to test the truth of his statement microscopically. For the dimensions of the very minute red blood corpuscles differ in different mammals, and the circular shape in all mammals, except camels, can be distinguished at a glance from the elliptical shape in all the other backboned animals. Moreover, the red blood pigment of hemoglobin can be easily made to assume a crystalline form, and it is a very remarkable fact that the blood crystals of the horse can be distinguished microscopically from those of the ass, and even those of the domestic dog from those of the wild Australian dingo. Poisons that crystallize may also be detected by means of the microscope. The use of the microscope in medicine may be illustrated in reference to the blood. For it is often possible by microscopically examining a film of blood spread on a slide to tell what is wrong with the patient. Microscopic parasites may be detected, like those of malaria, methods of counting the red blood corpuscles, man has trillions, may show that they are far below the proper number, and the change in the normal shape of the hemoglobin crystals may show that something is amiss. It is unnecessary to dwell on the medical importance of the microscope in determining the presence or absence of certain kinds of microbes and higher parasites in the blood or food canal of the patient. Along with this physiological utilization of the microscope, we may take its use in testing drinking water, which is liable to be fouled by the presence of bacteria and various minute animals. Also of great importance is the microscopic study of milk, for this fluid is peculiarly liable to contamination and is very suitable for the growth of various kinds of disease germs. For the detection of adulteration, the microscope is also invaluable. The starch grains of different plants, such as potato, wheat, rice, mice, are readily distinguished from one another and a microscopic examination may immediately prove that a commodity sold under a particular name, for example as arrowroot, is not what it professes to be. If a sample of so-called honey contains no pollen grains, but a great many starch grains, we may be sure that the busy bee was not the chief agent in its production. In short, the microscope is a valuable detective of dishonesty. But the use of the microscope more important and more pleasant to think of is in metallurgy, where its utilization to detect the structural features of the stable and the transient in various metallurgical combinations, such as different kinds of steel, has been of inestimable importance. A farmer can always make good use of a lens in examining samples of seeds or in identifying particular kinds of injurious insects or in detecting the beginnings of rusts and mildews on his crops. But the expert agriculturist must of course go much further, especially in warm countries, where the microscope is necessary for the study of the insidious fungi, which are always ready to find a weak spot in the plant's defenses, in all sorts of plantations, from coffee to rubber. The Ultramicroscope Early in the 20th century, an ingenious method was described by Siedentopf and Sigmondi, which is often briefly referred to as the ultra-microscope. Everyone knows from personal observation that a strong beam of sunlight entering a darkened room reveals a multitude of dust particles, which are not seen at all in ordinary light. The same multitude of particles is often seen in the track of a strong beam from a magic lantern in a darkened room. 
these dancing particles, whose abundance we scarcely suspected, become visible because they are so strongly illuminated. There is a diffraction of rays from their surface, and they look much bigger than they really are. In 1899, Lord Rayleigh pointed out that a particle too small to be seen by the highest power of the microscope under ordinary conditions might be made visible if it received sufficiently intense illumination, and the ultramicroscope took advantage of this idea. It occurred to Siedentopf and Sigmondi that if the particles in a solution could be strongly illuminated by a beam coming in, so to speak, sideways, then particles ordinarily invisible might stand out. Their diffraction images, at any rate, would be seen. In ordinary microscopic conditions, the beam of light is thrown by the mirror, usually through a substage condenser, directly through the solution or thin transparent section, up into the tube of the microscope, where an image is formed, to be reformed by the eyepiece. In the ultramicroscope for examining solutions, the beam of light is projected horizontally into the solution and examined from above. The result is that particles ordinarily invisible are seen in a vigorous dance, the so-called Brownian movement. This dance is due to the particles being bombarded by the moving molecules of the fluid in which they are suspended. By accessory devices, it becomes possible, in the use of the ultramicroscope, to count the number of particles in a solution and to measure the mass of each. This has formed the basis of exceedingly interesting conclusions, which are unfortunately beyond our scope in this article. A reference should be added, however, to another method called dark ground illumination, which makes structures visible which are invisible in ordinary conditions of microscopic work. Professor Bayliss writes, quote, The central rays of the illuminating beam are cut out by means of a stop, and the peripheral rays are reflected by a parabolic surface so as to meet in a point in the object under examination. They cross at such an angle as to pass outside the field of the objective in use, which only picks up the light refracted or diffracted from structures in the preparation. End quote. The dark ground illumination brings out features which are invisible in the ordinary direct illumination. The essential parts of a microscope are, as we have seen, 1. The objective for obtaining the first magnified image of the object. 2. The ocular for further enlarging that image and transmitting it to the observer's eye, and 3. The substage condenser for illuminating the object with a cone of light. Now, in modern times, there have been numerous detailed improvements in these parts, for example in the quality of the glass used in making the lenses, and the present-day microscope is certainly a very perfect instrument. Indeed, unless some new idea is discovered, such as those behind the ultramicroscope and dark ground illumination, it does not seem likely that great advances in technical microscopy can be made. The reason for this statement is to be found in the optical limitations of the instrument. The use of the microscope is not mainly magnification, but resolution. By resolution, says Mr. J. E. Barnard, is made the power the objective has of separating and forming correct images of fine detail. Unless we see more of the intimate structure, the magnification in itself does not greatly avail. It does not help us to understand the thing better. Now, there are two factors that determine this resolving power of the microscope. The first is what is called the numerical aperture of the lens, which means, in a general way, the number of divergent rays of light that the curvature of the lens will allow to impinge upon it. Lenses of high magnifying power are so small that they admit only a very small beam of light. Thus, what is gained in magnifying power may be lost because of deficient illumination. 
a pretty device to increase the income of light in these high power lenses was the immersion lens made of such a curvature that when the lens was focused down into a drop of oil or some other liquid placed over the object on the slide it received light from all sides the drop into which the lens is focused down or immersed greatly increases the illumination of a lens with high magnifying power this method has enhanced the value of the microscope as an instrument that analyzes structure or in other words that discloses the intimate architecture of things but the main point is that the numerical aperture of even the oil immersion objective has at the present time reached its practical limit yet there is a second factor and that is the wavelength of the light rays that impinge from the mirror and condenser on the object on the slide but here again there is a limit for as professor bayliss tersely puts it quote, any object smaller than half the wavelength of the light by which it is illuminated cannot be seen in its true form and size owing to diffraction hereby is set a limit to microscopic observation End quote. These are difficult matters, but the important point is that there are practical limits to what the microscope can do in the way of magnification and resolution. But Mr. J. E. Barnard has recently made an interesting step forward by using an illuminant such as a mercury vapor lamp, which is rich in blue and violet radiations. It may also be practicable to utilize invisible radiations in the ultraviolet, which would further increase the microscope's resolving power. As things are at present, the limit of useful magnification is somewhere about 800 diameters. Beauty of Microscopic Structure We cannot close this article without referring to a very different subject, namely the extraordinary beauty of many microscopic objects. There are endless beauty feasts to be found in the architecture of the shells of diatoms, foraminifera and radiolarians, in the structure of the outside of pollen grains and butterflies' eggs, in the zoned internal structure of the stems of plants and the spines of sea urchins, in the sculpturing of the scales on butterflies' wings and the multitudinous hexagons of their eyes, in the strange hairs on many a leaf and the elegant branching of zoophytes, in the intricate section of a rock and the variety of snow crystals. Of microscopic beauty there is no end. End of section 2section three of the outline of science volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org the outline of science volume two by j arthur thompson chapter ten the body machine and its work part one the most perfect machine in the world is the body of man. The further we advance in our knowledge of it, the more we wonder at the ingenious mechanisms which are crowded into its structure. Almost every decade we discover new operations in it which have a profound influence over our life, yet are so subtle and unexpected that many generations of scientific men were entirely ignorant of them, and it may take still many generations to tell how they bring about their marvelous results. Here, as in other fields, the advance of science creates one mystery while it explains another. But that sort of evolution which we studied in a preceding section sheds a clear light upon the body machine, both of animals and of man, and enables us to understand the high efficiency of most of its parts. The machine of the animal body is not only the most perfect in nature, it is immeasurably the oldest. For at least fifty million years, how much longer no man knows, the world forces have been making the animal body, developing and improving the various organs, 
and coordinating their functions. During all these tens of millions of years, the machine has been subject to the fiercest stresses and trials, and the human body, as we know it, is the final and finished outcome. We wonder no longer. Time itself makes nothing, but if we grant a vast period of time to the real shaping forces of the universe, acting upon the most sensitive material in the universe, the perfection of the final stage becomes intelligible. Section 1. Traces of the Past We speak of the body as a machine, but it is hardly necessary to say that none of the most ingenious machines set up by modern science can for a moment compare with it. The body is a self-building machine, a self-stoking, self-regulating, self-repairing machine, the most marvelous and unique automatic mechanism in the universe. It differs from our ordinary machines, moreover, in this. When a part becomes superfluous or out of date, it will linger for ages, even for millions of years, in the structure, slowly changing and shrinking on its way to disappearance. It will be useful to begin our examination of the human body from this point of view, especially as some of the first things we notice about it are precisely shrinking structures of this kind. Why have we hair on our bodies? We need not notice here the specially luxuriant growth on the head, or on the man's lips and chin. This has been artificially fostered or cultivated during the course of man's history. Men, in mating, chose women with rounded forms and smooth chins. Women chose men with strong, muscular forms, and, in our own branch of the race at least, hairy mouths and chins. We quite understand that in the course of tens of thousands of years this has evolved rich growths of hair in certain parts. But we have hair on our trunk and arms and legs. There are tiny pits in the skin, out of which hairs grow, all over the body except on the palms of our hands and the soles of our feet. Before birth, the human body is, in fact, almost entirely covered with a fine coat of hair. There is not a word to be said in favor of this part of our wonderful body machine. It harbors dirt, microbes, and vermin, and sometimes favors skin disease. As a coat, it is ridiculously thin and ragged, and it has been superseded by clothing. Its plain meaning is in the story of life in the past, which was told in an earlier part of this work. The hair is a dwindling vestige of the warm fur coat which mammals developed to meet the conditions of an ice age. It is vestigial, not rudimentary, as is sometimes said. The pieces of gristle or cartilage on the sides of the head, which we call our ears, are similar organs. They do not catch waves of sound, as many suppose, and guide them into the real ear inside the skull. They are too flat to do so. But if we compare them with the useful, pointed, movable ear of a horse, we see what they mean. They were once similar organs, but they have fallen out of use and are dwindling away. Underneath the skin we still have seven muscles attached to the shell of cartilage from which it is obvious that the ear could once be moved in every direction to catch the waves of sound. Now only an individual here and there can use one or two of these muscles. The pinna, or ear trumpet, is a surviving structure that tells us a little about the body's remote past. There are very many similar muscles in the body today, which merely tell us about a strange past. Some men can twitch their nostrils, some can move their scalps. They do so by means of muscles which in most of us have gone completely out of use. Underneath the skin, in very many parts of the body, there are dwindling muscles of this kind. In the inner corner of each eye we have a little pulpy mass 
which recalls to us even remoter ages of the body's past. It is of no use whatever in the body today. To understand it, one has to watch a parrot or an eagle in a cage, and notice how the bird flashes a white film, the third eyelid, occasionally over its eyeball. Our superfluous bit of tissue is the shrunken remainder of this. We have in our eyelids a better apparatus for sweeping the dust off the eyeball, and the old membrane is disappearing. Man is not, of course, descended from birds, but almost all mammals have a well-developed third eyelid. We know from fossil remains, and from examining the bodies of living reptiles, that in remote ages, somewhere about the era of the coal forests, there were animals with a third eye in the top of the head. We find this third, or pineal eye, in the heads of a few reptiles today, but the skin has grown over it, and it is degenerating. In the birds and mammals it has sunk still deeper into the head, and degenerated further. In man it has become a small body, about the size of a hazelnut, rising from the middle of the brain. We call it the pineal body. It is a mysterious little organ, and we will not say positively that it has no function, but whether it has or no, we clearly trace it to the third eye of millions of years ago. The vermiform appendix is a well-known vestigial organ. It is a little worm-like tube, about four inches long, arising as a blind alley at the junction of the small and the large intestine, and as a source of disease, appendicitis, and danger, it is notorious. Some have tried to find that it has a use in the body, but the plain fact is that it has been removed from hundreds of thousands of men in modern times, and no harm has ensued in any single case. It is the vanishing remainder of a large, useful chamber in which early vegetarian mammals let myriads of bacteria break up their coarse food. In short, expert investigators of the human body have found 107 organs, or parts of organs, that have to be understood as more or less vestigial. We have the vestige of a tail and the block of bone at the lower end of our backbone and sometimes children are born with distinct and movable, though very short, tails. We have bones, muscles, and glands in many parts that are now the almost or quite useless relics of a remote past. Evolution beautifully explains them. The body remains a wonderful mechanism because these were once useful and most cunningly contrived structures. Section 2. The Ivory Gates of the Body Turning now to the body machine in its active life, we shall find it most interesting to follow the progress of food until it is built into the frame. We can, if we like, do this literally today. We can mix an opaque powder, e.g. a bismuth, with a mouthful of easily digested food, such as meal and then by means of x-rays we can photograph its progress along the alimentary canal until what remains of it is dumped in the waste chamber. This is useful for some purposes, but in the main we rely on the minute studies of the anatomist and the experiments of the physiologist for our knowledge of that part of man's body that is concerned with the utilization of the food. The receiving office, so to say, or the mouth, is itself so deeply interesting and full of ingenious contrivances that a whole section of this work might be devoted to it. Above the mouth are the sentinels, the eyes and nose, which we shall consider later. Then on the upper surface of the tongue there are myriads of sensitive little organs, taste buds, ready to apply a final test to the food. The juices of the food penetrate the thin skin which covers and protects them, 
and probably have a chemical action on the little nerve endings in them. If the message which they automatically dispatch to the brain is OK, other nerves set in motion the muscles of the lower jaw, and the grinding of the food begins. In modern times, a volume could be written on the teeth alone, and it would be a remarkable story. Teeth began ages ago in fishes of the shark and dogfish type. Their rough, scale-covered skin was drawn in to form a lining of the mouth, and long practice in crunching shellfish, and so on, led to the evolution of the hard scales on the skin into teeth. In the course of time, the teeth on the ridges of the jaw were particularly developed, and the others disappeared. But we must not suppose, from this brief hint of their origin, that teeth are simple things. Each tooth is a remarkable structure. Coats of dentine and enamel are built around a pulpy cavity into which nerves and blood vessels run, and roots, coated with cement, fix the tooth in its socket. It is strange how few people wonder why our jaws do not ache and jar from the crunching of a hard crust. In mammals there is a provision which obviates this. The teeth do not fit tightly in the sockets. They are packed in with a material that lessens the shock of the daily grind. A special regiment of the cells which make up the body is told off to see to this business of the teeth, and our wonder increases when we see these strange microscopic unconscious bone builders. They have in the baby to select atom by atom the cement and dentine and enamel which, in other forms of course, somehow exist in the food of the bloodstream. They have to build the stuff into structures, of which our artificial teeth are very clumsy imitations. They have to do this at the right time, to wait until suckling is over and eating begins. Then they have an even more difficult problem to face. The jaws of the adult will be much larger than the jaws of the young, and, naturally, it is not possible to alter these solid structures of enamel and dentine. So the bone builders absorb the greater part of the first set of teeth, the milk teeth, and meantime prepare a new set underneath them. The cast tooth, which your child shows you, is, as a rule, a mere shell. The microscopic bone builders have reabsorbed the material. Yet the teeth, with all their wonders, may be among the doomed structures of the body. Some authorities believe that they will gradually drop into the class of vestigial organs like the hair, though they will give a vast amount of trouble as they grow weaker. Their purpose is to break up the food into smaller particles, and in modern civilization this is done in the preparation and cooking of the food so the teeth are already going. In ancient skulls and among savage peoples, the teeth are often much worn away by sheer hard work. In conditions of civilization, much worn teeth are rare. The jaws have not the hard work they once had. They, therefore, get a smaller supply of blood, and the teeth grow weak and less numerous. Normally, we have thirty-two teeth, but in many people, the so-called wisdom teeth, which might very well be called unwisdom teeth, as they are superfluous, do not develop. On the other hand, a few people have thirty-six teeth, and when we turn to the monkeys, we find that some of them have this number. We are, in fact, slowly shedding our teeth in fours along the corridors of time, and it may be that in the distant future man will be toothless. Perhaps, however, a fresh enthusiasm for physical vigor will save the race from any such degeneracy. But our grinding stones are only part of the mechanism of the mouth. As soon as the grinding begins, three pairs of glands pour saliva into the food. Here again we have an automatic, nervous machinery of a remarkable kind, for as everybody knows, the mere sight of food may set the glands at work, 
or make your mouth water. In the glands themselves, the microscopic cells which make the saliva are such remarkable chemical machines that we cannot yet understand them. They not only help to make a soft pulp of the food, the saliva is 99% water, but they pour into it certain chemicals which begin the digestion of starchy food, converting it into a kind of sugar. That is one of the reasons for thorough mastication. One must not suppose that it does not matter, since the food is so short a time in the mouth that there cannot be much chemical action on it. The chemical action of the saliva goes on for half an hour or more while the food is in the stomach. A great deal of illness is due to neglecting to mix plenty of saliva with our bread, etc., before it leaves the mouth. Section 3. The Process of Digestion When teeth and salivary glands have done their work, and the taste buds on the tongue have had their moment of satisfaction, the mouthful of pulp is swallowed. Swallowing seems such an easy and automatic act that we are quite unaware of the elaborate system of signals, side shunts, and level crossings which have to be manipulated to permit the busy traffic of the pharynx to pass unchecked. Food does not go down, as children think. The whole mouth changes. Certain sensitive spots at the back of the mouth, electrical press buttons, we may call them, give the signal that the food is ready. The powerful muscles which closed the back of the mouth while we are masticating relax. The lower jaw is pressed against the upper. The soft palate forms an inclined plane. Other muscles close the airways to the nose and the great airways to the lungs. The whole complex machine acts together and pumps the food into the first part of the alimentary tube, the pharynx. Only very rarely does a little food go the wrong way, into the air passage, and then another set of muscles automatically blow or cough it out. The mouth is a rather complicated cavity. How many communications it has, with the nasal passage by the posterior nostrils, with the ear passages by the eustachian tubes, with the pharynx, and with the windpipe through the guarded glottis. It is obviously very important that the mouth be kept in good order. The food now enters upon a very long journey. Most people are surprised to hear that the alimentary tube is yards long in a man or woman of medium height, about twenty-eight feet long from the mouth to the vent. But few people reflect, there would be far less misery and discomfort in the world if they did, what digestion really means. Our food has to be broken up, physically and chemically, and even then it cannot pass into the blood. From the pulpy mass, myriads of tiny organs have to select the matter which the body needs, and let the remainder pass away. So the food has to pass slowly through twenty feet of a long tube, the small bowel or small intestine, to give these selectors the chance of taking the nourishment from it. However, let us begin at the beginning. The food passes to the stomach down a one-foot tube, in a man of medium height, the upper part of which is known as the pharynx, and the lower part as the gullet or esophagus. As we said, it does not slide down. Sir Arthur Keith describes very graphically the transport of a bolus of food towards the stomach. Quote, the instant that a bolus has been pushed through the doorway leading from the pharynx, and that doorway has closed, we see a ring of contraction form behind the bolus and commence to creep slowly downwards, forcing the bolus in front of it. The bolus, on entering the esophagus, has touched a button, and the ring of contraction is the result. As the bolus is driven forwards, it comes in contact with a succession of such buttons, with the result that it is kept moving onwards. Not only so, 
a ring of relaxation precedes the bolus and eases the passages. End quote. The earliest stomach in the animal world was merely a straight tube through which the food passed, but in the course of evolution it has grown larger and larger at this spot until, in man, we have a large storage chamber in which the food will be churned up and mixed with acid and ferment during several hours. The stomach goes up close to the heart on the left side, but its large upper part is less concerned with digestion. The muscular movements which push the food about so as to expose every part of it to the digestive juices begin about halfway down the stomach and travel, in waves, towards the bottom. There are three coats of muscle, and they are at work all day long mixing the pulpy contents. The stomach of a healthy and sensible man will get through its work in about four hours, and if he postpones his next meal, it will, like Oliver Twist, call for more. It develops a peculiar writhing motion in its muscles, and this is telegraphed to the brain by the nerves. You feel hungry. The inner wall of the stomach is richly supplied with blood, and is lined by the myriads of minute glands which produce the gastric juice. As soon as you sit at table, the sight and smell of the roast mutton send their messages to a certain nerve center, and from this a silent message of stimulation goes to the glands. When the food touches the taste buds on the tongue, the messages multiply. The blood gathers in the wall of the stomach, and the little tubes use its nourishing solution in order to make the digestive juice which they pour out upon the food. With a large part of our food, the stomach does not deal. Digestion only begins in it. Sugar, starches, and fats are passed on to the next department. It is chiefly the nitrogenous or protein food, flesh, fish, eggs, etc., that is here broken up still further and prepared for absorption. The stomach itself absorbs only a little of the food. A glass of wine, as the head of an experienced maiden may tell her, is absorbed into the blood very quickly, and part of the digested meat is passed into the blood system through the stomach. But the main part of the food passes into the twenty-foot laboratory of the narrow, small intestine to be further digested and absorbed. It is amazing how few people have even a rudimentary knowledge of this fundamental part of their being. Stomach and bowels are hopelessly confused, and our poor organs, magnificent as they are, are treated with inconceivable crudeness even by educated people. It is easy for everybody now to obtain a list giving the exact digestibility and nutritive value of different kinds of foods. It should be known to everybody that the work of these myriads of minute chemical laboratories in the stomach has drawn the blood from the brain for a time, and it is unnatural and unhealthy to attempt brain work during or after a meal. Half the physical misery of life could be cured by a little knowledge and restraint. Section 4. A Remarkable Mechanism A brilliant physiologist, Professor Mechnikoff, startled us some years ago by stating, almost snorting, that the human alimentary system is a miserable, out-of-date machinery that ought to be scrapped, even the stomach, he said, was superfluous. Very few men of science agree with him, but when we understand what he was driving at, we see that he had hold of a very important idea. Professor Mechnikoff meant that we can digest our food in advance by means of chemicals, and get rid of all the great length of intestine which is so liable to disease. At present, we take in great masses of superfluous stuff, but there will some day be extraordinary changes in man's diet. In the meantime, the organs are there, and we have to feed accordingly, but it does not follow 
that this will continue. At the base of the stomach, where the alimentary canal again becomes a tube, the beginning of the small or narrow intestine, there is a very powerful ring muscle which guards the exit. Nature has provided for healthy living. The unprepared food, if we live well, cannot run into the bowel. Mere contact of food against this muscle only draws it tighter. There has to be, apparently, some sort of chemical action by food which is quite ready when the muscle relaxes and a spray of the pulp shoots into the bowel. We can see the occasional gush when we are following the digestion by means of x-rays. In the first section of the narrow intestine, the duodenum, very important work goes on. Here we find a remarkable sort of mechanism which has only been discovered by recent science. The automatic machines of the body generally work by nervous action. The sight of roast beef is wired to the brain by the eyes, and a reflex, or reflected, nervous action sets the salivary glands and the stomach glands at work. This is a sort of automatic telegraphic system, but there is also in the body something like a postal service. It is one of the most wonderful discoveries of modern physiology. When, for instance, the acid food, or chyme, from the stomach touches the walls of the lower bowel, the glands in this wall form a certain chemical, called secretin, and pour it into the blood. The blood takes it rapidly all over the body, but there is only one organ, or perhaps two, waiting for it. In this case the pancreas, or sweetbread, receives the chemical message, and sets more vigorously to work, pouring an increased supply of digestive juice into the intestine. These marvelous messages, which are, as it were, posted in the blood, are called hormones, and as we shall see later on, we find them again and again, accounting for very remarkable results in the body. The liver and the pancreas are really outgrowths from the alimentary tube, sections which have become detached, special departments, with ducts leading to the bowel. Each pours about a pint of fluid daily into the bowel to assist the work of digestion. The liver has very special work to do, and we shall notice it presently. Here we need only say that the bile which it pours into the bowel, sometimes so abundantly that some forces its way into the stomach, and you get bilious, is not a digestive juice, but it helps to prepare the fats in the food. The pancreatic juice, on the other hand, is a real digestive juice, and the starches and sugars and fats, as well as the nitrogenous foods, are now dissolved and made into emulsion and prepared, in short, for absorption. The juices of the pancreas and of the intestine include powerful ferments or enzymes. These are substances which cause chemical changes by their mere presence without being used up in bringing about these changes. One of them deals with the starches and sugars in the food, another with the fats, another with the proteins, like white of egg. The chyme, the pulped and semi-digested food, moves slowly along the bowel. In the bowel wall are muscles which contract and drive the contents slowly onward at about one inch a second. But the interior wall of the tube is now lined, not only with glands, but with little outstanding fingers, like, on a microscopic scale, the pile on fine velvet. The surface is, moreover, puckered into folds, to give a larger area, and myriads of the tiny fingers, or villi, dip into the chyme and absorb the nourishing matter. Altogether, about sixteen square feet of absorbing surface are given in the small intestine, and it is there that most of our nourishment is taken into the blood, or the lymph. The rest passes on into the large intestine, 
a very much wider tube at its lower extremity. It is just at this junction point of small and large intestine that the vermiform appendix is given off from the tube. Its opening into the bowel is very narrow, and sometimes bits of hard food, such as fruit seeds, get into it and set up inflammation. Now in certain vegetarian animals, like the rabbit, the appendix is at the end of a large and useful blind alley or cecum. A good deal of vegetable matter is wrapped up in cell walls of cellulose, and the digestive juices we have described have very little power to deal with cellulose. It has to be broken up by bacteria, in such a chamber as the rabbit's blind gut or cecum. The human vermiform appendix is a remnant of the large magazine in which some coarse feeding ancestor of man had the cellulose of his food dealt with by bacteria. Most people are inclined to shudder when they hear of bacteria in their bodies, but it is only certain kinds of bacteria that pour poisons into the blood and cause disease. Each one of us houses trillions of friendly bacteria in the large intestine. They do us no harm, however, but break up the cellulose, the husks of grain, etc., and multiply prodigiously in the fetid, fermenting mass in the intestine. Some physiologists think that we should be better without the large intestine, but while there is little food absorbed from it, much of the water we take up is absorbed there. In any case, there the structure is, and the wise man takes plenty of cereals, fruits, and green vegetables in his food to keep it in a state of healthy activity. End of section 3section four of the outline of science volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the outline of science volume two by j arthur thompson chapter ten the body machine and its work part two section five the vital fluid let us return to the nutritive material which has been taken up into the system. The tiny organs on the bowel wall which absorb it pass most of it directly into the blood vessels, which they contain. It becomes part and parcel of the blood, and will now, after passing through the liver, be pumped round the body for the various organs to select from it the nourishment they need. The blood is not the simple matter which it seemed to our ancestors. Indeed, it has proved of late years to be full of subtle interest. If you prick your finger with a needle and put a small drop of blood under the microscope, you see myriads of little discs, many of them in rows like columns of pennies, in a watery or yellowish fluid. The fluid, the serum or plasma, is the liquid food of the body and the medium for conveying away the soluble waste matter. The red discs, or corpuscles, are the bodies that convey oxygen from the lungs to the tissues. There are about five million of them in every cubic millimeter of the blood of a healthy man. A woman's allowance is half a million less, and it is these which give the blood its red color. We have about 25,000 trillions of them in all. Thus the microscope discovered a new and unexpected complexity in the blood, and further research has shown that it is the iron-containing pigment in these red corpuscles which is chiefly concerned in the carriage of oxygen. There is very little iron in the blood, and it is absurd to think that we increase its quantity, once it is normal, by eating things with iron in them, as people say. But what iron there is may be called a precious metal in the human body, and the red corpuscles have it in a form that still more or less baffles the chemist. There are believed to be something like 2,000 atoms to the molecule in the red pigment hemoglobin of the corpuscle. 
these discs or corpuscles are formed mostly in the red marrow of the bones and after serving for a few weeks they are broken up in the liver or the spleen warfare in the body but this is only the beginning of the interest of the blood in the drop which we observe under the microscope there are as we said myriads of red corpuscles in a yellowish fluid it was found out some years ago that the serum is quite congenial to its own corpuscles but that if we mix into it a little of the blood of some animal of a different kind the serum of the first animal destroys the red cells of the second animal thousands of experiments were made and it was found that the degree of action of one kind of blood upon another depended on the nearness or remoteness of relationship of the two animals if they were nearly related there was no destructive action naturally the opportunity was soon sought to apply this new test of man's place in nature and it was found that his blood mingled amiably with that of the anthropoid apes there is a third element in our drop of blood under the microscope and this is the most interesting of all here and there in it though hundreds of times less numerous than the red discs there are what are called white corpuscles microscopic colorless roundish specks when we study these specks closely we find that they behave just like the very primitive microscopic animal known as the amoeba they push out parts of their substance and glide along if there are bacteria in the blood one of these corpuscles may be seen making its way to one of the intruders and slowly folding its substance around it after the microbe is engulfed digestion soon follows in other words there is in the blood besides the army of oxygen carriers a great army of defenders against bacteria let a tissue be injured somewhere and the injurious bacteria find a footing and begin to multiply at an appalling rate we are threatened with disease if not death the bacteria may destroy the tissue or pour poison into the blood but the white knights now gather from all parts to defend the body they are brought of course by the flow of the blood but they seem to have some sort of chemical sense for bacteria and they crowd in the particular tissue which is threatened a great struggle ensues and the patient's temperature rises to battle heat if the white corpuscles succeed in devouring the microbes before they multiply to a dangerous extent we are saved but bacteria multiply at a terrible speed and sometimes they beat the corpuscles and we pass into a perhaps dangerous illness biologists had hardly ceased to wonder at this new romance of the blood when others were discovered bacteria produce a poison or toxin with which they taint the blood but it was found that the blood produces an antitoxin a chemical for neutralizing the toxin and after years of experiment the antitoxin was prepared in the laboratory and injected into the blood it also became possible to help the white corpuscles in the fray or spur them on to it so to speak by preparing a sort of sauce an opsonin the man of science calls it from dead bacteria and injecting it into the blood the opsonin makes the living bacteria more attractive or palatable to the corpuscles and our brave defenders go to work more vigorously sir arthur keith in the engines of the human body refers to quote, the immense and movable armies of microscopic corpuscles which can be mobilized for police or sanitary duties they swarm in the bloodstream as it circulates round the body it is extremely probable that one variety of them if not more are really errand boys on their way to deliver messages or parcels and that the gland masses which are built up in and around lymph channels serve both as nurseries for the upbringing of such messengers and also as offices from which they are dispatched on their errands End quote. section six the heart 
It is clear that the many-sided value of the blood depends upon its regular coursing through the whole body, and we have now to see how this is accomplished. Until three centuries ago, there was not a man in any civilization who knew anything about this circulation of the blood. The most learned physicians had the weirdest ideas about the function of the heart and the flow of the blood. Nowadays, the essential facts are familiar. The heart, which one feels beating about the lower part of the breastbone, though drawn a little to the left, is the central pumping station. From it goes a great tube, or artery, which branches out, much as the trunk of a tree divides into branches, and finally into twigs, until its finest ramifications have carried the blood into the remotest tissues of the body, even into the teeth and bones. There the little twigs turn back, as it were, and become veins, and the veins from all parts join each other and at last bring the blood back to the heart. In a sense, it is as if the fresh water circulation and the sewage circulation of a great city were managed from the same pumping station. One set of pipes would convey water to every tap. Another set would bring back the foul water to the pump. The difference is that in the animal body, the two sets of pipes join on to each other and form a continuous system. But obviously, fresh and foul blood must not mix, and this has been secured by the evolution of a heart with the two halves completely separated from each other. We can trace the evolution of the heart by studying it in various types of lower vertebrates. In most reptiles, the two halves are still imperfectly separated, and mixed blood, pure and impure, fresh and foul, goes to the greater part of the body. In the mammals and birds, the separation is complete. The heart is a thick muscular pouch, with walls about half an inch at their thickest part in man, which has to drive the blood to the tissues on the one hand, and to the lungs for purification on the other. That is why it has separate halves. Each half, moreover, has a little chamber for receiving the blood, an oracle, and a larger chamber for pumping it, a ventricle, and valves are cunningly contrived at each opening so that the blood can flow only in one direction when the pump works. So remarkable is the mechanism of the heart that we do not yet know what regulates its beat. There seems to be some mechanism in the heart itself for regulating it. Seventy-two times in every minute in a healthy and resting man, the chambers draw their walls together and pump out the blood. There are tens of thousands of muscular fibers built so wonderfully into the walls that the chambers can close in from every side, like a man closing his fist, and give the blood a start that will carry it all round the body and back to the starting point. It is, of course, a mistake to say that the heart never rests. It rests, and recovers, between each beat. But its function is remarkable. As we said, it beats seventy-two to the minute when a man is resting. But let there be some sudden call for action, and almost before you get from your chair, the great pump beats faster, as if it knew that the distant muscles and brain had now work to do and must have more blood. When we are sitting still, it throws five pints of blood, a little more than a third of all the blood in the body, into the arteries every minute. During a quick walk, the heart pumps seventeen pints a minute, and the man who runs upstairs is asking his heart to pump thirty-seven pints a minute. During even less violent exercise than this, all the blood in the body, about fourteen pints, passes twice through the left ventricle of the heart and all around the body in a single minute. From the left ventricle, the chief pump, the blood passes into a thick, broad tube called the aorta. The elastic walls of this tube expand as the blood rushes in, and then slowly close again, driving the blood onward. In this way, and by the general resistance of the tubes, the arteries, 
the jerky discharge from the heart is converted into a steady flow after a time. The arteries branch out in every direction, and as they approach the tissues they have to feed, they break into myriads of very fine tubelets, often not more than one three thousandth of an inch in thickness. The wall of the blood vessel has now to be so thin that the nourishing matter in the blood can flow through it to the tissues, and the waste matter from the tissues can get back into the blood. Even this is a far more complicated matter than is generally supposed. The cells in each tissue of the body must somehow select their own food and oxygen, and even the union of oxygen with carbon in the working muscle does not take place as we find it in ordinary combustion. A WONDERFUL APPARATUS At the point where the artery subdivides into the finest tubelets, the capillaries, there is a wonderful apparatus, a sort of stopcock, for regulating the supply of blood. Muscular fibers are coiled around the artery, and, as the artery enlarges or contracts, the supply of blood to that particular tissue is increased or lessened. When you sit down to a meal, for instance, the stopcocks are opened full to your digestive organs and partially closed against your muscles and brain. When you stand up and move about the room, various muscles have to work, and the cocks are duly turned on to them. When your muscles need all the blood they can get, your brain and digestive organs get less. When you stand erect for some time, the regulative system has to see that blood does not accumulate in your legs at the expense of your head. But if you overdo it, if you stand long in a close crowd or a stuffy room, even this admirable system breaks down, and your brain, which is particularly sensitive about oxygen, runs short of blood. You faint. Here again, science has only made a great discovery to be confronted with a mystery. We know that there are nerves from the muscles of the arteries to the spinal cord, and that the stopcock we have spoken of is regulated by a reflex nervous message from the cord. But how these unconscious elements of the human mechanism work so perfectly together, we do not know. When we remember how densely ignorant of all these things men were only a few generations ago, we may be sure that much will be discovered by our children and grandchildren. Every year, indeed, brings new discoveries of a remarkable kind. We have already noticed that certain chemicals called hormones, of which we shall speak more fully immediately, are produced in various structures, ductless glands, of the body, and posted in the blood, as it were, for a distant organ. One of these hormones comes into play in connection with the blood. When a man is setting about some prolonged and strenuous exercise, nerve messages go to stimulate certain glands near the kidneys, called the adrenal or suprarenal glands. They supply one of these chemicals, adrenaline, to the blood, and it passes round the circulating system until it reaches the small arteries. It closes the cocks and shuts down the supply to organs, which are not at the time required to be active and thus ensures a fuller supply to those organs which are called into strenuous exercise. When the blood has passed through the tissues, given up its nutriment, and received the waste carbonic acid gas and the soluble nitrogenous waste, the blood turns back towards the heart. It passes into a new set of fine tubelets or capillaries, and these unite in the veins. The veins have thinner walls than the arteries, as there is now less pressure, but they have a remarkable series of valves along their course. The blood cannot flow back, cannot go wrong. You can actually trace one or two of the valves on the veins of your arms if you try to force the blood back to your fingers. Little knots stand up here and there, so the blood courses steadily back and is poured into the opposite side of the heart to that from which it started. It enters the right auricle and passes into the right ventricle, and the next beat of the heart sends it to the lungs, where it gives up its carbonic acid and gets a fresh supply of oxygen. Section 7. How and Why We Breathe 
the blood has many functions it takes fluid food to the organs and in its red corpuscles it carries oxygen it has also to bring away from the organs the waste products of their activity the carbonic acid carbon dioxide which is got rid of in the lungs and the soluble nitrogenous waste which is got rid of by the kidneys the work that is done in the various organs such as the muscles nerves and glands may be roughly compared to the work done in a simple steam engine fuel must be supplied then oxygen the essential element of air must be supplied to unite chemically with the fuel and convert the energy which is locked up in it into heat and active work the stomach supplies the fuel the lungs like the blacksmith's bellows supply the draught of oxygen if we do not forget that in the animal body the chemical action is far more subtle and indirect than in the furnace this may be taken as a useful simple view of what goes on let us follow the draught of air into the lungs and the blood we saw that for the food to become available to the tissues the blood vessels have to become finer and finer until at last their walls are so thin that the nutritive material can pass through them it is the same with the air passages through which we breathe the air enters by the nostrils we will suppose at least that the reader is sensible enough to breathe always through the nostrils and teaches children to do the same in the nose there is a warming chamber richly supplied with blood and the supply automatically increases in cold weather and there is a sort of sieve or filter the hairs in the nostrils for screening foreign bodies from the air dry air is also moistened in the nostrils there is a mucous membrane in it which is most useful if you treat it reasonably but if you treat it unreasonably if you pack yourself with others into a moist stuffy unventilated railway carriage or small room it will get gored with blood and boggy and offer a good field for certain microbes and you will have a cold in the head behind the root of the tongue the airway crosses the foodway and enters the windpipe or trachea at this point there is the customary door automatically opening and shutting and behind the delicate folding door are the vocal cords which we use for speech the windpipe divides at its base into the two bronchial tubes one for each lung and there are ingenious arrangements for dealing with dust or microbes that have got past the sentinels in the nose there is a coat of mucus to intercept them as the flypaper does flies and there are countless microscopic lashes or cilia which bend and straighten rhythmically beating towards the entrance and thus gradually push out the intruder if certain kinds of dangerous microbes settle on them the glands pour out large quantities of mucus and your lungs automatically blow it out at times you have a cold and a cough in the lungs themselves the bronchial tubes branch out into numbers of fine tubes as the arteries do and each tube ends in a score or more of little air chambers there are about six million of these minute chambers each about one-tenth of an inch long in the two lungs and they are formed so as to give as much surface as possible if we could open them all out and piece them together we should have a total surface of a hundred times larger than our skin this is the wonderful contrivance evolved for bringing a large body of air into almost direct contact with the blood fifteen times a minute or more in a deep breath we can take in a whole gallon of air and even a normal breath takes in two quarts nerve messages but who attends to the working of this wonderful bellows while we are sleeping or are concerned with other matters it is of course another of those automatic mechanisms which have been formed in the animal body during millions of years of trial and sifting the lowest part of the brain a part called the medulla oblongata includes a nerve center which is sensitive to the carbonic acid in the blood and stimulated by this 
sends automatic messages to the muscles of the ribs and the midriff, or diaphragm. At each intake of breath, twelve pairs of muscles work harmoniously in expanding the chest, and then other muscles pull the bag together again and expel the air. But how can the air extract the carbonic acid from the blood in so short a space? All such difficulties are provided for in the body machine. You breathe out only a fifth of the air in your lungs every time. The little air chambers automatically close if by a strong effort you try to empty your lungs. The exchange of gases is going on all the time. If on the other hand the muscles are working hard and need more oxygen, the increased carbonic acid in the blood stimulates the medulla and nerve messages from it rain upon the lung muscles until you pant for breath. A man or woman engaged in sedentary work gets into a way of using the lungs to only about a tenth of their capacity. You understand the pale scholar and the anemic girl in the cash box. They provide too little oxygen, and the blood will not provide red corpuscles which are not needed. If such people will go for a good swinging walk in air that is rich in oxygen, the blood will stream through their medulla, the nerve center at the base of the brain, and the lungs will open out. The real breathing is, of course, deep inside the body. The little air chambers have walls almost as thin as soap bubbles, and a rich supply of similarly thin blood vessels, capillaries, outside them. Through these thin walls, the red corpuscles somehow extract the oxygen from the air, and the blood also gives off the carbonic acid. Then the blood streams back to the left chamber of the heart to be pumped through the body in the way we have described. When this blood finds itself in the thin-walled capillaries amongst the organs of the body, the red corpuscles yield their oxygen, and the blood returns to the heart with a new load of carbonic acid. We have seen that this union of oxygen and food in the tissues may roughly be compared to what goes on in a steam engine. It enables the organs to work, to do the work we describe here, and it produces heat. And in connection with this heat, we employ, all our lives, wonderful mechanisms which even modern science has only partially mastered. The blood must be kept at a temperature of, in a normal human body, about 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. When the air sinks very low in temperature, we shiver or stamp our feet or rub our hands. The shiver is an automatic warning to take exercise, to increase the combustion in the muscles. When, on the other hand, the outside temperature rises too high, we get the stopcocks of our arteries, which are tightened on a cold day, now opened wide, to let the blood's heat escape by the skin. If this does not suffice, automatic messages go from the nerve centers to the millions of sweat glands in the skin, and we sweat. To raise the temperature of the watery fluid so much, heat has had to be extracted from the blood. If the air is dry as well as warm, this mechanism is generally sufficient. But if we are in a moist heat, everybody knows how much worse it is than dry heat, the evaporation through the skin is checked, and the temperature of the blood rises until it may be too much for our brain. Even cold, moist weather is trying. Our vitality is lowered in meeting it, and the cold microbes get their chances to invade the body. A wonderful mechanism, surely. But there seem to be unintended effects at times of these ingenious devices. Take the crimson flood on a girl's cheek at some ugly word, or some word of praise, or some consciousness of guilt. The stopcocks to the capillaries in her cheeks are opened wide, but we can hardly suppose that some nervous reaction was evolved for that purpose. Sudden paleness is more intelligible. The cheek blanches in the face of danger, because the stream of blood has been directed to the brain and muscles that may have to meet the situation, and such temporarily useless organs as the cheek have the supply cut off. 
Section 8. The Large Machines of the Body We may seem so far only to have concerned ourselves with organs which exist for the sake of other organs. That, in point of fact, is the nature of every organ in the organism. And indeed, it would be at least equally correct to say that bones and muscles, which one naturally thinks of as forming the greater part of the body, exist very largely for the purpose of digestion and respiration. Nutrition and reproduction are the oldest functions, the original functions, of the animal body. The elaborate skeleton, with its masses of muscles, has evolved to protect and minister to these fundamental activities. Of the distribution of the two hundred bones and two hundred and sixty pairs of muscles which form the great bulk of the body, little can be said here. A catalogue of the bones would be a list of unfamiliar terms, and a catalogue of the muscles would be almost an essay in Greek. It is in the development and minute structure of bone that modern physiology is chiefly interested. As is now generally known, the body begins its existence as a single cell, a microscopic speck of living matter surrounded by a membrane, and the development of the body is due to the repeated and rapid multiplication of this cell, the fertilized ovum or egg cell, until countless millions are formed. It is a cell state, a commonwealth of millions of living active units bound together into a harmoniously working organism. As this protoplasm, the jelly-like matter which composes cells, is soft, the beginner may wonder how it can build up such structures as teeth and bones. To understand this, as far as we do understand it at present, we have to remember that as the cells of the body multiply from the original egg cell, they also separate into different classes. We get muscle cells, nerve cells, bone cells, gland cells, and so on, and they differ remarkably in structure from each other. One contingent of these cells consists of the bone builders, and long before birth they begin to construct the supporting framework of the body. It is, of course, not bone at first. Frames of cartilage preceded bony frames in the course of racial evolution, and a cartilage frame goes before bone in the development of the individual body. When the time comes, the bone builders extract the lime salts which have got into the blood with the digested food, and they use these in building up the bones. Sir Arthur Keith tells us that there are two million of these bone builder cells at work in the thigh of a newborn baby, and that the number rises later to a hundred and fifty millions. They make the bones solid, then they change the interior into the light but strong texture with which everybody is familiar. How is it that we feel no creaking, no jarring or friction of the two hundred and thirty joints by which our bones play upon one another? Here is another ingenious contrivance. A layer of cartilage remains over the end of each bone. It is dense, very elastic, and always well lubricated by one of the many remarkable automatic lubricating systems of the body. The cartilage cells themselves, in this case, are converted into lubricating fluid when they die. The muscular system, which moves the bones, is the red flesh with which we are familiar in the butcher's shop. Everybody who has carved a joint, and knows the importance of cutting against the grain, is aware that one of these large muscles of the ribs or limbs of a cow consists of muscular fibers packed closely in bundles. There are 600,000 fibers in a single muscle of man's arm, the biceps. Each fiber is composed of many fibrils, the seed of that power of contractility which we very little understand. The body machine is still full of problems and mysteries for us. Three hundred years ago, the courageous anatomists of the later Middle Ages began to make out the structure of the organs. Later came a generation which dissected the organs into tissues. Later still, as the microscope improved, the tissues were dissected into cells, and the whole life of the organism, 
was resolved into the cooperative life of millions of these units. But we now know that the secrets of the life of the cell lie partly in the molecules which compose the cells, and these are beyond the range of the most powerful microscope. We must wait and be grateful for what we know. Science never rests. On the very day on which I am writing this page, the press announces the discovery of a new microscope, which takes us at a bound deeper into the mysteries of living nature. Meantime, science has shown us that the muscular system is an automatic living mechanism of the most wonderful kind. To every muscle the arteries bear their streams of food and oxygen, the muscle cells select their diet, and the veins take away the waste products. On every muscle there are also the fine endings of some nerve from, generally, the spinal cord, and at the proper moment a discharge along the nerve causes the whole mass of the cells or fibers in a muscle to contract simultaneously and lift the bone to which the muscle is attached. The nerve impulse itself is slight. It is merely like a match set to the great energy stored up like powder in the muscle. But when we remember the number of muscles needed for a single harmonious action, we bring fifty-four into play at each step in walking, and there are about three hundred muscles concerned when we walk, the delicacy of their adjustment, the precise degree of action needed in each, we cannot but marvel at the ceaseless regularity and correctness of this unconscious play of muscle and nerve and nerve center. We can say only that it is broadly and beautifully illuminated by the story of evolution, a slow advance during millions of years, during which every individual with a defect is sifted out, and every improvement means longer survival in the struggle for life. End of section 4《Section 5 of the Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 10. The Body Machine and Its Work. Part 3. Section 9. THE NERVOUS SYSTEM AND THE BRAIN CENTER THE NERVOUS SYSTEM Most wonderful of all structures in the body machine, and most difficult to understand, is the telegraphic system, the nerve threads, or wires, and the central stations in the brain, the spinal cord, and certain other clusters of nerve cells. A unified cluster of nerve cells is called a ganglion, or nerve center. In the simplest forms of life, there is no nerve, no muscle, no mouth, or stomach. The microscopic unit is one single cell, a bit of jelly-like living matter enclosed in a more or less definite membrane. Each and every part of it digests food, contributes to the movement, and is sensitive to the surroundings. In the course of evolution, there arose larger organisms with bodies, with millions of cells bound together in harmony, showing division of labor. Some cells specialize on nutrition, some on reproduction, some on locomotion, and so on. Some of these cells specialize on sensitiveness, and thus arise nerve cells. Then some specialize on one particular kind of sensitiveness, and there appear patches or pits in the skin, one sensitive to light, another to smells, and so on. Further advance unites these various centers by nerve fibers, and at last a central telegraph station, a long tract of nerve matter, connects up the various sense centers and the muscles and glands. When a backbone is evolved, the main tract of central nerve stations is enclosed in it, and, as life advances, the upper part of this spinal cord swells into a brain and is protected by a skull. 
This interesting story of the evolution of the brain and sense organs deserves to be told at greater length, but this slight outline may serve at present for our understanding of the essential nature of the nervous system. There is, as we said previously, a postal system and a telegraph system in the body. Certain organs discharge certain chemicals, hormones, into the blood, and the blood delivers them to distant organs which are thus set to work. Obviously, this postal system would be too slow for the purposes of ordinary life, and so the telegraphic system is richly developed. Suppose that, in bathing, you tread upon a sharp stone. In a fraction of a second, a nerve thrill flashes from that part of your foot to a certain center in the spinal cord, and a return thrill causes the muscles of the leg to contract, thereby jerking back the foot. In an animal far down in the scale, like the octopus, this nerve message goes at about 80 inches a second. In the frog, the speed has worked up to 90 feet a second. In a man, it reaches about 400 feet a second. In the case of man, the nerve message often goes on to ring a bell in the brain, as it were, to announce itself in consciousness. But the greater part of the body machine is run, as we have seen, by automatic action, and we will first master this. We have spoken repeatedly of reflex action. We mean by this nervous action without conscious effort. The message that goes to the brain or spine is automatically reflected along a different wire to the muscles or glands. When a piece of dust blows against your eyeball, one nerve sends some sort of thrill to a center in the brain. Within a very small fraction of a second, this message passes through a nerve center in the brain, and another thrill comes back to the muscles of the eyelids. Nearly the whole body is connected up, generally through the spinal cord, by an automatic nervous machinery of this kind. For the muscles of the head and face, the nerve centers are in the brain. The nerve cells, or neurons as they are often called, have a cell body and outgrowing fibers or wires, each cell has two or more fibers running out to it, and these, in most cases, end in brushes of still finer threads. The nerve cells are, therefore, particularly suitable for communicating with each other. In the brain and spinal cord especially, each cell runs into a little brush or tree of fine fibers, and they interlock with each other. In the nerves that carry messages or commands to the muscles and glands, many long fibers are bound up into bundles by a sheath. Inside each fiber there is a mysterious central channel, the axis cylinder, probably of a liquid nature. What the real nature of a nerve thrill is, we do not yet know. It is accompanied by electricity, but it is not itself an electric wave for such a wave would travel more than a million times faster than the nerve message does. The nerves are also peculiar in the fact that they never get tired, as long as they are well supplied with oxygen, and physiologists have not been able to discover any definite chemical change in them. Even the production of carbon dioxide is questionable. Sleeping or walking, the wires are always alive, yet physiologists have not found that any heat is produced in connection with their activity. The brain center. It is otherwise with the masses of nerve cells which make up the great brain centers. Everybody knows that these grow tired and must have a period of rest and recovery. Sleep is, however, still a puzzling phenomenon, and no theory of it can be regarded as satisfactory. All that physiologists are generally agreed upon is that the blood supply to the brain is checked, and this lessening of the supply of oxygen, as to which the brain is particularly sensitive, lowers the vitality of the organs of consciousness. About the end of the first hour of sleep, which is the real beauty sleep, the brain life is entirely suspended, and the blood is busy feeding the tired muscles. Some hours later, more blood seems to return to the brain, and we get partial consciousness, 
uncontrolled by intellect, in the form of dreams. In a few individuals there may be, instead, a partial return of consciousness, an awakening of the power of automatic response to stimulations. They are apt to walk in their sleep. Our knowledge of the brain is now a special and formidable branch of science. It will be referred to later, when we come to deal with mental science. In some way that we do not understand, our personality is more bound up with our nervous system than with the rest of our body. Our quickness or slowness, alertness or dullness, cheerfulness or gloominess, reliability or fickleness, goodwill or selfishness, are wrapped up, in our ordinary life inextricably, with our very wonderful nervous system. Some people believe that our inmost self uses the nervous system as a musician uses a piano, and compare the disorder of mind illustrated in the delirium of fever, or the decay of mental vigor in the aged, to disturbances or wear and tear in the instrument. Others think that the inner life of consciousness, feeling, thinking, and willing, is one aspect of our mysterious living, and that the physico-chemical bustle that goes on in the nervous system is the other aspect of the same reality. The two aspects are inseparable, like the concave and the convex surfaces of a dome, but no metaphor is of any use, the relation is quite unique. This is one of the oldest of riddles, and Tennyson made the ancient sage say, Thou canst not prove that thou art body alone, nor canst thou prove that thou art spirit alone, nor canst thou prove that thou art both in one. For nothing worthy proving can be proven, nor yet disproven. Yet three things seem to us to be quite certain. One, our nervous system is a scientific actuality that can be measured and weighed. It is complex beyond our power of conception if only because of the millions of living units which it includes. It is the seat of an extraordinary activity which baffles the imagination. No theoretical view can stand that it is subversive of the fundamental reality of our nervous system. 2. Even more real, however, if there are degrees of reality, is our inner life of consciousness, our stream of thoughts and feelings, desires and purposes, it is our supreme reality, for it includes all others, and no theoretical view can stand that is subversive of this reality. 3. But the third certainty is that organism and personality, body and mind, nervous metabolism and consciousness, are in the experience of everyday life interdependent. It is a relation, there is nothing to which we can compare it. If it is a unity, it is equally unique. We are mind-bodies, or body-minds. Sometimes we feel more of the one, sometimes more of the other. That, however, as we have seen, will form the subject of a later chapter. We may note here that it is a popular fallacy to suppose that all the contents of the skull are concerned with thought and feeling, or that a large head means a large capacity. The bulk of the matter in the cranium has nothing to do with thought. It is only a very thin rind or cortex of nervous matter, about a ninth of an inch thick on the average, covering the forepart of the brain, from the top of the head to the base of the forehead, which is the organ of consciousness. But this precious cortex is an intricate structure made up of 9,200 million nerve cells, and it is in man folded and creased so as to pack as much surface as possible within the limits of the human skull. Round this central area are the nerve centers for controlling the muscles of the head, face, eyes, tongue, and the like. And the centers for receiving the reports of the eyes, nose, and ears are also in the brain. In a man who weighs 150 pounds, the nerve cells of the brain cortex would weigh about one five thousand part of the total, but this small part controls the whole. At the back of the head is the cerebellum, or small brain. 
the chief center for coordinating the movements of the muscles so as to produce harmonious action if it has been injured in a bird or a dog the animal can no longer stand up or maintain a balance of movement all day long the cerebellum must be receiving countless messages from all parts of the body and directing our three hundred muscles to cooperate it is entirely automatic yet no central telegraph station in the world is so busy or so accurate it also in some way maintains the tone of the muscles below the cerebellum is the medulla which as we saw is the organ for controlling the muscles of the chest that cause breathing it has however much more work to do than this it has some control of the heart and blood vessels and it influences movement in the alimentary canal from the salivary glands to the small intestine we must remember that these hind parts of the brain are the oldest the cortex the nervous matter connected with mental life is a later acquisition and the oldest part of all is the long cord of nerve cells which is enclosed in the spinal column along this are the various centers for working automatically the great muscles of the trunk and limbs and abdomen pairs of nerves leave it at intervals and all day long these are receiving messages and issuing orders it has an extraordinary power of automatic learning watch the baby learning to adjust its muscular actions to its desires or feelings or a girl learning tennis or typing in a short time the machinery will react promptly and perfectly to the stimulus it is through the spinal cord that the brain can influence movements which are usually automatic we cannot discuss here how far the bodily features may serve as indices of mental character whether the face the eyes the shape of the head or the hands an interesting chapter on the subject will be found in sir arthur keith's little book the human body there is no correspondence he tells us between the functions of the various parts of the brain so far as we yet know them and the overlying parts of the head to which phrenologists have assigned definite functions some day we may be able to add to our knowledge of a man's character derived from observation of the expression of his face his words and actions the day may come when by looking at the brain or even at the skull which encloses it we shall be able to tell the capabilities of a child or a man but we have not yet reached that point neither is it true that the lines of the palm of the hand can be read as guides to the future palmistry is childish make-believe section ten the organs of sense the organs of sense another section of this work tells how our wonderful sense organs were slowly evolved and it is enough here to observe that they began as simple sensitive patches in the skin which in the course of millions of years have grown into elaborate organs they are the sentinels of the commonwealth of cells for ages theirs was the vital function of locating food and announcing danger now in man they are the chief channels of those glimpses of nature which the mind unites in the marvelous structure of modern science the skin to begin with is crowded with little organs of sense nerves from the great centers branch out in every direction and the fine twigs at last end in sensitive bulbs underneath the skin the most numerous of these are for the purpose of announcing pain we speak of pain as something in the body machine which we could very well spare but a little reflection will soon tell us that it is a most benevolent institution it announces some danger which if it were not thus indicated by the ringing of the bell in the brain would not be noticed and might become fatal other little bulbs especially numerous on the palm side of the fingers minister to the sense of touch others feel cold and a different set experience heat by careful testing the reader can find for himself that these sensations are localized in different areas on his arm there are other nerve endings again for the sense of pressure other sensitive bulbs which line part of the mouth 
are the receiving organs for the sense of taste. Little oval bodies stand up like a close regiment of diminutive soldiers on the upper surface of the tongue. Each of the internal cells of these taste buds ends in a hair-like process, and these processes touch the nerves which convey their particular stimulation to the brain. Probably different flavors are perceived by different nerves. The tip of the tongue is richer in the little bulbs that appreciate sweet things, while the back part is richer in the means of recognizing bitterness. Substances must be in a liquid form to announce themselves to taste. For the sense of smell, on the other hand, they have to be broken up into very fine particles like a gas. Nerves from the olfactory centers in the brain branch out in the membrane which lines the upper part of the nasal cavities and this membrane includes numerous sensory nerve cells, which act as sentinels against dangers which announce themselves in the air. An odorous body is one which gives off minute particles of its matter into the air. The sense of smell was once of the gravest importance in the animal economy, and even in men it is so highly developed that they can detect a speck of musk diluted in eight million times as much air. A very strong offensive substance, like mercaptan, can be sensed even if there is only one grain to twenty-five trillion times as much air. In man, however, the sense of smell is degenerating, and many individuals have it very feebly. THE SENSE OF VISION Most important of all the senses is that of vision for nearly all the ideas of things in the mind of an ordinary person are visual images. The essential part of the mechanism of this sense is the eyeball and the nerve which goes from this to the sight center in the brain. The eye is a camera of a most remarkable description. It is a roundish ball made of dense and strong fibrous tissue, opaque for five-sixths of its surface, but transparent in the one-sixth which bulges out in front, as the cornea. To the interior of the cornea, separated from it by a watery fluid, there is a delicate curtain which hangs over the transparent window in front, and forms the variously colored iris. This curtain is a wonderful arrangement for adapting the eye to the intensity of light which falls on it. Fibers of muscles are so ingeniously distributed in it that it can almost close the opening in a strong light, or open it wide when the light is fainter. The iris diaphragm, with which the photographer regulates the entrance of light into his camera, is merely a poor imitation of it. Moreover, it contains pigment cells which may be crowded when the light is strong, or fewer in number when the eye wants as much light as possible so we get the black eyes, eyes rich in pigment to mitigate the light, of the southerner, the blue eyes with little pigment of the dweller in the darker northern lands, and every intermediate shade and combination of them. Behind the circular window, the pupil, is the crystalline lens, which, unlike any lens that man can make, can be altered by fine muscles so as to focus itself for any distance. Other muscles and tendons are attached to the outside of the eyeball, and they automatically turn it in the direction we want. Some men of science have found many defects in the eye, and there are defects, but when one thinks of the unconscious agencies that have built up this wonderful camera, and work it automatically every moment of our waking lives, one is not disposed to cavil. But the most wonderful part of it is the sensitive plate at the back of the eyeball, a semi-transparent membrane which we call the retina, lines three-fourths of the interior of the eyeball, which is filled with fluid, and it is particularly developed at one spot, the real seat of distinct vision. On this yellow spot, in each eye, the rays of light form an inverted image of the object at which we are looking. The stereoscope enables us to understand how the images of the two eyes 
are blended, and how they enable us to see nature more perfectly. Vision, as might be expected, is still very imperfectly understood. The retina is a very complex layer of delicate nerve cells, in which certain parts that are known as rods and cones seem to be essential elements. There seems to be chemical action, though whether there are three distinct chemicals for the three primary colors, or one chemical that breaks into separate colors, or what happens we do not know. It is generally suspected that color vision is connected with one or more fine chemicals which may be lacking in color-blind people. However that may be, the nerve layer closes up at the back of the eye, and as the optic nerve conveys the images of things in some way to the conscious center. What precisely travels along the nerve we cannot say, but to imagine that an image or picture is conveyed is to imitate children who think that words travel along a telegraph wire. The sense of hearing. The organ of hearing is not less remarkable than the eye. We have already seen that the external ear is, to use the cautious words of Professor Starling, probably of no use whatever. In cases where it has been cut off, the sense of hearing was not affected at all but it was useful and mobile in an earlier ancestor of man. From it, in any case, a narrow channel about an inch long, protected against adventurous insects by wax secreted by its glands, conducts the waves of sound to the real ear. At the outer end of this passage, the sound waves beat upon a sensitive drum, the tympanum, a membrane of a most ingenious construction. This membrane must not have a period of vibration of its own. It must respond readily and immediately to every sort of wave that impinges on it. It is therefore so constructed that each part of it has a different period of vibration, and it is further damped by a little bone pressing against it on the other side. The pressure of air on the outside of the drum, which must alter with changes of pressure outside, is regulated by a channel, the eustachian tube, running to it from the roof of the mouth. Three little bones, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, convey the vibrations of the drum to another drum, which is stretched across the entrance to the real ear inside the skull. As the waves of sound impinge on the tympanum and set it vibrating, the three little bones work together and repeat the vibrations on the second drum, the oval window. Beyond this is a coiled shell which contains the real organ of hearing, a large number of hair cells, the organs of corti, interlacing with the fine fibers of the auditory nerve. The vibration of the oval window agitates the fluid inside this organ and the hair cells communicate this movement to the nerves, which then convey to the brain. Once more, we have a mechanism full of ingenuity in every part, and brief descriptions of this kind are almost unjust to the various organs of our body. But today we should require a large volume to give an account of our knowledge of the brain and sense organs alone. We have referred to the three small bones of the ear by which the waves of sound are conveyed to the inner ear. The history of these bones is strange. The hammer was at an early stage of the evolution of mammals, a part of the lower jaw. The anvil was the bone on the base of the skull, with which it articulated. When mastication and molar teeth were evolved in the ancestry of mammals, a new joint was formed in the lower jaw, and these two bones the hammer and anvil, were taken into the service of the ear. Section 11. The Discovery of Hormones Remarkable Discoveries About the Glands A physiologist would class the different parts of the body as bones, muscles, nerves, and glands, and we have in conclusion to say something about the last. We have already spoken of the myriads of tiny tubular glands which line the alimentary canal. Another mass of tubular glands make up the essential part of the kidneys. 
they really form a filter of a remarkable pattern. Arteries bring the blood to the kidney tubules, which are stimulated to action by the blood. Each, by vital action, not a mere physical process, takes out of the blood the fluid nitrogenous waste substances and a certain amount of water, and the tiny ducts connected with the tubules run together and carry the waste or urine to the bladder. But the main interest today is in what scientific men call the ductless glands, glands which extract substances from the blood but do not pour their secretion into special channels. We have already mentioned a most interesting example in the suprarenal glands, two little bodies near the kidneys, each about the size of a segment of a small orange, which pour into the blood a chemical messenger, or hormone, for regulating the supply of blood to the various organs. It is one of the most remarkable discoveries of recent years that there are numbers of little glands entirely devoted to the manufacture of hormones. If all the glands of internal secretion were rolled together, they would form a parcel small enough to go into a waistcoat pocket, yet such a small mass can influence the working and growth of the whole body. In his interesting book, which we have already mentioned, Sir Arthur Keith, referring to the dispatch of secretion to the stomach, uses the following suggestive words. The secretin, or hormone, which acts as a missive, is posted in the nearest letter boxes, or capillaries, in the duodenal wall, and is carried away in the general blood circulation, which serves for all kinds of postal traffic. In a postal system, where there are no sorters, and which must be conducted by an automatic mechanism, letters or missives cannot be addressed in the usual way. Their destination is indicated not by their inscription, but by their shape. The molecules of secretin may be regarded as ultra-microscopic Yale keys sent out to search for the locks of letter boxes which they can fit and enter. They circulate round the body until they find their destination. What is still more wonderful in this system is that the letter boxes, or we may call them locks, have a positive attraction for the key missives which are destined for them. It was Professor Starling who named these messengers hormones. The thyroid glands, two little lobes on either side of the windpipe, are bodies of this nature which have attracted a good deal of popular attention of late years. The secretion formed is discharged straight into the blood stream, and for that reason they are called ductless glands, or glands of internal secretion. They will be discussed at greater length in a later section of this work. Here it is enough to say that the chemical stuff, or hormone, which they secrete, increases the vitality of the tissues. It makes the tissues greedy for oxygen, and the work goes on more briskly. Hence it is that decay, or imperfect development, of the thyroid glands leads to that state of bodily and mental feebleness which is called cretinism, while the extract from the glands can be used for the purpose of rejuvenation. This small organ, the thyroid gland, is necessary to the health and normal development of both body and mind, and this knowledge has been put to practical application in some cases with astounding results. Near the thyroid glands are four small bodies, the parathyroids. The function of these is not clear, but there is serious nervous trouble if they are removed. Then there is a thymus gland, which seems in some way to prevent the sex organs from developing too early. It is situated in front of the breast bone, and must act by postal service. The internal sex organs, themselves, post a good many of these hormones in the blood. Everybody knows the striking difference between a normal and a castrated animal. The development of secondary sexual characteristics, such as antlers, seems to be largely stimulated by chemical messengers of this kind. One of the most interesting illustrations is in connection with the milk in the mother's breasts. 
how does the mammal mother come to have this rich development of her milk glands just at the moment when it is needed it has been discovered that as soon as she becomes pregnant the ovaries begin to discharge a hormone into her blood which finds its way to the breasts and stimulates them probably the embryo itself also produces hormones which pass into the mother's blood and serve a useful purpose up to the time of birth finally there is a remarkable and long neglected little body in the head the pituitary body which is a rich laboratory of hormones it controls the growth of tissues by stimulating them when it is removed from an animal the body becomes feeble and undersize on the other hand some rather unfortunate people have their pituitary body overgrown or overactive and they develop unpleasantly large faces hands and feet or become giants such as far as one can tell it in so brief a space is the tale of the wonderful mechanisms in the body even the skin which binds and protects this marvelous system of parts is a remarkable organ when one has time to study it thoroughly on the tender eyelids of a young child it is as thin as tissue paper yet on the palms of some horny-handed son of toil it will produce protecting cells until it becomes an eighth of an inch thick it is moreover rich in sweat glands which as we saw are most important for regulating the temperature of the body lubricating or sebaceous glands corpuscles for the sense of touch and little pits in which take root the hairs which were once of great service to the body every internal surface also has its lining or skin though where toughness is required but so fine in the right places that gases and fluids can pass through it for breathing and nutritive purposes the proper study of mankind is man said a great poet and we may surely add that we know no more interesting study in the universe section twelve mind and body before we leave the subject of this article a further word should be said the comparison of the body to an engine is very useful but it is more than a little apt to lead us astray for the body is living and in higher animals at least there is a mind that counts no one has succeeded in making clear the relation between mind and body if there be a relation but what we are sure of is that there are two aspects two sides to the shield the mental and the bodily just as a dome has its inner concave and its outer convex curve inseparable from one another two aspects of the same thing so the living creature is a feeling remembering willing and sometimes thinking being just as really and truly as it is a feeding moving storing and energy transforming system on the one side there is mind probably present even when it is not apparent to the observer on the other side there is the routine of chemical processes which we call metabolism sometimes the living creature is more of a body mind sometimes more of a mind body we cannot solve the riddle the mental or subjective and the bodily or objective activity are bound together in one what we are quite sure of is that the ideal for the organism is a healthy body at the service of a healthy mind let us take an illustration of the influence of mind on body emotions and digestion the famous physiologist of petrograd professor ivan petrovich pavlov was the first to demonstrate the influence of the emotions on the health of the system everyone knows that a good circulation and a good digestion make for cheerfulness but the converse is also true a merry heart is the life of the flesh the researches of pavlov cannon carlson and creel have made it quite clear that pleasant emotions favor the secretion of digestive juices the rhythmic movements of the food canal which work the nutriment downwards and even the absorption of what has been made soluble and diffusible 
On the other hand, unpleasant emotions, such as envy and mental disturbances, such as worry, hinder digestion and the smooth working of the nutritive process. THE COLT OF JOY When the hungry man sees the well-laid table, his mouth waters. But everyone knows that a memory or an anticipation will also serve to move at least the first link in the digestive chain. Professor Dearborn writes, It is now well known that no sense experience is too remote from the innervations of digestion to be taken into its associations and serve as a stimulus of digestive movements and secretions. As was said of old time, he that of a merry heart has a continuous feast. When our joyous index is high, our digestion is good. As Dr. Salibi has put it, freedom from care has nutritive value. It does not seem far-fetched to wonder if the joyousness of singing birds may not react on their remarkably well-developed capacities. We speak smilingly of our friend's eupeptic cheerfulness, but our smile is a little apt to become a materialism. We have to inquire whether our friend is not eupeptic because of his physical success in the great task of happiness. The truth is that the mental and the bodily harmonies are the base and treble of one tune. The influence of mind on body finds a good illustration in the stimulation of the adrenal glands by strong emotion. Anger, which may be righteous, affects the production of adrenaline by the core of the adrenal glands, situated near the kidneys. The slight increase in this powerful chemical messenger or hormone, which the blood sweeps away, has numerous effects through the body. It constricts the smaller blood vessels, and there is less blood in the peripheral and more in the deeper parts. It raises the blood pressure, excites and freshens the muscles, adds to the sugar content of the blood, increases the coagulability of the blood, and so on. In short, the whole body is prepared for a fight and all under the influence of what was to begin with a physical event. Good news, physical, if anything is, may set in motion a series of vital processes, complex beyond the ken of the wisest. What is true of digestion is also true of the circulation. Wordsworth was a better physiologist than he knew when he spoke of his heart leaping up at the sight of the rainbow and filling with pleasure at the recollection of the daffodils dancing by the lakeside. There are facts which point to the conclusion that a gladsome mind increases the efficiency of the nervous system. Good tidings will invigorate the flagging energies of a band of explorers. An unexpected visit will change a wearied homesick child, as if by magic, into a dancing gladsome elf. A religious joy enables men and women to transcend the limits of our frail humanity. Healthy-mindedness. There is reason, then, to believe that emotion has its physical accompaniment in tensions and movements throughout the body, and in changes in the secretion of glands. There is a physiological reverberation of joy. But there must be more than this. The nervous system has a notable, integrative, or unifying function. It makes for the harmony of the bodily life. This function it may discharge the better if the physical side is finding its due development. Thus it is well known that aesthetic emotion, delight in the beautiful, is very markedly a body and mind reaction, affecting the whole creature as a unity. It is practically certain that many people fail in health because they starve their higher senses and minds. We venture to go further under the conviction that physiology and psychology must join hands, as is suggested indeed by the name of the new science of psychobiology. The physiological ideal is bodily health. Its essential correlate is healthy-mindedness. No doubt the invalid may have a vigorously healthy mind, and the athlete a mind diseased. But on the average, the two aspects of health must develop together. Hence the importance of mental dieting, mental gymnastics, mental rest, 
mental play, mental stores, though these must be sought as ends in themselves, not as aids to digestion. End of section 5. Recording by Guero. Section 6 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 11. How Darwinism Stands Today, Part 1. Universal Acceptance of the Evolution Idea. When people speak of Darwinism, they sometimes mean the general idea of evolution, that the present is the child of the past and the parent of the future. Now the evolutionary way of looking at things has certainly been confirmed by the progress of science and is almost unanimously accepted by competent judges today. This horse that gallops past on the tiptoe of one digit on each foot is the natural outcome of an ancestral stock of small-hooved mammals that used to plod about in Eocene meadows with four toes on each forefoot and three in a vestige on each hind foot. This bird that flies past is the descendant of such an old-fashioned type as the Jurassic Archaeopteryx, an archaic bird with teeth in both jaws, a long tail like a lizard's, and a sort of half-made wing. And this first known bird must be traced back to an ancestry among the extinct dinosaur reptiles, though the precise pedigree remains hidden in the rocks. These reptiles must be traced back to certain primitive amphibians, and these to certain old-fashioned fishes, and so on, back and back, till we lose our clue in the thick mist of life's beginnings. If this is Darwinism, it stands more firmly than ever, except that we are more keenly aware than in Darwin's day of our ignorance as to the origin and affiliation of the great classes. But frankly, the only scientific way of looking at the present-day fauna and flora is to regard them as the outcome of a natural evolution. In a previous chapter, this statement has been justified. The Factors in Evolution But Darwinism is more properly used, in a stricter sense, to mean Darwin's theory of the factors in evolution. If birds sprang from dinosaur reptiles, if the modern horse is the descendant of the Eohippus, which was about the size of a fox terrier, how did the gradual transformation come about? There were many evolutionists before Darwin, and some of them propounded theories as to the factors in the age-long process. But Charles Darwin and his magnanimous fellow worker, Alfred Russell Wallace, thought out a coherent theory of the factors, a theory that fitted the facts so reasonably well that it soon won the conviction of a large body of naturalists. The essence of the Darwinian theory is in the two words, variation and selection, and Darwin stated it in a couple of sentences. Quote, As many more individuals of each species are born than can possibly survive, and as, consequently, there is a frequently recurring struggle for existence, it follows that any being, if it vary however slightly in any manner profitable to itself, under the complex and sometimes varying conditions of life, will have a better chance of surviving, and thus be naturally selected. From the strong principle of inheritance, any selected variety will tend to propagate its new and modified form." Unquote. The Essence of Darwinism this is, however, too terse a statement. It requires some disentangling and expansion. Proposition 1. Variability is a fact of life. Offspring are usually somewhat different from their parents and from the other members of the family. Some of these variations make for success. Success in getting food, in avoiding enemies, in securing mates, in giving the next generation a good start, and in other ways. Individuals that have varied in a profitable way will succeed better than those that have varied in the opposite direction, and better than those that have not varied at all. Proposition 2. If the individuals that have varied profitably get the reward of their superiority, and if the individuals that have varied unprofitably or not at all are handicapped by their inferiority, this will have an effect on the character of the stock or race or species, provided that the novel peculiarities are hereditarily entailed on successive generations. If the individuals with profitable peculiarities, let us say plus variants, are consistently favored, and if their virtues are consistently handed on, their type will come to be that of the race. Whereas, those with unprofitable peculiarities, or none at all, 
let us say minus variants, will be weeded out and will gradually disappear. Professor R. C. Punnett has calculated that, if a population contains 0.001% of a new variety, and if that variety has even a 5% selection advantage over the original form, the latter will almost completely disappear in less than a hundred generations. Proposition 3. But there cannot be sifting or selection without a sieve, and that is to be found in the struggle for existence. Living creatures are hemmed in by limitations and confronted by ever-changing difficulties. There is a tendency to overpopulation. Circumstances are changeful. The vigorous creature is a hustler. There is a struggle for food, for foothold, for self-preservation, for mates, and for family well-being, indeed for luxuries as well as for necessities. There is a struggle between fellows of the same kind, for a hungry locust may devour its neighbor, and even the amoeba may be a cannibal. There is a struggle between foes of quite different kinds, between the grazing herd and the marauding carnivores, between the kestrel hawk and the nimble field voles. There is a struggle also between living creatures and their inanimate surroundings, the struggle against cold and heat, against wind and wave, against drought and flood. Subtle beyond description and almost ceaseless in its operation is nature's sifting, which Darwin called natural selection. In domestication and cultivation, it is man who fosters and eliminates. In nature, the same kind of transformation as the breeder and the gardener effect is brought about by the struggle for existence. Darwinism in Process of Evolution These three propositions express the gist of Darwinism, and the question before us is, how Darwinism stands today. Before trying to answer this difficult question, we may point out that it would be a sorry business if Darwinism stood today as it was left by Darwin. He knew well that he had only begun to solve the problem of organic evolution. He looked forward with clear eyes to changes that the progress of science would enforce. It would be a terrible contradiction in terms if an evolution theory did not itself evolve. The marvel is not that it is necessary to make some changes in what Alfred Russell Wallace so generously called Darwinism, but rather that so much of Darwin's doctrine stands firm, foursquare to the winds. Another preliminary note is unfortunately necessary, that it is quite illegitimate to infer from our dubiety in regard to the factors of evolution any hesitation as to the fact. Our frankness in admitting difficulties and relative ignorance in regard to the variations and selections that led from certain dinosaurs to birds cannot be used by any fair-minded inquirer as an argument against the idea of evolution. For how else could birds have arisen? As Wallace said in 1888, quote, descent with modification is now universally accepted as the order of nature in the organic world, unquote. But the question before us is this, what as regards the factors in evolution have been the changes since Darwin's day? The Three Problems of Evolution there are three great problems before the evolutionist. 1. What is the origin of the new? 2. What are the laws of inheritance? And 3. What are the sifting methods that operate on the raw materials provided and determine survival? In other words, what are the originative factors? What are the laws of entail? And what are the directive or sifting factors? Evolution depends on new departures, peculiarities, idiosyncrasies, divergences, freaks, sports, a little more of this, a little less of that. In short, organic or constitutional changes. These are technically called variations and mutations. In other words, evolution, whether progressive or retrogressive, depends on the emergence of novelties. When there are no novelties, there can be no evolution. The lampshell, lingula, seems to have remained stagnant for many millions of years, a fine creature, but icily perfect. Heredity is the relation of organic continuity between successive generations, the living on of the past in the present, the flesh and blood linkage between an individual and his forebears on the one hand, his offspring on the other. The individual is like a lens into which rays from parentage and ancestry converge, from which they diverge again to the progeny. Heredity is the reproductive relation which secures that like tends to beget like, and yet seldom does. Some peculiarities of an individual are heritable, others are not. Longevity is readily entailed, but genius is not. 
Deaf mutism is very transmissible, but a very brown Anglo-Indian father has a peach-blossom complexion daughter. Thus, if we think early, we see that heredity is not so much a factor in evolution as a condition. There would still be heredity, though evolution stopped, but there can be no evolution without heredity. For heredity implies that the gains of the past can be capitalized, and contrariwise, that individual losses need not involve racial bankruptcy. A man who has lost an eye may be assured that his son will have two, even if the mother is single-eyed as well. What are called variations and mutations in biological language are the organism's experiment in self-expression, and these are the raw materials of progress. Granted raw materials, and granted their continuance, something more is needed, their sifting. As we have said in a previous article, the process of evolution is a long-drawn-out process of testing all things and holding fast that which is good. The variations or novelties are the qualities to be tested. The struggle for existence, which includes the organism's endeavors, is the sieve that tests. Heredity secures the holding fast of what has proved good. To employ a metaphor which has the defect of triviality, the variations are the ever-fresh hands of heredity cards that are given to the organism to play with. The organism uses these in the struggle for existence, with its strange mixture of active endeavor and fortuity. But when the organism, with a good hand, a persistently good hand, becomes eventually tired and vacates its chair for a successor, it hands on its luck, and its cunning too. Thus, the essence of Darwinism is that nothing succeeds like success. As regards variations, the fountain of change is even more copious than Darwin supposed. What is so clear in regard to pigeons and poultry, dogs and horses, that they are continually producing something new in their humanly controlled breeding, finds abundant illustration in wild nature. There are conservative types, it is true, which persist in a well-poised organic equilibrium, but in many cases there is flux. Outlying variants link one species to another. When the novelties or variations are registered statistically, they often form what is called the curve of frequency of error, which means that the number of variants of any particular magnitude will be in inverse proportion to the amount of the deviation from the mean. If the mean stature of the population be 5 feet 8 inches, there will be, as Alfred Russell Wallace points out, in 2,600 men, taken at random, one of 4 foot 8 inches and one of 6 foot 8 inches, 12 of 5 feet, and about 12 of 6 foot 4 inches. In fact, there will be equal numbers at equal distances on each side of the mean. But the great majority of the deviations will be not far from the mean. Definiteness in Variation Since Darwin's time, evidence has accumulated which shows that variations are more definite than used to be supposed. The paleontologists, who work out long series of fossils, bring forward cases of what looks like steady progress in a definite direction. There is a striking absence of what one might call arrow shot at a venture. It looks as if the occurrence of the new were limited by what has gone before, just as the architecture of a building that has been erected determines in some measure the style of any addition. An organic new departure will tend to be more or less congruent with what has been previously established. In post-Darwinian days, the element of the fortuitous has shrunk. Discontinuous Variations Darwin was much interested in sports or freaks, such as the sudden appearance of a dwarf or a giant, a hornless calf or a tailless kitten, a white blackbird or a weeping ash, a thornless rose or a stoneless plum, a wonder horse with its mane reaching the ground, or a Japanese cock with a tail six feet long. But Darwin did not venture to attach great importance to these brusque novelties, or discontinuous variations, first because he thought they were of rare occurrence, and second because he thought they would be speedily averaged off in the offspring of a sport which had paired with an ordinary individual. He did not know what his contemporary Mendel proved, that when a purebred tall pea and a purebred dwarf pea are crossed, the offspring are all tall. Now one of the great changes that has come about since Darwin's day is a recognition of the frequency of discontinuous variations, by which we mean sudden novelties which are not connected with the type of the species by intermediate gradations. We may think of the white crow or the weeping willow. The proteus leaps as well as creeps especially through the investigations of Professor William Bateson 
and Professor Hugo de Vry, it has been plain that changes of considerable magnitude may occur at a bound. When the new character that suddenly appears, such as a shirley poppy or a short-legged ancon sheep, has a considerable degree of perfection from its first appearance, is independently heritable to the offspring, and does not blend or average off, it is called a mutation. Professor de Vries writes, The current belief assumes that species are slowly changed into new types. In contradiction to this conception, the theory of mutation assumes that new species and varieties are produced from existing forms by sudden leaps. The parent type itself remains unchanged throughout the process, and may repeatedly give birth to new forms. These may arise simultaneously and in groups, or separately at more or less widely distant periods. This was strikingly illustrated by the sporting evening primrose, Enothera lamarckiana, a species of North American origin, which de Vries found at Hilversum in Holland, and which proved to be in a very changeful mood. Almost all its organs were varying, as if swayed by a restless internal tide. It gave rise abruptly to numerous new forms which bred true. It illustrated species in the making. Darwin found the raw material of evolution in small fluctuating variations, which are no doubt of frequent occurrence. Since Darwin's day, it has become not only possible but necessary to attach much importance to discontinuous mutations. The contrast was aptly illustrated by Sir Francis Galton, who compared the varying organism to a polyhedron, a solid body with many faces, which can roll from one face to another. When it settles down on any particular face, it is in stable equilibrium. Small disturbances may make the polyhedron oscillate, but it always returns to the same face. These oscillations are like Darwin's fluctuating variations, but the comparison breaks down inasmuch as the living creature may be, as it were, fixed in one of its oscillations, so that the variant makes a fresh start. Greater disturbances of the polyhedron may make it roll over onto a new face altogether, where it comes to rest again, only showing once more the minor fluctuations around its new center. The new position corresponds to what is now called a mutation. Studies in inheritance have shown that these mutations have great staying power. They reappear persistently and intact in a certain proportion of the descendants. They are not liable to be swamped by intercrossing, as Darwin supposed. The curious fact is that the hereditary entailment of the fluctuating variations, which Darwin almost took for granted, requires more demonstration today than does the hereditary entailment of mutations. End of section 6section 7 of the outline of science volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the outline of science volume 2 by j arthur thompson chapter 11 how darwinism stands today part 2 variations and modifications under the influence of persistent exercise, such as dancing, the muscles of the legs increase in size, and the tendency to increase may spread in an interesting way to other parts of the body. Long-continued exercise of white rats increases the weight of the heart, kidneys, and liver, on an average about 20%. Water snails reared in cramped surroundings grow up dwarfish. Goldfishes kept in the dark for three years become totally blind. If the wan pigmentless proteus from the Dalmatian caves be exposed to light, it becomes black, and the eggs laid by individuals kept in the light develop into dark larvae. Prolonged pressure on a particular part of the skin often produces a thickening or callosity. The colors of birds' feathers are sometimes affected by the food they eat, as is well known in the case of canaries and parrots. The stomach of the herring gull changes its character according to the diet, whether it be fish or grain. Now all these changes are technically called modifications. They are directly induced in the individual lifetime by peculiarities in habits and surroundings, including food. They are also called acquired characters, a very unfortunate term. They are impressed from without, whereas true variations and mutations are expressed from within. Modifications are indents or imprints. Variations are outcomes. According to the evolution theory of Lamarck, which Darwin accepted in some measure, the characters of a race may slowly change through the cumulative inheritance 
of the modifications which individuals acquire as the result of peculiarities in use and disuse and in surroundings. A cave animal is blind, according to Lamarck, as the result of ages of living in darkness, during which the eyes have suffered from disuse. The modern Darwinian would point to the fact that constitutional or germinal variations in eyes are common. Variants with weak eyes and with a bias in that direction would naturally seek out caves. The giraffe has got a very long straight neck because of the cumulative result of generation after generation of stretching up to the branches of the acacia trees. With certain provisos, Darwin inclined to accept this view as supplementary to his own. But the modern Darwinian would point to the fact that constitutional or germinal variations in the proportions of different parts of the body are common. Giraffe variants in the direction of a long neck would prosper and would become the leaders of the race. Long noses often run in families, but the length of the nose is not due to the vigor with which generations have used the handkerchief. No one doubts the reality of modifications. One has only to look at the tan skin of the African explorer. But what is doubtful is that a modification can be passed on from the individual that acquires it to his offspring, passed on as such or in any representative degree. The modification may be very important, even life-saving for the individual, but unless it can be transmitted, it is not in any direct way important for the race. The skepticism as to transmission of bodily modifications was focused by Sir Francis Galton and by Professor August Weissman, and many would say that one of the great changes in Darwinism since Darwin's day has been the abandonment of the belief in the Lamarckian postulate of the transmission of modifications. There are some difficult cases, however, which suggest that biologists must not be in a hurry to shut out the possibility of such transmission. Omitting a few difficult cases, we can only record our impression that the available evidence indicating a transmission of acquired characters as such, or in any representative degree, is very inconclusive. But this would not be admitted by such a distinguished zoologist as Professor E. W. McBride, and the scientific outlook should be that of an open mind, associated with an eager search for more facts. Those who are unfamiliar with the subject often ask how a race could make progress at all if acquired characters were not transmitted from generation to generation. The answer is that the changes which make for racial progress are variations and mutations arising from within, from disturbances and rearrangements, permutations and combinations, in the germ cells from which new individuals arise. In 1796, the utmost speed of the trotting horse was stated at a mile in 2 minutes 37 seconds, in 1896 at 2 minutes 10 seconds. Does it not follow that the trotting horse has been improved by the transmission of the results of the systematic training in trotting? It is certain that this conclusion does not follow from the available evidence, which points to the conclusion that the improvement in speed has been mainly due to the selective breeding of constitutionally swift horses. The trotter is born, not made. It should also be understood that modifications may reappear, not because they have been transmitted, but because the conditions which originally brought about the change may still persist and produce the same effect on the offspring. And as to the inheritance of disease, this is apparently confined to constitutional diseases which are due to disturbances in the germ cells. Diseases due to peculiarities of occupation or diet are not transmitted as such, though an unborn offspring may be poisoned before birth, or even infected with some disease microbe. Another common misunderstanding must be cleared up, namely, the idea that if peculiarities directly induced by improvements in human nurture, surroundings, food, and habits, are not handed on to the offspring, then such improvements are not of great importance. But if the beneficial results of improved function and environment are not as such transmitted, it becomes all the more urgent that they should be re-impressed on each successive generation. If they are not entailed, then it is all the more important that they should be reacquired. Moreover, these ameliorations of nurture, in the wide sense, may serve as the liberating stimuli that encourage the unfolding of new variations of a useful sort. Besides, it has to be borne in mind that, although the direct effects of fresh air, exercise, good food, beautiful surroundings, pleasant work, and the like, may not be transmitted as such, or in any representative degree, they may increase the general vigor of the next generation, and will certainly do so 
when the mother influences the offspring before birth, an influence which is not in the strict sense part of the inheritance. Given a constitutional taint or weakness, it may be counteracted by suitable nurture, but that will not make it disappear from the inheritance. It will crop up in a later generation if it gets a chance. In breeding animals and cultivating plants, there seems to be no use working with individuals showing advantageous modifications. The only hope is to select from among advantageous variations or mutations. Finally, it should be noted that if advantageous modifications are not entailed, which may be a matter for regret, the same non-transmission will hold in regard to disadvantageous modifications, whereat we may congratulate ourselves. Origin of Variations Darwin had no theory of the origin of variations, and we must join with him in saying, our ignorance of the laws of variation is profound. This is the central problem of evolution, the origin of the new, yet certain possibilities have become clearer since Darwin's day. When a white blackbird is hatched, when an albino child is born, when a calf appears without horns, or a kitten without a tail, we interpret these variations as due to the dropping out of the relevant hereditary item in the inheritance, and we know that in the history of the germ cells there are definite opportunities for such losses. When, on the other hand, an offspring has more than usual of a certain character, we can interpret this as due to its getting a double dose, from both sides of the house, of the hereditary item in question. If both parents are very dark and come of very dark stocks, the offspring may be darker still, and the same holds terribly true of a double dose of some disadvantageous character, such as deaf mutism. The individual life always begins in the fertilized egg cell, and there may be accentuation of a character, we say, if it is strongly represented both in the paternal and in the maternal hereditary contributions. In the sperm cell, as in the egg cell, there is a complete set of hereditary factors or initiatives, and these two sets come into intimate and orderly union in fertilization. When the fertilized egg develops into an embryo and into a young creature, there may be an expression of some paternal peculiarities and some maternal peculiarities, with a new pattern as the result. It must be understood that although there is a complete assortment of hereditary qualities in the egg cell and also in the sperm cell, it is usually only one set that finds expression in the offspring in regard to any particular structure. The child may have its mother's hair, its father's chin. In some cases, a father's character as regards some particular feature is seen only in his sons, not in his daughters, but the feature may appear in his daughter's sons. When the human variant shows a new pattern of a particularly happy kind, we call it genius. When the outcome is more dubious, we say crank, and the animal kingdom is full of geniuses and cranks. Our point, however, is just this, that fertilization offers an opportunity for new permutations and combinations. If we may compare an inheritance to a pack of cards, each hereditary constituent or factor corresponding to a card, then there is in fertilization a reshuffling, just as there is in the maturation of the germ cells an opportunity for cards being lost. We may say, then, that an increased knowledge of the history of the germ cells since Darwin's day has made it possible to understand how certain kinds of variations may arise. If we probe a little deeper, we see the possibility that the stimuli of outside changes, that is, of climate, may saturate through the organism and provoke the complex germ cells to change. Thus, Professor W. L. Tower subjected potato beetles, at a certain stage of their development, to very unusual conditions of temperature and humidity. The beetles themselves were not changed, for these hard-shelled creatures do not lend themselves to external modification. But in a number of cases, the offspring of the beetles showed remarkable changes, for example, in color and markings. And the offspring of these variants did not revert to the grandparental type. In such a case, it looks as if an environmental stimulus penetrating through the body serves as the liberator or stimulus of variability in the germ cells. It may seem for a moment that this case of the potato beetles indicates the inheritance of the results of environmental influence, but it must be carefully noticed that the parent beetles showed no modification or acquired character. What happened was that a peculiarity of environment saturated through the body 
and started a germinal peculiarity which all biologists are agreed in regarding as heritable. Similarly, persistent alcoholism on the part of a strong parent may prejudice the offspring by provoking disturbance in the germ cells. But this is very different from the transmission of hardened liver or any other specific modification. Everyone knows that alcoholism of parents does not make for vigorous progeny. But it must be insisted that this does not bear very directly on the technical problem of the transmission of modification. In most cases, what is inherited in the alcoholic lineage, rarely a long one, is a constitutional defect, for example, lack of control. In some cases, the parental intemperance affects the germ cells prejudicially, though in some animals the results of experiments do not corroborate this. It seems to vary with the organism. Finally, the offspring of an alcoholic mother may be badly handicapped before birth, but this has little bearing on the transmission of acquired characters as the fact that whiskey babies do not thrive. It is not legitimate to redefine acquired characters. The term means modifications of structure acquired in the individual lifetime as the direct result of peculiarities in surroundings, food, and function. Professor Weissman laid emphasis on the somewhat subtle idea that the complex germplasm, which somehow contains the whole inheritance, might be prompted to vary by fluctuations in the nutritive stream of the body. Just as poisons in the blood may deteriorate the germ cells in definite ways, so the gentler influence of slight changes in nutrition may induce the germ cell to internal rearrangements which are by and by expressed as profitable variations. It should not be forgotten that differences in diet determine whether the grub of a bee is to develop into a worker or into a queen. It seems fair to say that the problem of the origin of variations is not so dark as it was in Darwin's time. At the same time, no one can pretend to understand the emergence of the distinctively new. The germ cell is a living creature in a single cell phase of being, and it may be that its variations are the outcomes of a primary quality of living creatures, inherent in the germ cell, the capacity of making experiments in self-expression. End of section 7section 8 of the outline of science volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the outline of science volume 2 by j arthur thompson chapter 11 how darwinism stands today part 3 as regards heredity Darwin was one of the first to show that the mysterious problems of heredity could be attacked scientifically, and his cousin, Sir Francis Galton, went much further. But it is unfortunate that neither of them knew anything about the Abbe Mendel, who published papers in 1865 which have revolutionized the whole subject. His work remained practically unknown till 1900. Mendelism There are three fundamental ideas in Mendelism. The first is the idea of unit characters, and this requires a little patience. By inheritance is meant what the living creature is, or has to start with, when it is represented by a fertilized egg cell. Now it has been discovered that an inheritance is, in part, built up of numerous, more or less clear-cut, crisply defined, non-blending characters, which are continued in some of the descendants as definite wholes, neither merging nor dividing. We may think of the color of the eye, the quality of the hair, the shape of the nose. Strictly speaking, what lies in the inheritance is not the character as seen in the adult, but a germinal representative, technically called a factor or gene, of the character. The full-grown character, say the shape of the nose, is, as it were, a product of the germinal representative and the surrounding influences which operate during development. It is also necessary to understand that an adult character, like the quality of the hair, may be represented in the germ cell by several factors. Moreover, one germinal factor, for example, the initiative for developing dark pigment, may influence several characters in the adult. If a man has his fingers all thumbs, that is, two joints instead of three, this peculiarity, called brachydactylism, is sure to be continued in a certain proportion of his descendants, 
and we call it a unit character. The persistence of the Habsburg lip in the royal houses of Austria and Spain is a good instance of how a unit character comes to stay for many generations. Night blindness, or the inability to see in dim light, has been traced through a lineage since near the beginning of the 17th century, another illustration of the persistence of a unit character. We do not precisely know what the germinal factors of the unit characters are like, but in some cases it is known that they lie in linear order in the nuclear rods or chromosomes. In some instances, though it is impossible in a few words to explain how, we know what region of the chromosome the factor occupies. But the most important point is that the unit characters, or their factors, behave as if they were definite entities, like the radicals in chemistry, which can be shuffled about and distributed to the offspring in some degree independent of one another. Thus, in the lineage of the night blind, it was not every individual that showed the peculiarity, but only a certain proportion in each generation. In his masterly work on Mendelism, Professor R. C. Punnett refers to a unit character as follows. Unit characters are represented by definite factors in the gamete or germ cell, which, in the process of heredity, behave as indivisible entities and are distributed according to a definite scheme. The factor for this or that unit character is either present in the gamete or it is not present. It must be there in its entirety or be completely absent. The second fundamental idea in Mendelism is that of dominance. When Mendel crossed a purebred tall P with a purebred dwarf P, the offspring were all tall. So he called the quality of tallness dominant to the recessive quality of dwarfness, which the hybrid offspring kept, as it were, up their sleeve. The dwarfness is not expressed in the hybrid P's, but it must be part of the inheritance, for it reappears in a quarter of the progeny of the hybrids if these are inbred or allowed to self-fertilize. The Japanese have reared a race of peculiar waltzing mice, which have many strange habits, for example, of dancing round and round. If a Japanese waltzing mouse is crossed with a normal mouse, all the hybrid offspring are normal, the waltzing peculiarity being recessive to normality. But if these hybrid mice are paired together, some of their progeny are waltzers, in the proportion of one waltzer to three normals, which is called the Mendelian ratio. If one of the waltzers of the second generation pairs with another waltzer, the progeny are all waltzers, which shows that the factor for normal locomotion has disappeared from the inheritance along this line. It is a curious fact that one of these second-generation waltzers might be conscientiously sold in the market as a pure waltzer, although its parents were normal and one of its grandparents likewise. To return to the beginning, if a waltzing mouse is crossed with a normal mouse, all the offspring will be normal. Normality is dominant, waltzing is recessive. If these normal hybrids pair, their offspring will be 25% pure waltzers and 75% apparently normal mice. But of the 75% apparently normal, a third will be pure normals, yielding nothing but normals when bred with others like themselves. But the other two-thirds, although apparently normal, have, like their immediate parents, the waltzing character up their sleeve, for when they are paired together, they yield 25% pure normals, 50% apparent normals, and 25% pure waltzers. It is impossible to keep this clearly in mind without some schematic formulation, such as the above. In the case of the mice, the character of normal locomotion is dominant over the recessive character of waltzing but it must not be supposed that the dominant character is necessarily the one nearest the normal type. Thus, a short tail in cats is dominant, somewhat imperfectly, to the ordinary tail. The appearance of extra toes in poultry is dominant to the presence of normal four toes. Hornlessness in cattle is dominant to the presence of horns. Among the many characters which are now known to exhibit Mendelian inheritance, the following may be cited the dominant condition being named first in each case. Normal hair and long angora hair in rabbits and guinea pigs. Kinky hair and straight hair in men. Crest and no crest in poultry. Bandless shell in the wood snail and banded shell. Yellow cotyledons in peas and green ones. Round seeds in peas and wrinkled forms. Absence of awn in wheat and its presence. Susceptibility to rust in wheat 
and immunity to this disease. Two road ears of barley and six road ears. Markedly toothed margin in nettle leaves and a slightly toothed margin. Why one character should be dominant and another recessive is not known. A positive feature, like a banded shell in the snail, may be recessive, and a negative feature, like hornlessness in cattle, may be dominant. It should be noted that in many cases of Mendelian inheritance, the dominance in the offspring is not complete. Thus, if black Andalusian fowls are crossed with white ones, the progeny are blue Andalusians, a sort of diluted black. These blue Andalusians do not breed true. When paired together, they yield 50% blues, 25% blacks, and 25% peculiar whites splashed with gray. The third fundamental idea in Mendelism is perhaps more difficult to grasp than the others. Mendel supposed that the hybrid between the tall P and the dwarf P produced two kinds of germ cells in approximately equal numbers, one contingent carrying the factor for tallness and the other contingent carrying the factor for dwarfness. In other words, each germ cell is pure with respect to the factor of any particular unit character. Suppose a long-haired rabbit crossed by a short-haired rabbit. The offspring will all be short-haired. But out of eight ova produced by a female hybrid offspring, four will have the factor for long hair and four the factor for short hair. Similarly, out of eight sperm cells produced by a male hybrid offspring, four will have the factor for long hair and four the factor for short hair. Suppose these hybrids interbreed, and the fertilization of the ova by the spermatozoa is fortuitous. Then, two egg cells with the short hair factor will be fertilized by two sperm cells with the short hair factor yielding two quite pure, short-haired offspring. Two egg cells with the long hair factor will be fertilized by two sperm cells with the long hair factor, yielding two quite pure, long-haired offspring. Two egg cells with the short hair factor will be fertilized by two sperm cells with the long hair factor, yielding two impure, short-haired offspring like the hybrid parents. And finally, two egg cells with the long hair factor will be fertilized by two sperm cells with the short hair factor, yielding the other two impure short-haired offspring like the hybrid parents. So the result must be two pure short-haired offspring plus four impure short-haired offspring plus two pure long-haired offspring. If the impure short-haired rabbits are interbred, their offspring, the third filial generation, will show the same ratio, one to two to one, more and more exactly the larger the numbers dealt with. Germinal Continuity One of the great post-Darwinian advances is the recognition of the fact of germinal continuity, made clear by Galton and Feisman. While most of the material of the fertilized ovum is used to build up the body of the offspring, undergoing in a very puzzling way differentiation into nerve and muscle, blood and bone, a residue is kept intact and unspecialized to form the beginning of the reproductive organs of the offspring, whence will be launched in due course another organism on a similar voyage of life. The reproductive cells of any organism are the outcome of embryonic cells which did not share in the upbuilding of that organism, but continued in the germinal tradition unaltered. This is suggested clearly in a diagram slightly modified from one devised by Professor E. B. Wilson. Thus the parent is rather the trustee of the germplasm than the producer of the child. In a sense, the child is a chip of the old block. The old question was, does the hen make the egg or the egg the hen? The modern answer is that the fertilized egg makes the hen and the eggs thereof. The fact of germinal continuity explains the inertia of the main mass of the inheritance, which is carried on with little change from generation to generation, similar material to start with, Similar conditions in which should develop, therefore, like tends to beget like. As Professor Berkson puts it, life is like a current passing from germ to germ through the medium of a developed organism. As regards selection. When we are interpreting the past history of animals, we utilize factors which are seen in operation today, just as the geologist does when he is interpreting scenery. It is satisfactory, therefore, that post-Darwinian investigations have demonstrated some modern instances of selection at work. Let us take a simple case. 
the Italian naturalist Cisnola tethered some green mantises with silk thread on green herbage, and found that they escaped the eyes of birds. Similarly, when the brown variety was tethered on withered herbage, but green mantises on brown herbage and brown mantises on green herbage were soon picked off. Discriminate selection was at work. When we are concerned with making a good lawn, we may pursue two methods. We may eliminate the weeds, or we may foster by suitable tonics the growth of the grass. Similarly, in nature sifting, there is lethal selection, which works by eliminating the relatively less fit to given conditions of life, and there is reproductive selection, which works through the predominant increase of the more successful. Darwin never thought simply of natural selection. He always emphasized its manifold and subtle modes of operation. He saw, for instance, what some of his successors missed, that the sifting need not in the least involve a sudden cutting off of the relatively less fit, for a shortened life and a less successful family will in the long run bring about the same result as a drastic pruning. It should not be necessary to point out that the survival of the fittest does not necessarily mean the survival of the strongest or cleverest or best. It simply means fittest, relatively to particular conditions. The tapeworm is a fit survivor, as well as the golden eagle. Darwin realized what some of his successors have missed, that even slight peculiarities may be of critical moment when tested in relation to the complex web of life in which the creature has its being. This is very important in regard to the general progressiveness of evolution, that new departures are sifted in reference to a slowly wrought out and firmly established system of interrelations. See the article on interrelations. Sexual Selection Many male animals, such as stags, antelopes, sea lions, black cock, and spiders, fight with one another at the mating time, competing for the possession of females. According to Darwin, the strongest and, with some species, the best armed of the males drive away the weaker, and the former would then unite with the more vigorous and better nourished females, because they are the first to breed. Such vigorous pairs would surely rear a larger number of offspring than the retarded females, which would be compelled to unite with the conquered and less powerful males, supposing the sexes to be numerically equal. And this is all that is wanted to add, in the course of successive generations, to the size, strength, and courage of the males, or to improve their weapons. Descent of Man, 2nd edition, page 329. Similarly, there would be a premium on those male characters that are useful in the recognition and capture of the females. For example, large olfactory feelers in moths and strong claspers in skates. The term sexual selection was used by Darwin to include all forms of sifting in connection with mating, but prominent among these was the preferential behavior of the female. Just as man can give beauty, according to his standard of taste, to his male poultry, so it appears that female birds in a state of nature have, by a long selection of the more attractive males, added to their beauty or other attractive qualities. In the courtship, which is often elaborate, the female selects in a literal sense. Darwin was well aware of difficulties besetting his theory of sexual selection, and his fellow worker Alfred Russell Wallace was one of his severest critics. There has to be proof that some of the males are actually disqualified and left out in the cold. But Darwin indicated that the sifting would work even if the less successful males were not entirely eliminated. Moreover, in some cases the female's preference goes to great lengths. Thus a female spider often kills a suitor who does not please her. It is difficult again to prove actual choice on the female's part, but there are undoubted cases of preferential mating, whatever the psychology of the process may be. Some critics, like Wallace, have pointed to the difficulty of crediting the female with a capacity for appreciating slight differences in the decorativeness, agility, or musical talent of her suitors. But the modern answer is simply that the accepted mate is the one that most strongly evokes the pairing instinct, and that it is not necessary to credit the female with any analytic weighing of the merits of the various males. The details must count if there is anything in the theory, but they may count not as such, but as contributing to a general impression of interesting attractiveness. To point out that certain masculine features, such as antlers, are congruent with the male constitution, 
just as certain feminine features, such as functional milk glands, are congruent with the female constitution, is getting behind the question of selection, to that of the origin of the variations which form the raw materials of the sifting process, an interesting line of inquiry which has been followed by Geddes and Thompson in their evolution of sex. Another important consideration arises when we think of the frequent intricacy and subtlety of the courtship habits, see Pycraft's Courtship of Animals. There must be some deep racial justification for this. Gruss has suggested that the female's coyness is an important check to the male's passion, which tends to be too violent. Julian Huxley has suggested from his fine study of the crested grebe that the courtship ceremonies establish emotional bonds which keep the two birds of a pair together and constant to each other. Conclusions 1. If Darwinism means the general idea of evolution or transformism, that higher forms are descended from lower, then it stands today more firmly than ever. 2. If Darwinism means the particular statement of the factors in evolution, which is expounded in the origin of species, the descent of man, and the variation of animals and plants under domestication, then it must be said that while the main ideas remain valid, there has been development all along the line. Darwinism has evolved, as every sound theory should. 3. In regard to the raw materials of evolution, there is greater clearness than in Darwin's time as to the contrast between intrinsic variations of germinal origin and bodily modifications imprinted from without, and there are grave reasons for doubting whether the latter do as such affect the race at all. There is still to be heard the slogan, Back to Lamarck, but there can be no return to any crude Lamarckism. If the individual gains and loses, the individual indents and prunings really count as such in racial evolution. It must be in some subtler way than is suggested by the giraffe getting its long neck by ages of stretching, or the deep-sea fish becoming blind by generations of darkness and disuse. There should be no haste to close any door of reasonable interpretation, still less of experimental inquiry, but there is at present among zoologists widespread agreement with Sir Ray Lancaster's pronouncement that one of the notable advances since Darwin's day has been getting rid of the Lamarckian theory of the transmission of individually acquired characters or imprinted bodily modifications. Of course, counting of heads is no argument, but the facts are not at present in favor of the Lamarckian view. But we may perhaps look for an evolution of Lamarckism as well as of Darwinism. 4. Darwin based his theory of evolution very deliberately on the fluctuating variations which are always occurring. Given time enough and a constant sieve, the struggle for existence, will not nature achieve more or less automatically what man reaches purposely in his breeding of cattle and cultivating of wheat? But modern Darwinism, while holding fast to this, welcomes the demonstration that brusque discontinuous variations or mutations are common and that they are very heritable. All of a sudden, it appears, the sporting evening primrose may produce an offspring which is potentially a new species. 5. Darwin meant by fortuitous variations that he could not give any formula for the causes of the novelties he observed. No doubt he also meant that the organism in varying was not aiming at anything. And yet he laid great stress on what he called the principle of correlated variability, an idea of great importance that when one part varies, other parts vary with it, being members one of another, as St. Paul said. In other words, a particular germinal change may have a number of different outcrops or expressions, but the more correlation there is, the less reasonable will it be to speak of fortuitousness, and one of the changes since Darwin's day is the recognition that variations are often very definite, just as they are among crystals. 6. Another change from Darwin is the Mendelian idea of unit characters, which behave like entities in inheritance. They are handed on with a strong measure of intactness to a certain proportion of the offspring. Their factors in the germ cells are either there or not there. Sometimes, at least, these unit characters arise as mutations, and thus we have an answer to Darwin's difficulty that abrupt changes would be averaged off in intercrossing. Unit characters do not blend. 7. Since Darwin's day there has been, in a few cases, definite proof of natural selection at work. 
the different forms of selection have been more clearly disentangled. The subtlety of Darwin's idea of selection has been confirmed. The reality and the efficacy of preferential mating has been much criticized. But Darwin's theory of sexual selection has in its essentials weathered the storm. In proportion, as new departures come about suddenly by brusque mutation, the burden to be laid on the shoulders of selection will be lessened. In so far as the selection is in relation to a previously established system of interrelations, there will be a reduction of the fortuitous in the process, and the same will be true in proportion to the degree in which the organism takes an active share in its own evolution, as it often does. 8. Modern biologists are inclined to put more emphasis on isolation than Darwin did, meaning by isolation all the ways in which the range of intercrossing is restricted and close inbreeding brought about. When we use the term Darwinism to mean, not his very words, but the living doctrine legitimately developed from his central ideas of variation, selection, and heredity, we may say that Darwinism stands today more firmly than ever. It has changed and is changing, but it is not crumbling away. It is evolving progressively. This is only an outline of a great subject, and it is not an article that he who runs can read. It is very important to avoid dogmatism in regard to an inquiry which is still relatively young. There is not much scientific evolutionism before Darwin's day. The writer has not concealed his opinion in regard to such a question as the transmission of acquired characters, but it is not suggested that this is the only possible opinion. It may be recommended that readers to whom the subject is comparatively new, and to whom it appears full of uncertainties, should write out their ideas in a definite way, and then compare them carefully with the relevant paragraphs in the article. It is all too easy to go off on a wrong tack, and this should be guarded against by patient study, for the problems of evolution are fundamental. End of section 8「Section 9 of the Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Goldie. The Outline of Science, Volume 2. By J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 12. Natural History. Birds. Part 1. Birds. In previous chapters of this book, we have discussed the evolution of animals in general, the inclined plane of behavior, and the everyday life of the body, and it has been necessary to make many references to birds. But there are good reasons for devoting a special chapter to this great class. Birds have entered closely into human life, and in manifold ways. They supply food, and they are the poet's symbols. Their feathers keep us warm at night, and the wing, the arrow, of the bowman. Birds save the world from the continual menace of prolific insects, and they give the priests a basis for their auguries. To birds we must trace the enormous nitrate beds of Chile, which have fertilized the soil of half the world, and we may thank them, too, for a share in the impulse Velt has led man to his mastery of the air. Moreover, most birds are joys forever. Biologically regarded, birds are of supreme interest in their solution of the problem of flight, so different from that of insects, pterodactyls, and bats, in their variability and plasticity within a comparatively narrow range, and in their fascinating behavior with its remarkable blending of instinctive and intelligent activities. Millions of years ago, the evolution of birds from reptilian stock began, as has been already described in an early chapter of this work. At first sight, it is not easy to see any resemblance between birds and reptiles. The one group warm-blooded, conspicuously active and gloriously beautiful, the other cold-blooded, often sluggish, but perhaps also beautiful in their way. What kinship can there be between the falcon in the sky and the lizard on the wall? The students of comparative anatomy answers that the evidence of similarity are overwhelming. 
bone by bone the two creatures are built up on a plan that is certainly to a very great extent the same however much the final products may be modified and adopted without much preliminary study of anatomical structure these points might be difficult to apprehend and appreciate and we cannot discuss them here we must accept the verdict of the experts and admit that birds are the descendants of a reptilian stock not necessarily of any present-day group of reptiles but rather of a common ancestor in the immensely remote past just one simple point of similarity between the two groups may be mentioned the fact that both lay eggs and eggs which are indeed closely alike in several respects the dawn of bird life we may imagine the ancestral forms as small lizard-like animals making the first beginnings of the kind of life which we see to great perfection in the birds of today. Real power of flight would be at first be absent among these early ancestors, but we may think of it as foreshadowed by a great power of leaping from branch to branch in the trees of the primeval forest where these far-off ancestors of our birds had taken refuge from their terrestrial enemies. We may picture them as making the most of their arboreal hunt, probably using holes in the tree trunks in which to hide and to lay their eggs, and gradually developing a greater and greater agility and moving about above ground in search of food and in escape from such enemies as were still able to molest them. This mode of life would tend generation after generation to produce strong propelling hind limbs together with fore limbs armed with hook-like claws useful for taking hold at the end of each jump and for more leisurely clamoring at other times. The crucial step in the evolution of the true bird stock, however, must have been the acquisition of powers of real flight. At an early stage, the forelimbs would be held out sideways during each leap, and later the surface area would become enlarged by the development of a fold of skin between each of these limbs and the body. Later yet, this fold would become still more important, and its area would be still further increased by the transformation of its covering scales into some primitive form of feather. Longer and longer leaps would become possible, from branch to branch and from tree to tree, as these aids to gliding flight improved. Finally, the last great step would be taken when a beginning was made of the active use of the primitive wings to prolong still further until the last indefinitely, the distances possibly by leaping and gliding alone. It is a curious history, this tale of the origin of birds. In the first place, we seem to see the earliest ancestors as a feeble reptilian race driven from the ground and taking refuge among the branches. There followed ages of arboreal life during which the great adaptation of flight originated and was made perfect. Then came a day when the new race of birds fortified with a great advantage of mastery of the air spread abroad from the forests to reconquer the ground level, to find their bread upon the waters, to cross the seas to distant isles, and to defy the rigors of climate by their ability to change their season in a night. So today we have birds propelling the whole earth and filling every land with this abundant beauty of their plumage and their song and with the immense wonder of their eager spirited lives. Flightless birds. It is a strange side issue too to find that the priceless gift of flight has not always been preserved over and over again since the reconquest of the ground level, there have been birds which have discarded the faculty which was the making of their race. Over and over again also they have paid the extreme penalty, sometimes size and strength, sometimes an aquatic life, sometimes an island home, has been the factor giving security in place of flights. But with new conditions, the exchange has frequently proved to be unfortunate, too often in recent cases the new condition has been the advent of modern man and his civilization. Several flightless species are indeed numbered among the birds which have become extinct within historic times. Among the Maoris of New Zealand there was a traditional knowledge of a giant running bird which they called Moa, 
but which they had exterminated before the arrival of white men. From the bones and other remains, which have been found in some quantity, the birds appear to have been large members of the ostrich tribe, one species standing twelve feet in height. A related bird of similar history was the Pyomis of Madagascar, which forms the subject of the delightfully imaginative story by Mr. H. G. Wells. This bird is sometimes identified with the legendary rock of the Arabian Nights. Not only its remains, but also its eggs have been found, and an egg in the British Museum, Natural History, measures more than 13 inches in length and 9.5 inches in breadth. The Dodo Extinct as the dodo has become a proverbial expression. The saying refers to a bird allied to the pigeons about the size of a swan and of clumsy and uncouth appearance. It was quite flightless and lived in security in Mauritius until the island was visited by Dutch sailors in the 16th century. The hogs which these men brought with them were largely responsible for the subsequent rapid extermination of the birds, and now the dodo is known only from some remains in museums and from the quaint drawings and descriptions of the early voyagers. The Ostrich Tribe among the birds of the present day, the ostrich tribe and the penguins are the principal examples of flightlessness. The ostrich and its kin are for most part birds of large size, possessing a soft hair-like plumage, diminutive wings, and strong legs. They are capable of running at great speed across open country, and also of kicking with suddenness and force. Their breastbones lacked the pronounced keel, which is so noticeable in most birds, and which serves for the attachment of the great muscles for working the wings in flight. Best known, of course, is the African ostrich now being domesticated by man for the sake of its plumes. But there are also several kinds of American ostriches or rheas in South America, and of cassowaries and emus in Australasia. Unlike their fellows are the kiwis of New Zealand, birds of no great size, timid and nocturnal in habit. Their long beaks and their hair-like plumage combine to give an exceedingly quaint appearance, and there are no visible wings. Penguins. The penguins are rather a different case, for their wings have by no means fallen into disuse. They have become instead adapted for swimming. There are many different kinds, but all belong to the southern hemisphere, and most of them to the far south. Many Antarctic explorers have brought back tales of their lives, but it is to Dr. Murray Levick, who was with Terra Nova in 1910, that we owe one of the best accounts relating particularly to the Adelie penguin. These flightless birds will return over hundreds of miles of trackless sea to the same rookeries year after year to breed. Dr. Levick describes how the first penguin arrived at the rookery at Cape Adare toward the middle of October, the southern spring, and how four days later the birds were coming in across the still unbroken sea ice in such numbers that they formed a line stretching northward as far as the eye could see. Within a month, the colony was some three-quarters of a million strong. The Adelie penguin builds a large nest of stones, the only material available, and the uses of this are evident when the thaw comes and the ground is covered with water and slush. In this nest, two large eggs are laid, and one of the parents goes off to the sea to feed while the other remains to incubate. The bird which leaves may be away for a week or ten days, and the other may therefore not break its fast for as much as four weeks in all. I know of no other creature, says Mr. Herbert G. Pooting, from which man may learn a finer lesson of how resolution and steadfastness may overcome every difficulty than from the Adelie penguin. Their bravery is amazing. No blizzard, however violent, will drive these birds from their nests in the wild Antarctic regions. Mr. Pooting relates that they are found sitting on their nests buried deep in the snow, wondering where the birds had disappeared to after a blizzard he set out to investigate. As I was struggling about, wondering whether my penguin investigation has come to an abrupt end, I was almost scared out of my life by a muffled squawk and felt something wiggling under my foot. I had stepped on the back of a sitting penguin buried nearly two feet deep in the snow. As the victim struggled out, loudly protesting its wrath at this outrage, we were convulsed with laughter, then roused by our noisy mirth. Scores of black heads with guang eyes suddenly protruded from the snow to see what all the fuss was about. That is how we discovered them. They had not deserted the place, 
but were attending to their domestic duties under the snow patiently waiting for it to blow away there were penguins everywhere it was impossible to walk without stepping on them the penguins are fond of all manner of amusements leaving their young under the protection of a few of the old birds most of the parents go off to disport themselves on the ice or in the water they will string out behind a leader and make for the near ice floes the party sometimes purposing along the way then tobogganing over the ice they followed in a line behind the leader doing exactly as he did the fun became fast and furious and i suppose they got a bit winded for after a while the courier gave them a rest following his lead they sprang on to an ice raft then still imitating his example they settled down on their breasts and basks a while in the sunshine prior to doing a few more laps that they all thoroughly enjoyed the game there could be no possible doubt the emperor penguin is the largest species and may stand over four feet high unlike the adelie its nest or rather lays its single egg on the sea ice itself and it is remarkable for breeding in midwinter incubation lasts for as much as six or seven weeks but the task is shared not only by both parents but by the strangely large number of barren birds living in the colony the chick has the rather doubtful advantage of a number of foster parents all desirous of participating in its care a strange condition of things which was well described by dr a e wilson who afterwards shared scott's tragic fate on the return journey from the pole what we actually saw again and again was the wild dash made by a dozen adults each weighing anything up to ninety pounds to take possession of any chicken that happened to find itself deserted on the ice it can be compared to nothing better than a football scrimmage in which the first bird to seize the chick is hustled and worried on all sides while it rapidly tries to push the infant between its legs with the help of its pointed beak shrugging up the loosened skin of the abdomen the while to cover it that no great care is taken to save the chick from injury is obvious from the examination of the dead ones lying on the ice all had rents and claw marks in the skin and we saw this not only in the dead but the living the chicks are fully alive to the inconvenience of being fought for by so many clumsy nurses and i have seen them not only make the best use of their legs in avoiding such attentions but remain to starve and freeze in preference to being nursed undoubtedly i think that of the seventy seven per cent that die before they shed their down quite half are killed by kindness flying birds with this strange and rather terrible picture of the early life of the emperor penguin amid the rigours of the antarctic climate and on the naked ice of the frozen sea we may turn from flightless to flying birds the flightless birds indeed represent digressions from the main line of descent and cannot be regarded as stages in the evolution of modern flying birds from the ancient forms which first mastered flight in the forest of long ago birds share with mammals the distinction of being warm-blooded that is to say having a high and constant body temperature independent of surrounding conditions we may take this as an index of a high degree of vitality and of an advanced position in the evolutionary scale and we shall indeed find many other features which lead toward the same conclusion birds are noteworthy for alertness of mind and body for quickness of movement and for their mastery of the air they have highly developed habits and complex instincts they are in turn combative amatory parental cunning in pursuit and escape and in very many cases there is a surpassing beauty of plumage and voice which compels our intense admiration least is one of these words of variable and confused sense which drive men of science to use a language of their own but the term bird scarcely needs to be defined for its everyday meaning is also scientifically accurate this fact may perhaps be attributed to the existence of certain very distinctive characteristics common to all birds and to a large measure of uniformity in general appearance among the nearly twenty thousand different species which are known to science there are it is true wide differences in size in coloration and in manner of life but there are no gross divergences in form comparable to those found for instance among mammals between the tiger and the goat the kangaroo and the elephant or the bat and the whale
This distinctiveness and this uniformity may both be accommodated for in one word flight. The whole body of the bird is adapted to this habit of flying. The bird's skeleton is a wonderful study from this point of view, but here it, but here it will suffice to mention the external features. Flight has brought with it feathers, and these are a unique feature. All birds have feathers, and nothing that is not a bird possesses any trace of them. Furthermore, the function of flight has secured a virtual monopoly over the four limbs, and it has thus brought two other striking adaptations in its train. A bird is of necessity a biped, walking on its two hind limbs, and its mouth has had to take the place of a hand, thus leading to the evolution of a long flexible neck, and of a hard beak, which is often wonderfully adapted to the feeding habits of the particular species. The Flight of Birds Birds are, of course, true, heavier than air machines, and in former days man used to strive to learn their secret for the purposes of the flying machines which his heart desired. But within the last few years the main physical principles of the airplane have become so familiar that we may perhaps reverse the process by using them in the description of our present problem. Just as gliders preceded airplanes, so gliding flight may, as we have seen, have been the beginning of the mastery of the air in the case of birds. And it is in gliding that the artificial machine and the bird are most alike. In both cases, advantage is taken of the resistance of the air and of the consequent upward tendency imparted to a body moving horizontally and having a flat inclined in their surface. When we come to active flight, a difference is at once obvious. The airplane propellers supply a motive force independently of the plane, while in the birds the wings are both propellers and planes at the same time. There is indeed a further difference in that the airplane's propellers during level flight at least exert force purely in a horizontal direction, the lifting force being wholly due as in gliding to air resistance. In the bird, the wing strokes themselves supply part of the lifting power, as well as propelling the body forwards. Nor must we forget the bird's tail, which plays a part in steering and balancing, as in the case of the airplane rudder. It is also often used as a brake, without which many a swiftly pouncing bird of prey would be apt to dash itself to destruction on the ground. Some of the larger birds are adept at soaring and can remain in the air for a long time with motionless wings, and can even rise in slow spiral ascent to a great height. The late Mr. F. W. Headley, a keen and exact student of the flight of birds, came to the conclusion that this feat was inexplicable, except on the supposition that the advantage was taken of up currents in the air, the bird's actual motion being merely a gliding one. He pointed out that gulls are adepts at this when flying above the edge of a cliff, but that they cannot do it at sea, whereas aviators and air travelers know there are not the vertical disturbances caused by the varying ground level temperature and by the changing elevation of dry land. Another feat, namely hovering, is familiar in the hunting method of the kestrel, which maintains a stationary position for an appreciable time. Against a strong wind, it would be easy to maintain a ground speed of nil, and it would be possible even with motionless wings. In still air, however, the ordinary gliding basis of flight is in abeyance, and altitude must be maintained by sheer vertical force of wing stroke the bird being thus more nearly equivalent to a helicopter than to an airplane. Speed and altitude. The aviators of today compete to establish records for speed, for endurance, and for altitude. How do birds stand in these respects? As regards to speed, in the first place, one must remember the difference between ground speed and air speed. Both the airplane and the bird can, for a certain expenditure of power, attain a certain velocity in the body of air in which they are, but the velocity as measured from the ground may be a very different thing. Thus an airplane travelling at a hundred miles per hour in a twenty mile per hour wind may seem from ground to be going at a hundred and twenty miles or at eighty miles per hour accordingly as it flies with or against the air stream. 
So, also, of course, with the bird. All our speed records of birds, except a few made from airplanes, are necessarily in terms of ground speed, and in many cases the particulars necessary for a wind correction are unhappily wanting. What are some of the actual figures? The available evidence has recently been summarized by Colonel Meinzargen, with special reference to speed during migration. He concludes that a bird has an ordinary pace, which is the one used in migratory flight, and an accelerated pace of which it is capable for a short distance under stress of danger or in other special circumstances. Here are some of his figures. Carrier pigeons, 30 to 36 miles per hour, over 60 have been recorded, but possibly only with a strong favorable wind. Crows, 31 to 45. Small songbirds, 20 to 37. Starlings, 38 to 49. Ducks, 44 to 59. He also quotes the case of a flock of swifts flying at 6,000 feet above Mosul in Mesopotamia, which in their ordinary flight easily outpaced the observer's airplane when it was doing 68 miles per hour. The airspeed of this astonishing flyer is, when accelerated, probably well over a hundred miles an hour. As regards altitude, it seems that all the birds have occasionally been recorded as high as 15,000 feet. They are indeed rarely met with above 5,000 feet, while the greater part of flight, including migration, probably takes place within 3,000 feet of the ground. The power of flight has given birds the key to one kind of habitat after another that might otherwise have proved to be too dangerous or too inhospitable. To the conditions of these different haunts, and in particular to different modes of procuring food, we see a great wealth of adaptation. There are hunters and fishers, catchers of insects and harvesters of seeds, eaters of crustaceans and eaters of worm plant eaters and honeysuckers, scavengers of carrion, and many a picker-up of inconsidered trifles. End of section 9. Birds. Section 10 of the Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Goldie. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 12. Birds, Part 2. The Hunting of the Peregrine. Pride of place may be given to the hunters, and as a type of them to the peregrine falcon, described by the late Professor Alfred Newton as the most powerful bird for its bulk that flies. It is a strong, fierce bird, with long pointed wings, spending no time on its comings and goings, and dealing death in mid-air with relentless talons. In spite of game preserving, it still maintains its place as one of the most splendid of native British birds. Its prey consists mainly of other birds, and these it attacks in flight, stooping away from above, and killing not by force of impact, but by the sheer grip of its claws. Having arrived within a few feet of its prey, wrote Audubon, of the almost identical duck-hawk of America, the falcon is seen protruding his powerful legs and talons to their full stretch. His wings are for a moment almost closed. The next instant he grapples to the prize, which, if too weighty to be carried off, he forces obliquely to the ground, sometimes a hundred yards from where it was seized, to kill it and devour it on the spot. Should this happen over a large extent of water, the falcon drops his prey and sets off in quest of another. On the contrary, should it not prove too heavy, the exulting bird carries it off to a sequestered and secure place. A peregrine can indeed carry a weight almost equal to its own, and a pair nesting on the bass rock in the Firth of Forth have been known to bring grouse and pheasants from the mainland across two or three miles of sea. The peregrine falcon belongs to the aristocracy of the bird world. It has a haughty stare, a regal dignity, is absolutely fearless, and has great reserve power, and, as Mr. Hudson says, possesses a courage commensurate with its strength, 
and in hunting an infallible judgment. It is one of the most perfect of wind's creatures, so well balanced in all parts, so admirably adapted for speed, strength, and endurance. The lordly falcon is the terror of the skies. Sooner or later, the day always comes in early autumn to birdland, when the peewits feeding in silent battalions together, and the gulls watching impatiently to rob the peewits of their worms, suddenly arise and wheel in wild disorder to the horizon, when the clustered partridge conveys crouch like clods to the earth, and the flocks of small birds feeding in the open fling themselves like a shower of stones into the nearest hedge when the blackbird issuing from cover turns before he has flown a yard and darts back again with a chatter of alarm when save for the distant cawing of rooks perched on lookout trees a parish apart sudden perfect stillness holds the landscape then the peregrine falcon passes smiting her way from horizon to horizon and spreading terror as she goes who gave the first warning of her coming it is hard to tell possibly it was a rook but the marvel is that the majority of the birds being young ones of the year can never have seen a falcon before yet they fling themselves wildly to right and to left long before to speck in the far skies reveals itself to humans as a bird of prey the golden eagle is the largest of our native birds of prey the well-known lines of Tennyson spring to mind. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands. Ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt he falls. The golden eagle looks well after its young, feeding them at dawn and dusk each day. The grouse that are brought to the eaglet are plucked and headless. The hares and rabbits are skinned and made ready in a larder distant from the nest. The youngsters get only digestible food, being unable for some weeks to form pellets. The eaglets are taught how to hunt and how to kill, as well as how to carry and skin their prey. When they are about five months old, they are driven away. The fishing of the cormorant very different from the habits of these birds of prey is the underwater hunting of the cormorant a bird of much less noble habits and aspects which is notable for clumsiness in the air and for uncouth appearance on land as well as for the foul stenches of its untidy nest under the water however it is the thing of beauty so perfectly adapted is it to the swift and dexterous pursuit of its active prey. In a tank with glass slides, we may see this to great advantage and note how the wings are kept close to the body, not used for swimming, as in the case of penguins and auks, and how the air bubbles cling to the feathers like bright jewels or polished silver. We can see, too, how the strong hooked beak is used to seize the fish, which is then borne to the surface to be tossed in the air, recaught and swallowed, for the cormorant does not swallow under water like a penguin. The Chinese train cormorants to catch fish from the market, a collar round the neck, preventing the birds from swallowing their prizes. The same thing was done in Britain at one time, although only for sport. Different Fishing Methods it is interesting to compare the different methods of fishing adopted by two of the cormorant's relatives, the gannet and the pelican, and the different forms of beak which go with each. The gannet, or so-called solen goose, nests in great colonies on several of the rocky islets around the British coast, and it may also be seen at most tunes off many parts which are far from these breeding stations. It is a bird of fine white plumage and noble flight, which soaring at a height and then suddenly dropping like a plummet uses its long straight beak to transfix fish swimming near the surface. The pelican, again, is a fisher of the shallows, which wades through the water with its enormous gape at full extent and the great pouch below its beak ready to receive what comes. A party may work in concert, sweeping the pool in a long line like a living seine net. 
the cormorant pursues twists turns and seizes the gannet soars plunges and spears the pelican sweeps and engulfs the wisdom of the raven we may refer here to the raven like some of the larger birds of prey the raven takes a wife for life and they use the same nest year after year as an inland bird the raven is now not so frequently met with for it has been driven by persecution from many of its former mountain hunts luckily it is one of the hardiest of birds and can adapt itself to the great extremes of temperature the raven the biggest of our crows is the brainiest of all our birds his family are the great legal fraternity among birds nimbleness of wit mingled with audacity characterize them all so that the very first time that i observed the hoodie crow at home i was struck with his laughable resemblance to a barrister in a wig and gown there was the same keen eye for the shortcomings of others and the general look of mental superiority to ordinary folk the raven has the reputation of being one of the longest-lived birds it enjoys a reputation also for mimicry if you climb to its roosting place on some mountain precipice you may hear in the silence of the hills how the ravens croon themselves to sleep uttering reminiscence of the sounds they have been listening to throughout the day mr f b kirkman in the british bird book writes from the growing congregation to the ridge there descended through the thickening dust the strangest of even songs a weird wild medley of many sounds the barking of dogs the bleating of goats the lowing of cows the becking of grouse calling across the moorland and now and then the deep belling challenge of the stag their intelligence is almost uncanny and when we think that they are of savage character and have a deep harsh human like voice we can imagine some explanation of the evil reputation of the bird and the sombre superstitions associated with it social life it has to be confessed that we have a great deal to learn about the inner life of birds it is difficult to get mentally in touch with them they have evolved on a different plane from our own our sense of kinship with animals is still something novel but it is ever widening and deepening as we view it more closely with a clearer vision may we not claim this as one of the steps in the progress of evolution with birds as with mammals there are many phases of social life some species of birds are more social in their relationship than others in some there is a more advanced state of community than others with individuals there may exist mutual friendship companionship between two birds of the same species or even between birds of different species is often seen the helping instinct is characteristic in birds as in other animals it is often touchingly human-like we see it most often in parental care and in the feeding of each other by the sexes but it is shown frequently in other ways mr w h hudson speaking of the military starling of the pampas a bird of social disposition tells this story one day i was sitting on my horse watching a flock feeding and travelling in their leisurely manner when i noticed a little distance behind the others a bird sitting motionless on the ground and two others keeping close to it one on each side these two had finished examining the ground and prodding at the roots of the grass at the spot and were now anxious to go forward and rejoin the company but were held back by the other one on my going to them they all flew up and on and i then saw that the one that had hung back had a broken leg perhaps it had not been long broken and he had not yet accommodated himself to the changed conditions in which he had to get about on the ground and find his food i followed and found that again and again after the entire scarlet-breasted army had moved on the lame bird remained behind his two impatient but faithful companions still keeping with him they would not fly until he flew and when on the wing still kept their places on his side and in overtaking the flock all three would drop down together as mr hudson says it is possible to mistake for friendship an action which at all events in its origin is of a different nature 
instances of such altruistic behavior to be attributed to the helping instinct of animals of social habits are common mr frank finn relates that the upper bill of a huia an insectivorous birds of new zealand by some accident or natural deformity has grown into the shape of a corkscrew and it was not apparent how it could get enough food to support life naturally it seems it had been fed for some time by a devoted mate the social habit the development of a social habit at the breeding season is a well-marked characteristic of many kinds of birds and it is by no means confined to those which are gregarious at other times conversely it is also true that some birds which at other seasons band together are among the least social at this special time more than one factor is probably involved the scarcity of suitable sites for marsh fowl for example may be a reason for concentration in special spots and strength of defense against enemies may often be an advantage gained in other cases the problem of food supply will tend to produce distribution rather than concentration and this is especially the case with many of the smaller species of our common birds among warblers for example there is a marked tendency for a pair to select a small territory within which they will remain and from which they will endeavor to exclude all other members of their own species and even in due course their own young many birds like human beings would seem to enjoy the company of their kind the gregarious habit is common for example among rooks starlings pigeons swallows parrots roam in bands apparently for the pleasure of one another's company we may have crowds and associations however without sociability a community of separate individuals may exist without there being any corporate life or power of acting as a unity still we do see many instances of a capacity for unified action and distinct features of a social life there appears to be an intellectual advantage in sociability if we may argue from the fact that many social animals show a high development of wits the three cleverest kinds of birds are rooks cranes and parrots and they are notably social there is of course the danger of putting the cart before the horse for it may be that the sociability is in part the expression of good brains it may also be argued that the non gregarious crow is just as clever as the social rook many analogous instances may be given the rook is the best example of our gregarious birds there is no doubt that the members of the crow family have fine brains and great power of vocalization which may develop to a remarkable extent experts tell us that the rook has a command of between thirty and forty notes to learn to what extent they employ them one has to only listen to the black republic in the elms after the breeding season is over professor j arthur thompson in secrets of animal life says like many creatures well endowed with brains rooks exhibit what must be called play there are gambles and sham fights frolics and wild chases in which curiously enough jackdaws and lapwings sometimes become keenly interested but who knows the real truth about the rooks posing sentinels which is so often alleged who knows the significance of the vast congregations that are sometimes seen and who can tell us if there is any truth at all in the alleged trials of individuals who have defied the conventions of the community but the central interest is in the rooks reaching forward to a communal life with certain conventions and to the crowded nest in which we see the beginning of a continuous social heritage of objectively and registered traditions there may be far over a thousand nests in a rookery and the same site may be used for more than a century rooks certainly have a considerable vocabulary there is not indeed any language in the strict sense man has a monopoly of that but the rooks have words just as dogs have definite uttered sounds which have definite meanings we hear the rooks use certain words when we move suddenly beneath the trees and other words are uttered when a bird intrudes on its neighbor there is a word for when the rook sinks down upon the nest and another word when it flies clear of the rookery and makes for the fields what danger signals what scoldings what chucklings what exultation what reproaches 
What encouragement do we not hear? Mutual protection. Mr. W. P. Pycraft, in his History of Birds, says, Among gregarious species, some display a much more intimate association than others, are more social in their relationships. And this is shown very clearly in the devices which some species have adopted for their mutual protection during sleep. The common partridge, as is well known, lives in a small companies or coves, which scatter only while feeding, and then not far enough to be beyond call. Later in the day, as soon as the beetles begin to buzz, says Professor Newton, the whole move away together to some spot where they jug, as it is called, that is squat and nestle close together for the night, and from the appearance of the mutings or droppings, which are generally deposited in a circle of only a few inches in diameter, it would appear that the birds arrange themselves also in a circle, of which their tails from the center, all the heads being outward, a disposition which instinct has suggested as the best for observing the approach of any of their numerous enemies, whatever may be the direction, and thus increases their security by enabling them to avoid a surprise. Ducks similarly take special precautions to secure safety during sleep, when this must be taken in exposed situations, as when, for example, they desire to doze between the intervals of feeding during the night, which they pass afloat. At such times they keep close together, and to avoid drifting ashore, keep one leg slowly paddling, and thus drive themselves round in circles. There is sometimes cooperation in hunting, as we have already noted in the case of pelicans, which combine in a crescent and wading shorewards, drive the fish before them. When they have got them cornered, they fill their huge throat pouches. It is said that a pair of golden eagles will occasionally hint in concert, one beating the bushes while other flies overhead waiting to promise. With birds, as with other animals, we see, as we do in human beings, that some individuals are gifted above others of their kind. A few may have a keener sense, a greater strength or power of leadership, a more helpful spirit than their fellows. This counts for much in a social state. The action of the gander and of the trumpeter in driving their fellows home in the evening must be regarded as similar in its origin to that of the male swift when he hunts his mate back to the nest, and of the sand martin I observe chasing the females of the colony to their burrows. In a lesser way it may be seen in any flock of birds. They move about in such an orderly manner, springing, as it appears to us, simultaneously into the air, going in a certain direction, settling here or there to feed, presently going to another distant feeding ground, or alighting to rest or sing on the trees and bushes, as to produce the idea of a single mind. But the flock is not a machine. The minds are many. One bird gives the signal, and one who is a little better in his keener sense and quicker intelligence than his companions, his slightest sound, his least movement, is heard and seen and understood, and is instantly and simultaneously acted upon. Interrelations. Many curious associations are formed by birds during the breeding season. The pufin is quite capable of making a hole for itself in the face of some precipitous slope, but frequently it prefers to appropriate a rabbit's burrow, ejecting the rightful owner without ceremony. Other burrowing birds are often more accommodating, for the burrowing owls of America live amicably with the prairie dogs, whose retreats they so often share. And in New Zealand the same holes are shared by petrels and tuatera lizards without apparent friction. In cases of this kind, however, it is always possible that the partnership has other advantages, such as common defense or watchfulness, than the mere saving of labor, on the one hand, or on the other. There is a curious case, for instance, of the rudy kingfisher of Borneo, which makes its nest in the hive of a peculiarly vicious kind of bee. End of section 10. Birds. Recording by Goldie. Section 11 of the Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 12. Birds, Part 3. Our Common Birds. The late Professor Newton has an interesting passage in which he shows that we can tell which birds were most familiar to our forefathers by their having a pet name added. Thus the daw is the jackdaw, the red breast is robin, the wren is jenny, the pie is magpie, the mag being short for Margaret. In early prints of ploughing, the closeness of the connection between men and bird is naively pictured. In one of the earliest illustrations of sewing, for instance, the birds crowd so closely on the heel of the sower that they had to be driven off with stones or even whips, and they are seen springing beyond the leap of a small dog that has been sent to chase them. In modern times, the charms possessed by the birds is partly that of friendship, but more that of delight in their songs and feathers. The following birds form only a few examples chosen for some special interest. The Nightingale It has often been disputed whether the nightingale's songs is really the sweetest. It certainly owes something to the stage on which it is set, for when the bird arrives, the field and garden arc gay with spring flowers. The cuckoo arrives just about the same time. It sings all day, but the nightingale mostly in the evening, and the sweetness of his note is enhanced by the light of stars and the scent of blossom. Whether it is a melancholy or a merry song has long been disputed. It certainly is not loud, because when the nightingale sings by day, it is not noticed amid the clamor of other bird music. Mr. W. H. Hudson says its phrasing is more perfect than that of any other British melodist, and the voice has a combined strength, purity, and brilliance, probably without a parallel. The Blackbird and the Song Thrush the blackbird's voice is remarkable for its great strength and for the wonderful rich quality of its tone. He is a clever mimic like several other songsters, and has been heard to imitate the nightingale's song with some measure of success. There are several recorded instances, too, of his crowing exactly domestic cock, apparently enjoying the sound of the responses made by the fowls of the neighboring farmyard and of his crackling like an egg-proud hen. Some prefer the song of the blackbird to that of the thrush. It certainly is the sweeter of the two, but it is not so long continued. It may vary with the district, and some hold that the Surrey blackbird is the sweetest songster of his kind. The period of song is identical with the visit of the most delicately beautiful of all butterflies, the orange-tipped, even the little song thrush, a close relative of the blackbird, is a louder and more persistent singer than the latter, although in that respect he does not compete with the larger missile thrush, which can often be heard pouring out his bold, loud notes from the topmost twig of a bare tree in the month of January. The song is in keeping with his character. Mr. W. H. Hudson thinks that the Throstel is by far the finest songster. His chief merit is his infinite variety. His louder notes may be heard half a mile away on a still summer morning. His lowest sounds are scarcely audible at a distance of twenty yards. His purest sounds, which are very pure and bright when contrasted with the various squealing and squeaking noises, seem not to come from the same bird. As a rule, when he has produced a beautiful note, he will repeat it twice or thrice, while the blackbird is cunning and secret in his ways, creeping round the roots of the yews and other shrubs, the thrush boldly roams across the fields. The lark, the songster most closely associated with farmlands, is undoubtedly the lark. He is the earliest rising of all the birds, and when in full voice he is just about the time when the young wheat is tall enough to cover him, he may be heard pouring out his song before sunrise. He is not one to confine his charms to his courting days, but he has been heard in every month of the year except September, his molting time. It is in spring and early summer, however, that he pours forth his best music. 
the song has words for it in the folklore of many countries and the following rhyme succeeds in conveying an idea of it to wit to wit to we no shoemaker can bake boots for me why so why so why so because my heel's as long as my toe my toe the wood pigeon no voice is more closely associated with the beautiful wooded landscapes of england than the love song of the wood pigeon according to an ancient legend the words it tries to say are taktukus paddy the legend being that in the golden age the wood pigeon lays its eggs on the grass but they were trampled upon by two cows an irishman led one away and the wood pigeon pays in vain for him to take to the other to which the partridge is supposed to reply de il take it a wonderfully close imitation of its apology for a song the little dove the turtle dove or the crudling dove has a sweet short song that fits in well with the whisper of the summer leaves it is an old country saying that when you first hear the crudling of the little doe then it is time to sow your swedes the bullfinch and the goldfinch one has often wondered if there is a manner of accounting for the different marital qualities that characterize birds take the cock partridge and you find a model father one that will stand up to anything in defence of his young while the cock pheasant is a very gay lothario the most faithful of our birds is the bullfinch the male and female do not only stick together during the breeding season as is the case with most birds but along the lanes in winter you may see the male and female picking up morsels of food on the black hedgerows they do not keep close together but never go out of hearing of one another and it is very easy to imagine words for the conversation which they keep up the goldfinch is perhaps the most beautiful of all the feathered folk in the english landscape in autumn it is very pretty sight to see a little cluster of them feeding on thistledown and performing the most delicate acrobatic feats in balancing themselves so as to pick from the plant a few woodlanders variety of character in birds is nowhere more marked than among the more familiar inhabitants of the woodland take the jay clean made bright colored with a voice that is raucous but seems always in tune with the noise which the wind makes blowing through the tall trees he is a gentleman in appearance but his flight is as awkward as the gait of a yokel moreover nature has endowed him with a thieving and lawless character he steals the eggs from the nest and makes a meal of any fledglings that he can lay hold of yet he is very cunning about concealing himself during the breeding season when he has to think of the safety of the family as well as his own for the time being the loud cry is stilled and the bird on being disturbed shifts slyly and quietly from one tree to another he has a natural genius for concealing his nest and in that way differs much from his relative the magpie whose idea of architecture is simply to pile woody twigs upon woody twigs so as to make a conspicuous and monstrous habitation the magpie used to be a favorite domestic pet but its numbers have now been greatly reduced so that to see several of them together which used to be considered very unlucky it is almost impossible in some districts they very often go in threes for some reason which we cannot explain the magpie can be taught to articulate a few words he is inquisitive and loquacious the usual sound emitted by the magpie is an exciting chatter a note with a hard percussive sound rapidly repeated half a dozen times it may be compared to the sound of a wooden rattle or to the bleating of a goat but there is always a certain resemblance to the human's voice in it especially when the birds are unalarmed and converse with each other in subdued tones the huron is a bird of the woodland in so far as it is there he makes his heronry it will frequently be found closely adjacent to a rookery but the two colonies do not always live at peace although in a case the writer knows of quite near london they have done so for many decades the rooks are numerous and aggressive and though an individual rook could not hold its own with a huron numbers usually prevail 
when a battle royal takes place. In habit, the Huron is a bird of the brook and river, and there can be little doubt about his favorite diet being a fish. He loves to stand in a clear, shallow stream, apparently motionless. But should an eel creep out, or a boulder trout try to make a passage upstream, the Huron's keen eye sees it at once, and down comes his beak like a sharp spear. The chances being that the next experience of the fish is that of being borne through the air, to be eventually swallowed and either wholly or partly digested. In the latter case, the process is stopped in order that the young may receive the food in a softened condition. The green woodpecker is a common British species whose bright plumage is less conspicuous among the trees than might be thought, but whose presence is often betrayed by the loud cry, like a burst of demoniac laughter, or by the strong tap, tap, tap of its beak as it sounds the tree trunks for rotten portions where insects may be found. The woodpecker's strong beak adopted to its mode of feeding is well suited also for the work of excavating a nesting hole and a deep cavity with a small horizontal opening at the top is hollowed out the water hen and the coot the water hen looks black at a distance but on closer observation discloses many charming shades of color it is a bird that seems to thrive and increase in numbers more than its companion the coot yet it nests often in a perilous position you may seek for the nest either among the rushes and flags or the border of a stream or on the long willow branches that stretch out closely to the surface of the water if they are not touching it country folk believe that in every normal year there is a may flood and when that comes the water very frequently lifts the nest of the water hen out of its mooring and carries it downstream the faithful bird will go a long distance in its curious little ship, but it is compelled to vacate it at last, as such floods carry down the branches of trees, trunks that have been lying on the bank, and a great deal of miscellaneous debris capable of wrecking the poor craft. Not that the water hen is likely to suffer personal injury, as she will dive into the strongest running stream and escape scatheless. The Grebes The little grebe is to be met with on inland waters all the year round. In winter it resorts to rivers and larger bodies of water when the small ponds beside which it often nests are apt to be frozen over. Its supreme accomplishment is that of diving and hiding itself among the stems of water plants or other cover. It must of course come up, but it is amusing to notice the length of time it will remain under the water and the distance it will often travel before it makes a second appearance. The great crested grebe is one of the stateliest and most beautiful of our inland water birds. Visitors from the Sea One of the most beautiful sights to be seen in this country is that of a colony of black-headed gulls nestling beside a lake or in swampy places far away from the sea coast and estuaries where they may be found in winter searching for small fishes or other food cast up by the tide. In days of old, their eggs were prized as food, and even the young were taken. But the modern palate does not set so much value on them. The movements inland are made with great regularity, the birds appearing at one gull pond, of which we know about March 27, scarcely ever a day before or a day later. They raise their young while the corncrake is singing its mournful and monotonous ditty in the new grass and the growing wheat. A hill country attracts them because of the little streamlets which pro provide plenty of food. They know as well as the angler does that the trout lie with their heads upstream waiting for any little tidbit in the shape of a worm or fly which the water brings down. When the gulls are fishing one can watch them beating their way up past a succession gravelly shells into which they occasionally dip for prey. When they come to the end of the beat, they fly back round the shoulder of the hill out of sight of the stream and resume operations where they started before. Birds of the Moorland There is no prettier adjunct to a moorland or a bare field than a flock of lapwings. They fly together and all right together in autumn of winter when not breeding, but in nesting time they go in pairs though usually there are dozens and sometimes hundreds in the same field. The bird is a simple creature 
insofar that its nest is little more than a slight hollow on the bare earth. In spring they can be seen sitting on their eggs without making the slightest attempt at concealment, so that the individual who goes out to collect their eggs need only march up to a sitting bird, but if it rises, he must keep his eye on the place from which it springs. There never can be much doubt as to whether or not the nest is close, because if it is, the bird shriek and swoop at the intruder, as if they were going for his head or eyes. Should an animal other than a man come, they will indeed carry out the threat. No sooner are the young out of their shells that they begin to run as if chased, will select a hiding place. It may be closed by stones as gray as themselves, or in the short herbage which early spring brings with it. A trained eye is needed to distinguish them from their surrounding, even at a short distance. The curlew haunts the seashore during the greater part of the year, but in spring retires to some slack or valley in hilly country and makes a nest on the ground. The situation is generally very lonely, and the watchful birds quickly show themselves alive to the presence of a stranger. Usually their note is a monotonous and melancholy sound, heard as it often is at night-time in the stillness of the moorland, but we know of no other bird that makes the clamor the curlew does when its domestic privacy is invaded. It flies up and down the valley, shrieking to awaken the echoes, and looking as if it would like to do something dreadful to the human who had ventured into its domain. The snipe is the most difficult of indigenous game birds to shoot, on account of its trick of half-stopping and suddenly darting. During the breeding season he performs curious antics in the air, rising to a great height, and then precipitating himself downward with astonishing violence, producing in his descent the peculiar sound variously described as drumming, bleeding, scyther wetting, and neighing. The peculiar drumming sound was long the subject of controversy, but recent observation have made it clear that it is due to the vibration of the two outer tail feathers which have a peculiar structure. The cuckoo. The cuckoo is well known not only builds no nest of its own, but foists its eggs on other species and has its young reared without trouble to itself, but to the great detriment of the rightful children of the foster parents. The story indeed is one of the most curious in the whole realm of natural history, and the facts are now becoming better known. Among other new evidence, the recent intensive observations and wonderful cinematography records of Mr. Edgar Chance have placed several points beyond doubt. The cuckoo's procedure. It seems to be the case that each female cuckoo has its chosen territory of operation, and that deliberate choice of nests is made in advance of the date of laying. When the time for laying comes, the selected nest is approached, the cuckoo takes an egg from the nest in its beak, settles on the nest, lays its own egg, and then flies away with a stolen egg, which it either eats or drops at a distance. The whole maneuver takes but a few seconds and may be carried out despite the frantic efforts of the small and unwilling hosts to drive off the intruder. Sometimes the procedure varies, for no cuckoo could lay in a wren's nest, for instance, and in cases of that kind the egg must be laid outside and inserted with a beak. The point of principle, however, is that the cuckoo certainly does not fly about carrying an already laid egg and looking for a suitable nest to victimize. The young cuckoo's part. One cuckoo does not normally lay two eggs in the same nest, but different cuckoos may chance to select the same victim if there has been an encroachment of territory. Once the act has been accomplished, the foster parents do the rest until the eggs hatch out. Then begins the second part of the cuckoo's villainy, for the young fondling has in its earliest and comparatively helpless days the inborn habit of removing the other chicks from the nest by getting his back under them and heaving them overboard. So it happens that the foster parents are soon left with but one charge, whose veracity keeps them perpetually busy and whose body speedily fills up the nest. Still, the poor dupes go on feeding the parasite, even when he is much bigger than they are. One of Mr. Chance's photographs shows a bloated young cuckoo sitting on a post when the much smaller Pippet, dutifully feeding him, must needs stand on his shoulder, so to speak, for the purpose. 
The whole story is one of effective adaptation on the part of the cuckoo and of weakness of blind instinct on the part of the foster parent. The most interesting theoretical point about the cuckoo has to do with the color of the eggs, which is very variable, but tends to be like the one of the eggs that is chosen foster mother. The one hen cuckoo always lays the same type of egg seems to be thoroughly established, but it is still a matter of speculation whether the character is hereditary, and if so, in what matter. The cuckoo victimizes a large number of different species as foster parents for its young, but all the usual ones are small insectivorous birds. The degree to which the cuckoo's eggs resembles the others varies greatly. Sometimes there is almost a perfect match, at least in color, but in other cases the similarity is slight or even non-existent. End of section 11, recording by Goldie. Section 12 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Goldie. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 12, Birds, Part 4. Migration. The scientific investigation of migration is greatly complicated by the difficulties of making observations. It is not believed that the greater part of migration takes place at immense altitudes and at an accelerated rate of flight, which makes enormous journeys possible for birds in a single night. It remains true that a great deal of migration is nocturnal, and that for other reasons also it is difficult to observe. At certain times and places, however, much migratory flight can be actually observed. We have, for example, this recent description of the passage of swallows on Heligoland. All through the forenoon, as we sat in the autumn sunshine near the narrow northern apex of the island, the swallows came in over the sea from the northeast in the teeth of a southerly gale. No large flocks were seen, but on the other hand, scarcely a minute elapsed without the arrival of a fresh party of from a half a dozen to a score of birds. They seemed to fly low over the sea, but rose as they approached to the level of the cliff tops. We could not make them out at any distance, for the observer can find no worse background for small birds than gray moving water. The stream was continuous, and the direction unvarying, so far as we could judge. Each party rose to our level on the top of the north point, flew unhesitantly along the western side of the island, and disappeared again at the southwestern corner. Not one in a hundred quitted this line, or stopped to circle round. None seem inclined to break their journey so early in the day, in spite of the country elements. The whole was for us just a momentary peep at one of the countless tiny channels by which the bird life of northern Europe was then ebbing southward. Migration of Starlings A more comprehensive idea of migration is obtainable from Gatke's observation extending over the whole length of a season. Let us summarize the diurnal movements of starlings as observed by him on Heligoland during the autumn of 1878. Early in June came a few old birds in worn plumage. Birds would have probably remained unmated or had early lost their broods. On the 20th June came the first great flights of young birds of the year, migrating by themselves in advance of their parents, although only a few weeks out of the egg. These youngsters continued to pass till the end of the month to the extent of thousands daily. In early July the daily passage was estimated in tens of thousands, and, and on the 25th the movement closed with the passage of immense multitudes. Two months followed, during which no starlings, young or old, were to be seen. On the 22nd September old birds, now in fresh plumage, passed in flights of many hundreds, during October the flights increased to thousands, and on the 14th the movement reached a climax, with starlings in hundreds of thousands. By the end of the month the great flights had ceased, but through November, and even up to the 18th of December, the birds continued to pass in daily flights of from 40 to 60 individuals. Lighthouse Scenes 
nocturnal migration is also often observed at lighthouse and lightships and especially when the weather is foggy thousands of birds dazzled by the lantern rays dash themselves against the glass as Gatke says, the whole sky is now filled with a babel of hundreds and thousands of voices, and as we approach the lighthouse, there presents itself to the eye a scene which more than confirms the experience of the ear. Under the intense glare of the light, swarms of larks, starlings, and thrushes career around in ever-varying density, like showers of brilliant sparks or huge snowflakes driven onward by the gale and continuously replaced as they disappear by freshly arrived multitudes. Mingled with these birds are a large number of golden plovers, lapwings, curlews, and sandpipers. Now and again, too, a woodcock is seen, or an owl with slow beating wings emerges from the darkness into the circle of light but again speedily vanishes accompanied by the plaintive cry of an unhappy thrush that has become its prey the modern method of marking with numbered aluminum foot rings has a beady added greatly to our knowledge of the actual journeys performed by individual birds by this means for instance white storks mark in the nest in east prussia have been traced southeastward across europe to syria palestine and egypt and thence up to the nile to lake victoria nyanza and also away eastward near lake chad in the very heart of africa and so southwards through rhodesia to natal the transvaal and cape colony five separate swallows marked with aluminum rings in this country have been found in south africa in winter the outline of science migrations of lapwings many birds such as lapwings or peewits marked in scotland as chicks in summer have been recovered in winter from ireland other scottish lapwings have wandered further and have been recorded from the west coast of france or from portugal in a few cases too lapwings were reported during the winter months from their native districts it is therefore evident that even within a single species in a single area there may be resident and migratory individuals and among the migrates some which go much further afield than others there is no doubt that many birds on their return make for their birthplace a swallow marked when it was a young one has been found thus to return to its native farmyard birds would appear to return in spring impelled by a greater urgency than in the autumn migration when we see sometimes a good deal of dallying some birds are known to make trial trips and begin their journey with short stages on the return some authorities believe there is evidence that the spring journey is more direct that short cuts are found and that haste is evident when weather conditions are very bad there it's often great loss of life the streets of towns are sometimes strewn with thousands of birds that have gone astray and have perished in the cold as many as five hundred nightingales have been gathered in a single day from one small town purpose served by migration migration must serve some good purpose and be of advantage to the species which possess the habit it is indeed an expensive habit involving the perpetuation of a complex instinct the output of a large amount of energy and the facing of great risks and a heavy mortality these factors would surely be enough to wipe out a species in the keen struggle for existence did not some great compensating advantage also accrue for the departure of many birds on the approach of winter we can perhaps see good reason probably not so much in mere cold itself but in the decrease in food supply in the freezing of ground and water and in the shortened hours of daylight in the return from the south in the spring we may see an expression of a need for expansion during the breeding season to obtain more room abundance of nesting sites and fresh sources of food supply we must distinguish carefully between reasons and causes of migration between why and how valid although the reasons given may be they do not in the least explain how the migratory habit has come to be to miss this point is to fall into the trap of imagining birds as endowed with human knowledge and intellect with the power of adopting a reasoned course of conduct based on the foreknowledge of seasonal events and on an appreciation of geographical differences causes of migration 
two points must strike us as being significant one is that migration is a very regular phenomenon happening year after year according to the same pattern without marked differences corresponding to annual variations in climate and showing none of the features to be expected in an emergency effort created anew each season secondly much migration takes place long before it seems to be necessary for in the british isles southward movements begin as early as july many migrants too go further than seem to be required overshooting the mild winter of the northern subtropics to find a similar climate in the summer of temperate regions of the southern hemisphere the old conclusion seems inevitable that migration is a very old habit an inborn instinct which was developed ages ago and which manifests itself year after year in a uniform manner and without any remarkably close conformity to immediate conditions for an explanation of this ancient origin of the instinct we should doubtless look to the former history of birds for some more compelling circumstance capable of initiating the habit which is still maintained some have supposed that the last glacial epoch or great ice age may have driven birds gradually southward and after a long time allowed them to return gradually northwards but during the second phase it is thought they would come north only for the summer and return in between to alternative homes they had learned to know others have imagined birds as originating in the south and gradually extending their range in search of fresh feeding grounds for the hungry mouths of the breeding season going further and further each summer but always returning in winter to the original cradle of the race if we admit that the immediate seasonal changes are insufficient in themselves to cause migration beginning so early in each autumn as it does we must yet invoke them to some extent to complete the other theory if migration is an ancient habit annually reborn there must still be some immediate factor stimulating the latent instinct events not in themselves of sufficient strength as causes many yet serve to release more powerful energies just as a detonator explodes the bursting charge so many subtle changes either in the seasons or perhaps in the functional cycle of the bird's life awaken the compelling instinct which causes birds to cross unknown seas and continents in accordance with some ancient plan how do migrants find their way what routes do migrants follow and how do the birds find their way we must remember here again that migration is in the main a very orderly phenomenon which takes place year after year according to the same pattern we have now evidence too that as regards summer quarters at least it is common for birds to return to the same place with great accuracy any suggestion therefore of a mere haphazard movement with a vague general direction may be dismissed as being inconsistent with the facts as we know them other points to be remembered are that much migration takes place at night and that wide stretches of open sea are habitually crossed furthermore the young of the year in many species migrate southward before the parents in the case of the cuckoo long after their parents and must thus find their way without any memories to guide them anything which lies in the experience of the race as distinct from that of the individual must in these cases be handed on by inheritance purely and not by tuition and imitation our knowledge of the routes that birds follow in their migratory flights are still very scanty hooded crows caught and marked as birds of passage in the southern eastern corner of the baltic have been shown to come from southern finland in the petrograd district of russia and to follow the coast southwards and westward as far as the north eastern corner of france black-headed gulls ringed at the same place but as nestlings have been reported from right round the coast to the bay of biscay from along the courses of the rhine and the rhone as far as the balearic isles and from along the courses of the vistula and the danube and across to northern africa in its migratory flight the whole life of a bird is raised to a higher pitch it is estimated that many birds attain a speed of fifty miles an hour and a carrier pigeon has been known to keep the rate of fifty-five miles an hour for four successive hours it is unlikely that this is often surpassed by migratory birds on long distance flights homing the question how do birds find their way is not one which can be answered at present 
more must first be learned of the nature of the roots which are in fact followed by migrants of the relationship of particular summer quarters to particular winter quarters and as to whether winter quarters are as clearly defined and as accurately sought out as summer quarters are known to be it is probable however that the question may be narrowed down by the elucidation of that special acuity of the senses or whether it may be which underlies the homing capacity so well known in birds recent experiments by professor j b watson and dr k s lashley have had their subjects the naughty and sooty terns nesting on the tortugas islands in the gulf of mexico birds taken from their nests and transported by ship in close cages were shown to be capable of finding their way back home from Galveston to the east or from Cape Hatteras to the north, distances of over 850 miles or from intermediate points at sea entirely out of sight of landmarks of any kind. In being taken northwards, too, the birds were removed beyond the limits of the species' natural range, and the absence of any previous experience in that direction was all the more certain at least therefore we must concede a very highly developed sense of direction or bump of locality and plumage courtship and mating it does not come within the scope of this work to go into the question of the general classification of birds neither can we consider in detail the characters of bird structures or of feathers and plumage a bibliography is given at the end of this chapter which will be useful for readers who wish to have more information on these interesting subjects a volume might be written on any of them we cannot pass over altogether however the nature of feathers and plumage the acquisition of feathers might have been one of great steps in the progress of birds toward their present position as the supreme flying animals par excellence it is indeed but to forego another link in the evolutionary history to find that feathers are modified scales and therefore closely akin to the typical covering of reptiles let us notice too that the unfeathered part of a bird bear ordinary scales the one form as it were simply replacing the other where it is more suitable the scales on the toes are often suggestively reptilian in appearance and, and when there are also feathers about the toes they grow not on the scales but from between the scales from between the other scales we may indeed say to emphasize the point plumage coloration the feathers of many birds are richly colored and even those of sober hue may be very beautifully marked in some cases the colors may be due to actual pigment but in others especially blues and greens the minute physical structure of the feathers is responsible and wonderful effects of iridescence are produced brilliance of plumage is often associated with a mating season but this is far from being a general rule in some instances the male has a special breeding plumage and sometimes both sexes have this examples of each kind being found among the plovers in other cases the male has brilliant plumage for most of the year like the millard while his mate is always dull in many species on the other hand the sexes are alike and have a similar appearance all the year round this permanent plumage may be dull colored as in the song thrush op curl you wonderfully beautiful birds nevertheless or brilliant as in the kingfisher most birds that have a permanent bright plumage however are dull in their first year as is the case with the afterward splendidly iridescent starling but in some cases such as the kingfishers and the parrots the gorgeous plumes have appeared before the birds leaving the nest one other kind of change must also be mentioned namely the seasonal change of the ptarmigan which is white during the season of snow and of duller appearance when its native hills are brown once more courtship and mating some of the most interesting habits of birds are those associated with a mating season in many cases they are curious ceremonies of courtship often with wonderful display of brilliant plumage or with great exuberance of song and sometimes there are fierce fights between rival males the peacock spreads and erects his magnificent train the argus pheasant displays long plimies on his wings as well as on his tail and the different birds of paradise glow with gorgeousness in their almost every feather 
many a relatively dowdy bird as judged by human eyes may also be seen posturing in much the same way as his more ornamental brethren and we must be chary of denying to any bird strange beauty in the sight of his love in the ordinary black grouse we may find a habit of display as well marked as that of any inhabitant of tropical jungles it gives indeed an example not only of individual display but also of a collective tournament in which rival black cocks strive to impress the grey hens which they wish to win as mates in scotland say the fortunate may perhaps witness a gathering of black cocks at break of day early in the breeding season the birds assemble in some open spot and indulge in the wild whirring calls that form their song of love and war and the racket may be heard two miles off then the tournament begins it may be skirmishing a display of fencing or sparring or as sometimes happens these harmless encounters may develop into fierce fights and sometimes a duel to the death at intervals during each separate fight black cocks emit a curious call it is almost a hoarse screech resembling the noise too painfully familiar to us namely that of cats on housetops supplemented by the said animals being afflicted with sore throats the sound is both wild and unmusical in the extreme we will suppose that the observer has come early on the scene before the grey hens have made their appearance the approach of one of the latter is the signal for an immediate cessation of hostilities on all sides and intense excitement prevails amongst the assembled blackcocks her approach has been observed by a single bird who has been sharper than the rest in detecting the lady afar he will suddenly draw himself up to a rigid position of attention till he is sure she is really coming having settled this in his mind to his own satisfaction he throws himself into the air and flutters up a few feet uttering the wild horse notes with all the power and effect he can muster this is of course known to impress the lady in his favour and arouse in her breast a proper sense of admiration which he considers his due his example is immediately followed by all the others who want a lighting dance about in the most absurd manner each one trying to see who can screech the loudest and be the most ridiculous in his antics when a hen has alighted on the playing ground the male that is nearest to her pairs with her and fights off any other that disputes her possession she then meanwhile walks sedately round her lord and master picking about the grass coquettishly and pretending to be feeding each hen on arrival causes the same general excitement and is appropriated by one or another of the successful cocks till the harems are filled up one cock having at times as many as six or seven hens as the season advances after the first few mornings of the hens coming to the ground they resort to the same spot each day and stay with the same cock who has previously trodden them and are not interfered with afterwards by other cocks who acknowledge the superior claims of the male to whom they rightfully belong in some cases there are special aids to display such as the pouch in the neck of the great bustard which the cock can distend and will and use as an aid in the erection of his feathers pigeons too have a similar habit of inflating their crops although they lack special plumes and the frygate bird has an external pouch which itself serves as an ornament being of naked skin bright red in colour and very extendable the bower birds of australasia examples could be multiplied almost indefinitely but we must here confine ourselves to one other case which has a novel feature of its own the different species of bower birds found in australasia build various types of bowers which serve as playgrounds in which the cocks court their mates these bowers are often large and complex structures of twigs or flower stems and are decorated with collections of blossom shells or brightly colored berries one species builds a little cabin some two feet high and three feet in diameter at the foot of a tree and with a wide mossy lawn in front while another makes a tunnel several feet long and completely roofed over with twigs these bowers from the birds courting grounds are quite distinct from the nests which are built in trees at a later stage fighting with rivals plays 
apart of varying magnitude in the loves of different birds some species are well known for their pugnacity the familiar robin for instance in incock fighting this has been turned to account as source of human entertainment in the domestic cock and in pheasants the development of spurs as weapons of offence is well known and in some kinds of birds there are several pairs other birds fight with their wings and lap wings may be seen buffeting each other in mid-air an egyptian relative of the lapwing the spur wing plover has a weapon on its wings which is said to make a fatal result no uncommon occurrence the ruff a kind of sandpiper now numbered among the rarer english birds has a frill of feathers round the neck which is a shield of defence as well as an ornament for display in the regular tournaments which are held the females called reeves lack the distinctive adornment voice the seat of the voice in mammals is in the larynx and at top of the windpipe in birds however the vocal cords are at the foot of the windpipe in a special enlargement called the song box or syrinx the sounds are due to the rapid passage of air over the tense cords in the course of evolution the significance of the voice has broadened out from a simple parental call it became a means of recognition of any kindred and in the course of ages it became expressive of particular emotions of joy and of fear of jealousy and of content while a certain amount of vocal ability is part of the hereditary make-up there seems little doubt that the gift requires educating the song of the first year is sometimes what one might call tentative and generalized it improves with practice and is probably held by emulation and imitation the way in which some birds example skylarks steal snatches of one another's music suggests the importance of imitation as a factor in educating the vocal powers song we have spoken of song as the vocal part of the display of courtship but it would be wrong to think of it as being no more song is indeed not confined to the breeding season but the periods differ with the species the extent to which the females can sing also varies it is not possible to draw a sharp dividing line between true song and the notes which constitute the ordinary language of birds and this gives another reason for not overemphasizing the sexual significance of song the definition of song must not be too strictly confined to notes which sound musical to human ears outside the ordinary songbird group there is quite commonly found some notes or cry which is especially associated with the breeding season and which may be regarded as the equivalent of a song many of these cries seem harsh and discordant to us but others have an obvious charm at any rate in their native surroundings amid the rugged beauty of a wild moorland the weird bubbling spring call of the curlew is perhaps more appropriate music than the dainty lilt of the sweetest warbler there are other notes too which are not vocal pigeons for instance can clap their wings loudly together in flight the white stork rattles the halves of his beak like castanets and the snipe bleats or drums in springtime as we have already remarked end of section 12section 13 of the outline of science volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by goldie the outline of science volume 2 by j arthur thompson chapter 12 birds part 3 nesting habits primitive nesting habits if the earliest birds were arboreal as we have reasons for believing the primitive nesting sites were doubtless also in trees the elaborate structures made by many present-day birds however are obviously products of a higher specialized habit which has been evolved in the course of ages at an earlier stage the eggs would be laid in such natural sites as were available without the necessity of building and modern examples of a similar habit are not wanting a species of white tern for instance inhabits tropical islands and frequently deposits its single egg on the strong horizontal leaf of a palm tree as dr h o forbes says the egg is laid in the narrow angular gap between two leaflets on the summit of each arc of the leaf where it rests securely without a scrap of nest 
yet defying the heaving and twisting of the leaves in the strongest winds the leaf as in all palms goes on drooping further and further till it falls and among the settlers on coco's keeling island it is a subject of keen betting when they see a tern sitting on an ominously withered leaf whether the young bird will be hatched or not before the leaf falls the result has always been in favor of the bird if the leaf falls in the afternoon the tern will have escaped from the egg in the morning examples of birds which nest in holes and trees in accordance with a probably ancestral custom are the owls the parrots the titmice and of course the woodpeckers the imprisonment of the home bill another hole nester is the home bill of which various species are found in many tropical lands and its story is a very strange one indeed when the eggs are laid and the hen begins to sit the opening in the tree trunk is walled up with mud by the cock only until a small orifice remains through which the sitting bird can put no more than her head the device is doubtless a means of defense against snakes or other enemies but it involves the imprisonment of the hen during the whole period of incubation during this time however she is by no means left to starve but is fed assiduously through the grill by her devoted mate who is indeed set to work so hard and to forage so unselfishly that he is worn to a mere shadow of his former self before the task is done among the tree nesting birds the most primitive type of wholly artificial nest seems to be the platform of sticks or twigs made by such birds as eagles herons and pigeons these structures are often of great size being added to year after year the simplest platforms are quite flat but others are more or less cupped shaped as in the case of crows finally this type reaches its highest point in those birds which add a dome-shaped roof more complex structures more promising material is used by most of the small birds which nest in trees or bushes and with pliable twigs grasses and roots moss and perhaps animal hair much more complex structures are possible the finches for example make elaborate and beautiful cup-shaped nests while others such as the wren and the dipper make spherical nests which can be entered only by a small hole in one side in addition to the actual structure there is often a distinct lining of specially selected material for this purpose small feathers hair and fine fibers are greatly favored but in the familiar case of the song thrush for instance a complete lining of hardened mud is a characteristic feature few nests reach such a high development as that of the tailor bird of india so called from its habit of sewing leaves together to make a beautiful pouch a very triumph of the nest builder's art burrowers from nesting in holes in trees to nesting in holes in the ground is an easy transition and the gap is bridged by the birds like the stock dove which use either side according to the opportunities which a particular district may happen to afford this bird gets its name from the habit of nesting in holes in the stalks of old trees but among the sand dunes on many parts of the british coastline it uses rabbit burrows instead in similar haunts we may also find another burrow nester the bird which mr w h hudson calls the strange and beautiful sheldrake unlike most of the duck family the male sheldrake is not subject to an eclipse molt in the midst of breeding season and he is therefore able to stand by his mate who furthermore has a bright plumage similar to his own other birds which nest in burrows are the petrels some penguins the kingfisher and the sand martin the last name nests in colonies and each pair of tunnels may feed into the chosen banks and hollows a little chamber at the end the bee-eater makes a similar tunnel which may be as much as ten feet long as with holes in trees a lining may be added say of grass or other vegetation the shell duck like others of its kind uses a plentiful supply of down plucked from its own breast while the kingfisher lines its nest with an unsavory collection of fish bones and other remains of its prey the megapodes go to the extreme of completely burying their eggs either in pits or under specially constructed mounds ground nesting very many other birds nest either on the open ground or among the long grass and herbage 
Sometimes there is a well-built nest among a grass, as in the case of the skylark or the meadow pipit. At other times there may be a bulky heap of vegetation or of other material. This cormorant, for instance, often raises a mound of seaweed, and some kinds of penguin build a spartan nest of stones. Still, again, there may be a mere hollow scrapped in the ground, as in the case of the lapwing or the tern, perhaps with a lining, a pretense at a lining, or with no lining at all. Finally, the bird may lay its eggs on the ground without any attempt at a nest, as the oyster catcher does among the river-sized shingle. Cliff nesting. Somewhere between the tree nesters and the ground nesters, we must place those birds which nest on cliffs, for although a nest on a rock ledge may seem in some ways very like a nest on flat ground, the dependence on inaccessibility rather than on concealment makes the habit also akin to tree nesting. Some of the borrowers, like the puffins and the petrels, might well be classed in by this group, as their holes are usually on precipitous faces, but more typical are those species which breed on the open ledges, like the guillemont and the razorbill. A highly specialized type of nest, too, is that which is built of mud against the sheer rock face for this purpose, as in the house martin. The habitations of man are often found to serve as well as natural faces of rock. Sometimes the mud and other material are made more coherent by the addition of the salivary secretion of the builders, as it, with the edible swift of Borneo. This substance, like hardened glue, forms practically the whole structure, and is the source of the bird's nest soup, beloved of the Chinese gourmet. The use of old nests. Many birds return to their old nests and use them again and again, while other kinds habitually build afresh each year. There are birds, too, which commonly use the old nests of other species, or without additions of their own, although they are not always incapable of building for themselves if faced with a necessity. This habit is not uncommon in the case of birds of prey. The kestrel, for example, often uses the old nests of crows and pigeons. The green sandpiper, belonging to a very different order of birds, uses the old nests of thrushes and other tree-nesting birds, and even squirrels, drays, although most of its own kin are typical ground-nesters. Chicks and nestlings. It is impossible to leave the main question of nesting habit without some reference to the striking differences observable among the newly hatched young of birds. These fall into two well-marked groups in accordance with the condition and stage of development at the date of leaving the egg. Technically, these groups are the nidifugats and the rodicolos, terms which may translate as nest quitting and nest dwelling though perhaps something of the distinction is conveyed in the two ordinary names chick and nestling. The chick of domestic fowl is notoriously a nest quitter. So also are ducklings, whether domestic or belonging to one of the many wild species. And so, likewise, the young of the plover kind. All these birds leave the eggs prepared to take an immediate active part in life. They are open-eyed and lively, able to walk and in appropriate cases to swim, and capable of finding their own food with no more than guidance and protection of the parent. Contrast these with, say, young thrushes, helpless, blind, almost naked, and rather repulsive-looking creatures, which would die miserably without the food their parents so assiduously bring. The difference is indeed a most striking one, but some of the nest-dwelling young are not quite so unlike the more active chicks. The nestlings of the birds of prey, and of the owls, for instance, are clothed in down, and are open-eyed and alert, although they remain in the nest at first, and are wholly dependent on their parents for food. Transporting the Young We have an illustration of how some birds make use of their wits in the way they transport their young. In this connection, Lord Grey recently told how he watched a wood duck, Carolina, whose nest was a hole in a tree twenty-one feet from the ground and three hundred yards from the water. Presently the duck flew down from the hole into the grass and began calling. Then one by one the little ducklings came to the edge of the hole and fell to the ground. When measured, the nest was found to be two feet below the hole. For the newly hatched birds to climb that distance 
to fall twenty-one feet and then follow their mother three hundred yards to the water was i think a tremendous tribute to the energy of nature the female woodcock when threatened with danger is known to transport her young one at a time to another place she does so by carrying the young ones with her feet holding them in her claws or pressing between her thighs it is also said that where she nests at a distance from the feeding ground she will carry her young to and fro in the morning and evening the study of birds eggs we cannot here discuss fully the eggs of birds a wealth of matter for speculation lies in the why and wherefore of size and shape of texture and color and of the numbers forming a clutch all these characters show wide limits of difference but on the whole they remain very constant and characteristic for any one species size and shape of eggs the size of the individual egg is variable apart from the question of due proportion to the size of the parent bird concerned this is related in a large degree to the length of the incubation period while this in turn depends to an important extent on the state of development of the young when hatched a subject which has already been discussed in texture of shell eggs vary from the brilliantly polished egg of the tinamous to the softly chalky eggs of the cormorant from which the white outer surfaces can be scraped to show a pale blue layer beneath thickness of shell is also a variable factor apart from the mere relation to general size egg coloration it is however the color of eggs that have always attracted most attention some of these are exceedingly beautiful both in tint and in the patterns of marking blues and greens are common especially among tree nesting birds while ground nesters usually show neutral brown tones which are most effective for purposes of camouflage some splendid red tones are characteristic of the birds of prey markings may be small spots or larger blotches and they may be evenly distributed or concentrated in a particular zone fine lines also are found in some cases witness the buntings and in many birds there is a plain marked ground color pure white eggs are usually found in species which nest in holes and this is perhaps of some use in the dark although the more important point is probably the absence of any occasion for an attempt at camouflage coloration coloration in many instances serve a protective purpose and generally speaking it is related to some extent to the nature of the bird's environment there are curiously no pure black eggs behavior of birds more than any other creatures birds have claimed the attention of those who are fond of what faber called scrutinizing life there is often an extraordinary subtlety as well as beauty in their habits there are big-brained animals and the senses of sight and hearing are developed to great perfection the question is how much in the behavior of birds we must ascribe to instinctive endowment that is to inborn impulsions or hereditary nervous predispositions and to what extent must we credit the bird with intelligent learning when a young moorhen swims deftly the first time it touches the water or dives perfectly when the fit and proper stimulus is forthcoming we interpret this as instinctive its physiological side is a concatenation of reflex actions its psychological side is inborn impulse and endeavor similarly when an unhatched lapwing utters its characteristic call note peewit from within the egg we say this is instinctive independent of instruction learning or imitation but a different note is sounded in the behavior of the greek eagle which lets the tortoise fall on the rocks from a great height so that the carpace is broken or in a similar device of the rook that lifts the freshwater mussel and lets it fall on the riverside stones the herring gull sometimes lifts the sea urchin or the clam in its bill and let it fall on the shingle so that the shells are broken without necessarily supposing that these birds thought out the expedient we can hardly avoid the conclusion that they utilize the discovery intelligently in many cases the bird must be credited with an appreciation of circumstances with an awareness of what is significant and what a capacity for learning the young chick's capacity for rapidly learning simple lessons mostly associations have been proved up to the hilt by many experiments in the quiet of the wood one sometimes hears the song thrush breaking snail shells on its stone anvil 
and one may easily find the tell-tale evidence of its appetite. Is this habit, which comes so near using a tool, an inborn gift, or has it to be learned? The answer is given by Miss Frances Pitt in her admirable Wild Creatures of Garden and Heather Grow. To a young thrush, which she has brought up by hand, she offered some wood snails, Helios nemoralis, but he took no interest in them until one put out its head and began to move about. The bird then pecked on its horns, but was bewildered when the snail retreated within the shelter of its shell. This happened over and over again. The bird's inquisitiveness increased day by day. The thrush often picked up by the lip, but no real progress was made till the sixth day, when the thrush beat a snail on the ground as it would a big earthworm. At last, on the same day, he picked up the shell and hit it repeatedly against the stone. He tried one snail's shell after another, until after fifteen minutes' hard work he managed to break one. After that all was easy. He had cracked his first snail. After long trying, he has found out how to deal with a difficult situation. We may say that while a certain predisposition to beat things is doubtless inborn, the use of the anvil is no outcome of a specialized instinct. It is an intelligent acquisition. The general impression that one gets in regard to this cleverness of birds in such activities as nest building, capturing booty, and dealing with food is that on an instinctive basis, varying in definiteness, there is built up a superstructure partly due to easy education and subsequent imitation, and partly due to an intelligent appreciation of the lessons of experience. But an appreciation of the relative importance of nature and nurture requires careful observation and experiment. End of section 13, recorded by Goldie. Section 14 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 13, Natural History 2, Mammals, Part 1. In an earlier chapter, we have dealt with the evolution of animals in general, their haunts or habitats, their everyday functions, their behavior, and what we have called the dawn of mind. Here we select one class, that of mammals, and presupposing what has gone before, we shall discuss them, in the main, from one point of view, how they are suited to the particular conditions of their life. Origin of Mammals The genealogical tree of animals splits at the top into birds and mammals, and these are on quite different lines of evolution. They are not related to one another, except to this extent, that they have a common ancestry among the extinct reptiles, as we have already seen. For just as birds sprang from some uncertain stock of bipedal dinosaurs, so mammals must be traced back to another extinct reptilian stock, the cynodonts. These cynodonts, also known as therapsids, occur as Triassic fossils in Africa and North America. Though they were genuine reptiles, they had very mammal-like skulls. Thus the teeth may be distinguished as incisors, canines, and molars, as in a dog, hence the name cynodont, dog-toothed. The earliest mammals. The earliest mammals were small creatures, the largest no bigger than a rat. The teeth of some of them indicate insect eating. The teeth of others point to an herbivorous habit. The sharp incisors of some types may have been used to pierce the shells of the eggs of waning dinosaurs. According to some authorities, many of the early mammals were arboreal, denizens perhaps of estuarine and swampy forests. The advantage of such a habitat or mode of life is suggested by the scant vegetation of the arid ground. Archaic Mammals During the geological Middle Ages, Mesozoic, the mammals did not make much headway. Their opportunity was not yet. It was still the age of reptiles. The mammals continued a little folk, probably for the most arboreal, keeping out of the way of the huge carnivorous dinosaurs stalking terrors such as the world never saw before nor since as a matter of fact however the giants disappeared and the pygmies had their innings with the dawn of the tertiary time the mammals began to possess the earth their giant enemies had gone and it is probable that the vegetative conditions became more favorable 
the grass began to spread like a garment over the earth. Modern Types of Mammals Progress was at first very gradual. The early tertiary mammals were still pygmies and with very small brains, but the point is that they began to radiate out into old-fashioned marsupials, carnivores, and hooved mammals, some of the last attaining elephantine dimensions. As the primitive and archaic mammals disappeared, they rose up in their stead the mammals of the modern type. With better brains and more plastic feet and teeth, we refer to such families as cats, horses, elephants, and monkeys. The original headquarters were probably in some northern or circumpolar land, which enjoyed a warm and equable climate. THE EGG-LAYING MAMMALS There are three strange Australian mammals that occupy a position quite by themselves. The duck mole, ornithorhynchus, the spiny ant-eater, echidna, and another ant-eater, prochidna. They differ from all other mammals inasmuch as they lay eggs, thereby harking back to the habit of many reptiles. In the form of their shoulder girdle, in their relatively large eggs with much yolk, in their very variable temperature, and in many other ways, they betray their affinity with reptiles, and they must be regarded as very primitive mammals, persisting from ancient days. The duck mole, or duck-billed platypus, eighteen to twenty inches in length, lives beside lakes and streams, and grubs at the bottom or among waterweed for small animals, which it collects in cheek pouches, and chews at leisure with its eight horny tooth plates. For its true teeth do not last for more than a year, its forefeet are webbed, and it is a clever swimmer and diver. But the feet are also clawed, and the quaint creature makes a long burrow in the bank with two openings, one above and one under the water. The jaws are flattened like the bill of a duck, and covered with soft sensitive skin, expanded into a flexible collar where the bill joins the rest of the skull. The eyes are small, the ear holes are closed by a flap. The tail is strong and helps in swimming. The brownish fur is short and soft. The animal can roll itself up into a living ball and sleeps in this attitude. In the recesses of the burrow, two eggs are laid, each about three-quarters of an inch long, enclosed in a flexible white shell, through which the young one has to break its way. There are no teats or mammae for the young one to suck, and the milk simply oozes out by numerous pores on a bare patch of skin on the ventral surface of the mother. It is licked up by the offspring, a very primitive arrangement. The spiny anteaters live in rocky regions and burrow rapidly with very strong claws. They seem almost to sink into the ground. When they get among rough herbage, they take firm hold with their feet and are very difficult to dislodge. The snout is prolonged into a slender tube through which a mobile, sticky, worm-like tongue is protruded on the ants which form the staple food. No traces of teeth are to be seen, even in the embryo. As in the duck mole, the male has a well-developed spur on the hind leg, perforated by the duct of a gland, but its use is obscure. The egg seems to be placed by the mother in a temporarily developed pouch, which is said to be comparable to a greatly enlarged teat of the type seen in the cow. Within this pouch the milk oozes out. There are no stranger animals in existence than the duck mole and the spiny ant-eaters. They might almost be called living fossils. The pouch-bearing mammals. The second grade among present-day mammals is that of marsupials, which are now confined to Australia except in the case of two families, the American possums and selvas. In most cases the female has a pouch or marsupium developed around the mammae, and in this pocket the prematurely born young are stowed away and carried about till they are able to fend for themselves. In many possums the pouch is absent, and the mother carries the young ones on her back, with their tails coiled round hers, a quaint device. In marsupials in general, the young ones are born very helpless, unable even to suck. The mother takes her young one in her mouth and puts it into her skin pouch, within which lie the teats or mammae. The mother adjusts matters so that the mouth of the young one closes on a teat, which then swells a little, and as the prematurely born offspring cannot suck, she injects the milk down the gullet by contracting a special musculature. The milk might go down the wrong way and choke the offspring, were it not that the glottis, the entrance to the windpipe, is shunted forward in the young creature so as to press against the posterior nostrils at the back of the mouth. Thus breathing goes on undisturbed by the injection of milk. A similar adaptation is seen in the baleen whale, another mammal, when it is rushing through the water with its great mouth agape, and also in the crocodile, 
a reptile, not a mammal, when it is drowning its prey. Playing Possum As an individual example of marsupial, we may take the possum, Didelphus, which Mr. Ingersoll calls a grey, grunting, snarling, pilfering, dunderheaded, and motherly creature. It is not a good type, for it is American, not Australian, and in most of the species of the genus the pouch is conspicuous by its absence. But the possum was the first marsupial to be known to the civilized world. Possums are mainly arboreal and insectivorous, but there is considerable variety of habitat and diet. They are notorious for playing possum, and we wish to incorporate what Ingersoll says of a pouched species in regard to this puzzling ruse in his Wit of the Wild, 1921. A mother possum will face up to an enemy that threatens her half-grown young, and male possums will fight to the death at the courting time. So the creature does not lack courage. If it detects danger in advance, and every hand is against it, it will hasten up a tree and hide. So the creature does not lack discretion. In other cases, just what or when it would be hard to define exactly, but apparently in the presence of something so large as to make resistance idle, the animal, when attacked or cornered, will fall limp and dead. You may roll the creature about with your foot, explore the pouch, pick it up and carry it by its tail, offer it almost any indignity. And it will, in most cases, neither resist nor complain, but take your eyes off it as it lies upon the ground, and it will soon jump up and scuttle away. Or, if you pick it up carelessly enough, to give it a chance, it may nip you savagely. But the question is inevitable. Of what service is the ruse? Would the carnivore, or bird of prey that liked possum flesh, dogs won't touch it, care whether the creature is dead or pretending to be dead? Mr. Ingersoll's ingenious suggestion is that playing possum is an instinct that arose in the geological Middle Ages in relation to the dull-witted big reptiles. As a rule, land reptiles do not feed on carrion, and that it persists nowadays as an anachronism in circumstances where it is oftener fatal than protective. The placental mammals. The third grade of modern mammals includes the carnivores, the hoofed animals, the monkeys, and so on, to all of which the term placental is applied. In adaptation to the difficulties of terrestrial life, there has been an evolution of viviparous arrangements. The monotremes, as we have seen, lay eggs. The marsupials bring forth their young prematurely. The placentals have established a more or less prolonged antenatal partnership between the mother and the unborn young. The linking structure between the two is the placenta, which brings some of the blood vessels of the unborn young, or fetus, into close contact, although not union, with the blood vessels in the wall of the mother's womb, or uterus. No solid particle, unless it be a living microbe or a wandering white blood corpuscle, can pass from the mother to the offspring, but there is a transfusion of fluid and gaseous material between the two partners. What does the offspring get from its mother? dissolved, nutritive material, oxygen, water, salts, and some subtle chemical messengers called hormones. What does the offspring give to the mother? Dissolved waste materials, carbon dioxide, watery fluid, and again some hormones. The mother gives much and gets little, but it seems justifiable to say that the internal secretions or hormones contributed by the unborn offspring to the mother assist in her health and enable her to make the most of her food. Before the young one is born, chemical messengers have been carried by the blood to the mother's mammary glands, so that they are stimulated to begin the production of milk. There is much of this physiological telegraphy in the business of living. It is probable that the long-drawn-out antenatal development has greatly favored the improvement of the brain. Thus everyone knows how wide awake a foal is after its long sleep of eleven months within its mother's womb. But it must be added that the structure of the brain in placental mammals had got on to lines much more promising than in marsupials. Granting this, we seem justified in saying that the prolonged gestation, plainly adapted to the exigencies of terrestrial life, opened up the possibility of being born with an advanced brain equipment. In the same way, the prolonged infancy, familiar in mankind, has its great rewards as well as its great risks. It is interesting that mammals should bear a name that emphasizes the mother's breasts, and this strikes a true biological note, for the success of mammals is wrapped up with their maternal care, taken in conjunction with improved brains. To the difficulties and limitations implied in the struggle for existence, some mammals have answered back by evolving teeth and horns, 
others by evolving swiftness, others by evolving armor, others by evolving wings, but the answer back that is common to them all is the maternal sacrifice and devotion. End of section 14《Section 15 of the Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. — The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. — Chapter 5. Natural History 2. Mammals. — Part 2. — Many Habitats. Like the reptiles before them, mammals have sought out many habitats and have become adapted to as many modes of life. Perhaps it was in the trees that they served their apprenticeship. In any case, they have tried all possible haunts, entering every open door of opportunity. This is what Professor H. F. Osborne calls adaptive radiation, and he distinguishes as many as twelve habitats. There are terrestrial mammals, walking like the elephants, running like the antelopes, jumping like the kangaroos. But some are burrowers as well as runners, as rabbits well illustrate. Then there are thorough-going burrowers like the moles, which have conquered the underground world. Some are as much at home in water as on dry land. We think of the roving otter and the polar bear. Perhaps a separate division may be made for those mammals that frequent streams, after the manner of beavers and the familiar water vole which can hardly be saved from its popular name of water rat. The shore of the sea is the habitat of seal, sea otter, and walrus. The open sea mammals are the cetaceans, large and small, from whalebone whale to porpoise. Professor Osborne takes the deep-diving finback whales as examples of mammals that actually explore the great abysses, but this is perhaps stretching a point. Then there are the betwixt and between mammals, transitional between arboreal and terrestrial life, like the macaque monkeys and the gorilla. Strictly arboreal types are well represented by squirrels, tree sloths, and lemurs. The volplaning flying squirrels and flying phalangers form another interesting betwixt and between group, essaying the conquest of the air in their daring parachuting from tree to tree. Finally, the bats are true flyers, aerial mammals. It is useful to recognize this variety of habitat, for it shows how diverse the life of mammals must be, and the impression of diversity grows when we remember that in most habitats there are several distinct possibilities of food-getting. Thus, a mole is a carnivorous burrower, while a vole is a vegetarian burrower. A small bat is an insectivorous flying mammal, while a big bat is usually a fruit-eater. It is very interesting to find that almost every haunt and diet illustrated by mammals has also been utilized by reptiles either living or extinct. This suggests that evolution has proceeded on an ever-ascending spiral. Birds and mammals have evolved, as we have already said, on entirely different tacks, but it is not unprofitable to notice that they have often made the same kinds of experiments. The ostrich is a running bird, the antelope a running mammal, the owl is a nocturnal bird, the hedgehog is a nocturnal mammal, the storm petrel is an open-sea bird, the dolphin an open-sea mammal. The sand martin is a burrowing bird, the mole a burrowing mammal, and so on. For a long time there were no flying mammals to vie with the flying birds, but eventually there was the evolution of bats, doubtless from an arboreal insectivorous stock. Aquatic Mammals It is instructive to consider some of the thousand and one ways in which mammals are especially adapted to the various haunts and conditions in which they live, but only a few illustrations can be given, beginning with aquatic mammals. In Wales, the tail has been transformed into a propeller, which sculls the water first to one side and then to the other, and great speed is attained in swimming and diving. With these swimming powers is associated the almost worldwide distribution of many cetaceans, like the sperm whale and the southern right whale. In seals, the hind limbs are bound up with the tail, a conjoint propeller which churns the water from side to side being the result. In the walrus the hind limbs are helped by the great paddle-like forelimbs, which are also used for clambering on the slippery ice. The common seal has a remarkable way of moving on land. It arches up its body, bringing the hind limbs and tail towards the head, and then suddenly straightens itself away, thus jerking the body forward. 
In swimming, the beaver uses its trowel-like flattened tail, the duck mole has webbed fingers, the water shrew has special hairs on the sole and toes of its hind foot, which are spread out like a comb in swimming, but become oppressed when the little creature runs on land. The long tail of the water shrew serves as a rudder. It is somewhat flattened vertically, and bears a fringe of long hair on its ventral surface. The adaptations to aquatic life are many. Thus there is often a reduction of friction by the disappearance of external ears, as in seal and whale. Hair is almost quite gone in cetaceans, though those that remain about the mouth may be very useful in their exquisite tactility. The absence of hair, which normally serves as a non-conducting robe, is compensated for by the development of a layer of blubber, just an exaggeration of the deposit of fat, panniculus adiposus, which is formed under the skin in most mammals, the common hair a noteworthy exception. The mother whales have an arrangement for giving their baby a huge mouthful of milk at a gulp, for suckling cannot be very easy in the open sea. It is said that the northern right whale may remain under water for an hour and twenty minutes, and in adaptation to this prolonged immersion there is a huge chest cavity and also a development of wonderful networks, retia mirabilia, of arteries which store pure blood and keep the tissues oxygenated when respiration in the ordinary sense has come to a standstill. According to Lilly, a rorqual may remain eight to twelve hours under water, and it is possible that in this case a sort of skin respiration, familiar in frogs, for instance, is effected by means of numerous very vascular longitudinal ridges on the underside of the rorqual's throat. Besides the positive fitnesses, of which some illustrations have been given, there are negative adaptations. Thus, in thoroughly aquatic mammals such as whales there can be no smelling, and the olfactory organ is naturally degenerate. For what is useless is rarely conserved. Or, again, the cetaceans which have their eyes constantly washed with water have no third eyelid, which is used in other mammals, except man and monkeys, for cleaning the front of the eye. Subterranean Mammals As life on the surface of the earth is attended by great risks, which have to be met by special adaptations, it is not surprising that many mammals should seek refuge underground, or should combine terrestrial and subterranean habits. Of adaptations to thoroughgoing subterranean life, the mole is perhaps the finest instance. Its hand is turned into a strong shovel, with which it literally swims in the earth. To the inside of the thumb there is a special sickle bone, which broadens the digging surface. The breast muscles are like an athlete's, and those of the very short neck are well suited for tossing the earth. There are no projecting ear-trumpets, for these would be much in the way. The eye, unnecessary in darkness, is reduced to a pinhead size, one twenty-fifth of an inch in diameter, and is protected from injury by being well hidden in the hair of the head. The position of the nostril rather under the tip of the snout and a lip-fold in front of the mouth serve to keep the earth out. The hair of the body has no set and is easily kept clean. Moreover, it does not get disordered when the burrower moves backwards. The crowns of the back teeth are covered with sharp cusps most admirably suited for crunching insect larvae and the like. Truly, the mole is a bundle of adaptations. The common mole burrows in soft soil, and its hand is therefore broad, but the Cape Golden Mole and the quite unrelated marsupial mole burrow in hard soil, and their hands are very narrow, with a great strengthening of two of the fingers. This is plainly as it should be, and the impression of fitness grows when we consider details. Thus, the marsupial mole, which presses its head into the earth, has its neck vertebrae solidified. The Mole We have mentioned the mole's adaptation to subterranean life, but this extraordinarily interesting mammal claims further attention. It is not only a bundle of adaptations, it is an antiquity. It was long ago one of the discoverers of the underworld. It ranges successfully from mole to Japan. It lives an unusually strenuous life. It has the charm of elusiveness and idiosyncrasies. It has four modes of locomotion. Ordinarily it swims deeply in the earth, using its hands to force the earth to either side, and scratching backwards with its hind feet. It can burrow for a considerable distance without making a molehill. Secondly, when there is food, e.g. leather jackets, the larvae of the crane fly or daddy longlegs, to be got near the surface, the mole works along in a shallow groove, often breaking to the open and leaving a discernible track. In this shallow burrowing it uses its head and strong muscular neck a good deal, tossing the earth upwards and to the side, in a way that recalls the old name moody warp or mold tosser. 
Thirdly, it can run about on the surface at the rate of about two and a half miles an hour, and the pairing takes place above ground. It must also be able to trot along in those underground runs which have some permanence, e.g. the bolt run from the headquarters. As to this so-called fortress, it consists of a roughly spherical nest about the size of one's head, filled with leaves and grass. Above and around this resting place there is a mound made of the earth which has been dug out, and traversing this there are tunnels or galleries which were made in transporting the excavated earth, and may connect with the bolt run or other radiating paths. No two fortresses show the same plan of galleries. Their symmetry and significance have been exaggerated. They are simply the necessary outcome of making a comfortable resting place and piling up the excavated material. According to some naturalists, an elaborate fortress is made by the males only. The sexes live apart, and the well-lined nest made by the female in May is usually under an inconspicuous hillock. The young ones, usually four or five in number, are pink and naked to start with, and very helpless. But the development is unusually rapid, the infantile period being telescoped down and the offspring are able in five weeks to follow their mother and begin mining. The full-grown males are very combative. Indeed, there is a good deal of suppressed fury in any mole. Everything they do is done with vigor and zest, moving, feeding, fighting, everything. A mole has been known to displace a nine-pound brick on a smooth surface, which for an animal weighing three ounces is equivalent to a man of twelve stone moving an object weighing three tons twelve hundred weight. Francis Pitt, Wild Creatures of Hedgerow and Garden, 1920. The mole's vigor must be correlated with its extraordinary good digestion. A mole can easily dispose of its own weight in earthworms in a day, and adults require food every three or four hours. A mole that was fed with forty earthworms late in the afternoon was found dead next morning with an empty stomach. Arboreal Mammals Whether the earliest mammals were arboreal or not, it is a mode of life which many have adopted and it has obvious advantages, of increasing the freedom of movement, of securing a relatively safe retreat, and of making a nest a possibility. In many cases, as in a wild cat, the sharp claws are well suited for holding on to the branches. The squirrel runs up the trunk, gripping with its claws, but looking as if it did not need to hold on, and its bushy tail is of use as a rudder when it takes an adventurous leap from tree to tree. In some cases, however, there are specially attaching structures, Thus the extraordinary lemur, called the Tarsius specter, has disc-like suckers on its fingers and toes. Sometimes there is a splitting of the hand and foot which give the limb a secure grip of the branch, and the same result may be reached by having an opposable first digit like our own thumb. The tree sloths show yet another method, for their claws are greatly elongated into hooks, and by means of these they move cautiously along, back downwards, hanging to the underside of the branches. It is interesting to notice how many features of these strange creatures have been altered in relation to their upside-down mode of progression. Thus, they can bend their head round so as to look downwards over their shoulder. The neck is very mobile, and in some species has nine instead of the usual seven vertebrae. The shaggy hair hangs down in a unique way, and its suggestion of a mass of fibrous plants may be enhanced by the presence of a green alga. One of the most effective adaptations to arboreal life is the most familiar namely, the prehensile tail of many monkeys. In the spider monkey, Ateles, the tail is used not only to support the whole body, but actually as a fifth hand for grasping the food. Again we get an impression of the plasticity of the animal structure, the same part being turned and twisted to so many different uses. The squirrel. It may be doubted if there is any climbing mammal with more all-around attractiveness than the common squirrel. It is small without being pygmyish, the bushy tail balances the body. The rich brown-red upper coloring is very pleasing. The ear tufts present during the colder half of the year make the creature look even more alert than it is. Its movements take one's breath away. Its table manners are perfect, for it sits upright, holding its food daintily in its hands. It neatly unshells the kernel of the nut. It even removes the thin outer pellicle before it begins to munch. Everyone knows how the squirrel passes from tree to tree, but it may also press its body against the stem, and remain perfectly still. When it sleeps it uses its tail as a blanket. The security of its life probably adds to the gaiety of its disposition, for it is one of the playing animals, enjoying what looks like tig among the branches. Squirrels usually pair early in spring. Two or three blind and naked young ones are born in a large nest of moss and leaves and twigs, which the monogamous parents build among the branches. 
There is strong maternal care and courage, and when danger presses, the mother may carry one baby after another in her mouth to some place of safety. There is considerable instruction in athletics and woodcraft. When winter comes, the squirrel does not hibernate, though on a very cold morning it may sleep late within the hollow tree. It still finds seeds and shoots to eat, and when these are scanty it searches about for the caches of nuts it made in September and October, and forgot all about. Too much has been made of the squirrel's thrift. THE AERIAL MAMMALS Although the scanty fossil remains of bats have revealed nothing as to their ancestry, it seems safe to say that they evolved from an insectivore stock. Specialized as they are for flight, they show numerous affinities with tree shrews and the like. The vacillating rapid flight is familiar, and in some bats the power of flight is enough to enable them to migrate as birds do. In relation to the bat's twilight habits, the sense of touch is highly developed on the wing and about the nose and ears, so that obstacles like branches are avoided. Perhaps there is a pressure sense distinct from touch, for bats often swerve to one side before they are near the obstacle. It has been suggested that the bat's cry of short-length sound waves has a sort of echo from surfaces, and that this warns the bat from collision. There is usually only one young one at a time, an important restriction for a flying mother that has to carry the offspring about with her after birth as well as before. The back teeth of small bats bear sharp cusps, well suited for crunching insects, and a crowning adaptation may be found in the winter sleep of the bats of northern countries. Vampires The large bats, sometimes called flying foxes, ranging from Madagascar to Queensland, are all fruit eaters. The small bats are typically insect eaters, but some are carnivorous, a few take fruit, and a few are bloodsuckers. In the vampire, Desmodos fusus, which feeds on blood, the gullet is so narrow that nothing but fluid could pass down. In his Edge of the Jungle, 1921, Mr. William Beebe gives a graphic description of the vampires of British Guiana. They entered the bungalow at night and flew about, fanning the faces of the inmates, but for a time never touching. Eventually one would settle down on an exposed foot or arm and creep on it, pushing with the feet and pulling with the thumbs, after the usual bat fashion, but so gently that the only sensation was a slight tickling and tingling. All this was preparatory to a small bite which would not awaken a sleeper. British bats are all insectivorous. They congregate in considerable numbers in trees, caves, roofs, and holes in towers, but the sexes usually live apart. While typically nocturnal, they are occasionally seen in daylight, and similarly, while they typically hibernate in winter, they are often seen if there is a spell of mild weather at that season. Mammals of Deserts and Steps The essential quality of dwellers in the desert is a capacity for rapid movements, to find herbage in a new area, to get out of a dry and parched land, and to flee from enemies where there is no possibility of concealment. Thus, it is profitable to have long legs, a strong heart, good wind and keen senses. The fleet antelope may serve as a type, and there is a touch of perfection in the elusive jerboa. Its long jumps must be disconcerting to an enemy, and the tuft of strong hair on the foot keeps this attractive biped from sinking into the loose sand when it alights from its flying jump. Another feature, well illustrated by the gazelle, is the spareness of build. The limbs are all muscle, muscle as hard as steel. There is, however, great elasticity in the skeleton of the forelimbs and in the connection of the shoulder-blade to the backbone. It is easy to interpret the reduction in the number of digits as a lessening of friction, and the same might be said in regard to the transformation of claws into hoofs, but some of the peculiarities of desert animals are not so easily explained. Are the markedly swollen nostrils of gazelles and their relatives adapted to facilitate respiration in their racing, or have they to do with filtering the air from the driven sand? Opinions seem to be very discrepant in regard to the protective value of the coloration of desert animals. A sandy brown shade is certainly very common, and apparent exceptions such as zebras may admit of ready explanation. In the open the zebra can look after itself and show quick heels. In the oasis it may be that the striping is very inconspicuous. It is said that the huge giraffes are very inconspicuous in a grove of acacia trees. The two-humped Bactrian camel and the one-humped Arabian dromedary show various fitnesses for sandy deserts. Thus, the two toes have short nails instead of hoofs, and are almost embedded in a strongly developed expansible sole pad with an elastic cushion between it and the bones. The result is a surface which expands under pressure and is well suited for moving over the loose sand. 
In the closely related llamas from the Andes, each toe has its own sole pad, which is adapted for the mountain paths. Many desert animals can go for a long time without food or drink, and this is especially true of dromedaries. In the paunch of these animals, and in camels, there are numerous side pockets with narrow openings which can be closed by circular muscles, and these become filled with fluid. But we must not make too much of this, for the water pockets are also seen in the llama. Indeed, there are traces of them in the American peccary, which is related to the family of pigs. What has happened in the case of the camel and dromedary is probably that special and adaptive use has been made of what was already present apart from desert conditions altogether. More unique is the development of a hump or of two humps, consisting chiefly of fat. When the animal obtains for a time a considerable quantity of moist herbage, the hump stands up tensely. When supplies are scanty, the hump is reduced in size and becomes flabby. Another adaptation may be found in the camel's power of completely closing its nostrils during a sandstorm. Mountain Mammals Really great mountains often show three zones of forest, of steppe-land with scanty vegetation, and of barren grounds or tundra in the higher altitudes. Thus we find, among mountain mammals, forest forms like bears and some monkeys, steppe forms like chamois and yak, and tundra forms like marmots and snow voles. Many of the mountain mammals are of very hardy constitution, with thick fur, with great climbing powers, and with a capacity for enduring severe conditions and a starvation diet. Many are refugees from the low grounds, and some, like the mountain beaver, are very old-fashioned primitive types. The mountain hare The variable, or mountain hare, is a first cousin of the common hare, and is nowadays a distinctively northern mammal. When the ice sheet was thick over the mountains of central Europe, the variable hare lived in the low grounds. When the climate became milder, it had to retreat, either further north or up the mountains. It became extinct in England, but has been reintroduced with success. Compared with the common hare, it is smaller as a whole, and in its head, ears, hind legs, and tail. Its flesh is whiter, it is a less dainty feeder. It does not seem to have any particular home or form, but shifts about relentlessly from one hiding place to another. When the snow is deep it is forced to descend to lower levels. In Scotland it usually turns white in winter, all but the black tips of its ears. In Ireland there is not usually any seasonal change of color. The Story of the Snow Mouse One of the most definitely mountain-haunting mammals is the snow mouse, or accurately, snow vole, Microtus nivalis, of the high Alps. It is a little creature about five inches long in body and two more in tail usually rusty gray or whitish gray in color. Perhaps it has the honor of living a harder life than any other mammal, for it is rare below four thousand feet, and it ascends from the snow line to the tops of the mountains. It does not migrate in winter, it does not hibernate, and it does not turn white. In fact, its only adaptation to its snowy retreats is that in the summer it gathers to its nest among the loose rocks a store of chopped grass and gentian roots. In winter, it makes tortuous burrows beneath the snow, mining its way from one alpine plant to another. It has the reward of freedom from enemies, for even birds of prey are scarce at these heights. The explanation of the habitat is interesting. The snow mouse used to be one of the tundra animals, like the reindeer and arctic fox, that frequented the low grounds of central Europe when the uplands were covered by a great ice sheet. As the climate became milder and the ice sheet melted, some of the tundra animals, like the reindeer and arctic fox, retreated northwards but the snow mouse went up the mountains higher and higher. Thus we also understand why they have today a scattered distribution, separated by extensive mountainous tracts where none occur. This corresponds to some extent to separate migrations from the low grounds. It also has to do with the available vegetation, for the hardy snow mouse must eat something. Mammals show a thousand and one adaptations connected with procuring and utilizing their food, and we cannot give more than a few illustrative examples. End of section 15. Section 16 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 13, Natural History 2, Mammals, Part 3. Food Getting Among Mammals. The great ant-eater, Myrmecophaga, of South America, comes out at night 
and with its exceedingly powerful claws breaks into the earthen hills of the termites. Then out and in whips the thread-like sticky tongue, drawing hundreds of insects in a short time into the absolutely toothless mouth. The same kind of tongue is seen in other anteaters, such as the Advac of South Africa and the oviparous echidna, which is also absolutely toothless. The whalebone whale, or whatever kind, swims open-mouthed through the surface waters, engulfing myriads of small sea snails and the like in the huge gaping cavern. The small animals are caught on the frayed edges of the baleen plates, exaggerated horny ridges of the palate which hang downwards from the roof of the mouth. Every now and then the whale raises its tongue and brushes a multitude of the entangled creatures towards the back of its mouth, where they are gripped by the pharynx and swallowed. The water streams out at the sides of the mouth through the sieve of whalebone, but some of it would be apt to go the wrong way, were it not that the whale shunts its glottis, the opening to the windpipe, forward to embrace the posterior end of the nasal passage. What a contrast is such a mouth to that of a toothed whale, like the sperm whale and the dolphin, with teeth well suited for seizing cuttlefishes and fishes. Yet it is interesting to notice that the whalebone whale has before birth two sets of teeth, which never cut the gum. The adaptations of the teeth of mammals to different kinds of food-getting are many, but from a few we may learn all. In the gnawing animals or rodents, such as rats, beavers, porcupines, and squirrels, the enamel is either confined to the front of the incisors, or it is much more strongly developed in front than it is behind. Thus the posterior part of the tooth wears away faster than the anterior part, so that a chisel edge is automatically formed. The lower incisors strike in behind the upper ones, and this keeps the enamel edge sharp. Moreover, these teeth are rootless, and go on persistently growing as they are worn away. In the gap behind the incisors, where canines should be, an enfolding of the skin into the mouth cavity separates a front portion from a back portion. Thus material which is being gnawed, but not intended to be swallowed, may be kept from going beyond the front region of the mouth. Some of the rodents, like the gopher, store what they gnaw in capacious cheek pouches, and grind this with their back teeth when they get into a place of safety. No one can look at an elephant using its trunk without recognizing a new idea. The employment of the nose, and a prolongation of the upper lip as well, as a food-getting organ. This is nature's way, making an apparently new thing out of something very old, and it is evident, from the remains of extinct elephants, that the trunk or proboscis had a gradual evolution, proceeding in correlation with that of the huge tusks which prevent the mouth getting close to things in the usual way. The efficiency of the trunk is greatly increased by a very mobile, finger-like process at the tip, which enables the elephant to handle little things as well as to lift great logs. The trunk of the elephant is a masterpiece, and the initial stages may be discerned not only in the evolutionary history, but in the short proboscis of the taper, and even in the sensitive snout of the pig, which is used for rooting in the earth in search of food. There is a special snout bone, prenasal, in pig and mole, but the risk of hasty interpretation in terms of fitness may be illustrated by the fact that the same bone occurs in the taper, which does not root in the earth, and also in tree sloths. The bone in question is probably a primitive feature, for the taper, for instance, is a very archaic animal. In such cases, like the elephant shrew, the proboscis is a puzzle. We do not know its use. The elephant. The elephant type, now represented by two species, the African and the Indian, exhibits many zoological peculiarities, besides the familiar trunk and tusks. Thus the limbs are quite unique among living mammals in their straightness. They form vertical pillars adapted to support the huge weight of the body. But there is even greater interest in the ways of the creature. According to Sir William Baker, Wild Beasts in Their Ways, 1890, the African elephant can charge for a short distance at the rate of 15 miles an hour, and keep up the rate of 10 miles an hour for a long run. The tusks which form the weapons of the males in their furious combats are used by both sexes in everyday life for digging up roots for food. It is said that an elephant does not reach proper maturity till it is forty years old, and that it may live far over a century. It is one of the slowest of breeders, and carries its young for twenty-two months before birth. Yet we recall Darwin's calculation that after a period of seven hundred and fifty years there would be nearly nineteen million elephants alive, descended from a single pair. 
the cerebral hemispheres of the big brain are richly convoluted and the creature is so intelligent that elephant stories are proverbial of its memory of its capacity for learning both in peace and war and of its practical judgment there is no doubt chewing the cud some of the hoofed animals such as cattle sheep and deer illustrate an interesting peculiarity called chewing the cud or rumination these animals feed as every one knows on grass and herbage and it is often important for them to eat as much as they can in a short time a choice patch must be utilized to the full and there was always the danger of an attack from carnivores so the ancestors of our sheep and cattle got into the habit of gorging themselves with hastily swallowed grass and then of retiring to the place of safety often with their backs against a rock so that they could not be surprised from behind there at leisure they rechewed their hasty meal the so-called stomach of a typical ruminant such as sheep or cow consists of four chambers the first is the capacious paunch or rumen the internal surface of which is thickly beset with tag-like processes suggesting velvet pile it is here that the grass is stored it is acted upon by the salivary juice which has followed it down and there is also some bacterial fermentation the second chamber the honeycomb bag or reticulum is marked by a hexagonal pattern and it rarely contains more than sappy fluid the third chamber the many pleas or saltarium has numerous plates filling up its cavity so that the food has to pass through a kind of filter the fourth chamber the reed or obesum is the seat of gastric digestion in fact it is the true stomach for the preceding three chambers turn out to be elaborations of the lower end of the gullet or esophagus this is known by the minute structure of their walls for there is no confusing the non-glandular gullet region with the very glandular stomach region what happens in rumination the cow lying slightly on one side returns boluses of food from the paunch to the mouth where they are very thoroughly masticated and moistened with saliva if we watch a cow we can see these boluses or rounded masses of vegetable matter travelling up the gullet with considerable rapidity after the thorough chewing the food is re-swallowed and passes down for the second time the muscles of the gullet working in a manner the exact opposite of that exhibited when the boluses pass up on the second descent the food skips the paunch in the honeycomb bag there being automatic arrangements for preventing entrance and travels along a groove into the menopes filtering through this third chamber it reaches the true stomach and is subjected to gastric digestion overloading a stomach sometimes leads to vomiting an automatic means of getting relief and although the paunch is not stomach it is difficult to refrain from suggesting that the first part of the cud chewing process may be a sort of normalized vomiting nowadays the whole series of steps is reflex or automatic but it is interesting to notice that if the cow is disturbed in the middle of its cud chewing it is not a little put about and is often unable to resume the process for a considerable time such disturbance is of course injurious to the animal's health weapons of mammals many mammals use their teeth especially their canines as weapons the walrus strikes downwards with tremendous force the wild boar lunges upwards with the canines of both jaws pointing up in the asiatic babirusa the upper canines though pointing up are curved so far backwards that they form more of a shield than a weapon in male musk deer and in the likewise hornless but quite unrelated deerlets the canines are strongly developed and are used in fighting in elephants the great tusks are front teeth or incisors the use of the six-foot long left canine of the male narwhal remains obscure besides their teeth mammals may use as weapons their claws and their hoofs and various kinds of horns the rhinoceros has a horn that belongs wholly to the skin like a huge wart that has become very hard the horns of cattle sheep and deer have a core of bone growing from the forehead or frontal covered by an integumentary hollow sheath or horn in the giraffe and the okapi the sheath over the gray outgrowth does not turn into horn the story of antlers antlers deserve a place by themselves they are restricted to stags with the single exception of the reindeer where they occur in both sexes they are not seen in the buck's first year when there is only a small permanent skin-covered bony outgrowth on the forehead called the pedicle which grows in girth in subsequent years in the second year there is an extraordinarily rapid multiplication of bone-forming cells on the top of the pedicle 
and a short unbranched antler is formed, which carries upward the hot skin or velvet. The blood vessels in the velvet supply the food which admits of the rapid growth of the skin, and they also keep the growing antler tissue suitably warm. The materials for the growth of the antler itself are brought by internal blood vessels from the pedicle or stalk. Branches from the fifth brain nerve run up the velvet and make it exquisitely sensitive, an adaptation that saves the stag from knocking the still soft antlers against hard objects. In ordinary deer the antlers are as transient as the leaves of the forest. They drop off and there is a new growth next year. The second antler has a stem and one branch or tine, and a new tine is added each successive year until the stag reaches maturity, after which the antler growth becomes irregular. The shedding of the antlers is an extraordinary process. It is prepared for from the start by automatic arrangements which cut off the supply of blood from the velvet, obliterate the internal blood vessels, and form at the base a soft tissue which loosens the organic connections between the dead antler and the living pedicle. The dying away of the base of the antler would be called disease in other animals. It has become mysteriously regularized in stags. The whole process is extraordinary. The growth of a fine head, perhaps seventy pounds in weight, takes place in three months. An expensive utilization of material called into activity by chemical messengers, hormones, from the reproductive organs. The splendid result is hardly finished before the operations begin for its being shed and after all the antlers do not seem to be of much practical importance, they are exuberant outcrops of the male's virile constitution. Perhaps they have their counterpart in the male narwhal's spear. THE RED DEER Britain has lost the reindeer and the giant deer, a fine creature of the ancient forests, but it still has the red deer, Cervus alaphus, which is genuinely wild in some parts of the country. It stands about four feet high at the withers, and the veteran stag has truly magnificent antlers, which are called royal when they have over twelve points or branches. The stags are very combative at the breeding season, September and October, and may be dangerous to man. They are greatly excited and roar loudly, challenging other males. In their ferocious combats, they push with the antlers as a whole, or they stab at the heart and belly with the lowest branch or brown tine, which points forwards and upwards. A good deal of use is also made of the hooves, especially those of the forefeet. Each stag tries to attach to himself as many females as he can. The fawn is born in May or June, spotted as in most deer. It is carefully guarded by the mother, who teaches it to conceal itself when it hears the danger signal, a tap with the forefoot. In the summer months the hinds and fawns usually live apart from the stags, and often at a lower level. Although we associate the red deer with the highland hills, to which they are well adapted in their strength and swiftness of limb, in their close-set coat and in their wonderfully keen senses of smell, sight, and hearing, they were originally forest mammals rather than mountain mammals. They feed mainly on soft grass and heather shoots, but they have interesting vagaries of appetite, such as gnawing at the cast-off antlers. Like the reindeer of the far north, they sometimes travel a long distance to get an early morning lick at the rocks on the seashore. Protective Adaptations Some of the archaic mammals show a remarkable development of armor. The armadillos are unique in having a bony skin skeleton, which is almost invulnerable, especially when the animal rolls itself up, thanks to the flexible rings in the armor, into an unopenable ball. Very striking is the tiny Pistiago from barren grounds in South America. It has a bony carapace above and on its underparts very beautiful snow-white hair. It has enormous nails on its fingers, by which it is able to burrow very rapidly, and its hind parts have a special, very decorative shield. Hardly less striking are the pangolins, manis, with the body covered, with very hard, overlapping scales or horn, suggestive of a reptile rather than of a mammal. There is an Indian ocean porpoise, which has calcified scales all over its back, and as these are larger before birth than after, it seems safe to interpret them as legacies from a very distant scaly ancestry. It seems that our common porpoise has sometimes very hard tubercles in its skin, and perhaps this also illustrates the hand of the past living on in the present. But there are other kinds of armor besides scales. The porcupine has its long spines, the hedgehog its short ones, and the spiny ant-eater its intermediate between the two. Even in the hide alone there may be considerable strength of armor, 
as in rhinoceros, hippopotamus, and elephant. In many cases no armor is required, for the creature is endowed with relative invisibility, as we have seen in a previous chapter. Nocturnal Mammals Many mammals of long pedigree have adopted a nocturnal mode of life, which gives them additional safety in circumstances more difficult than those to which they were primarily adapted. Thus the otter and the badger owe their survival partly to their nocturnal habits, but it cannot be said that they are in any very marked way adapted to walking in darkness. The Story of the Badger The badger, Melis Taras, has still a firm footing in various parts of Britain, such as Devon and the New Forest. It is a thick-set, round-backed, rather bear-like carnivore, somewhat over two feet in length, with an additional seven inches of tail. It has a long muzzle, well suited for its restlessly inquisitive poking into holes and corners. The short rounded ears are not in the way in the brushwood. There are bright bluish-black eyes. There is below the tail an odiferous gland with a disagreeable smell. The badger stands alone among British mammals in having the under parts darker than the upper, for the under surface is black while the upper surface is tawny, overlain with gray, darkening here and there. The head is practically white divided by a broad black band, beginning between the nose and the eye, and extending back to the ear. In short, the coloring is rather conspicuous, recalling the American skunk. But the badger is elusive, and though it has few enemies, it will work its way in the dusk down a dry ditch or along the side of a hedgerow, rather than across the open. The heavy body does not seem to be lifted much off the ground. The snout is often held very low. The soles of the feet are entirely on the ground, in true plantigrade fashion. Yet the badger's movements have an easy swing, and the creature does not know what it is to be tired. When we ask how the badger manages to survive in a much cultivated and far from friendly country, part of the answer is in the words nocturnal and self-effacing, and possibly evil-smelling. We must add, however, that the badger has strong positive qualities. It is very muscular. It has a strong heart and a good wind. The grip of the lower jaw is unsurpassed in tenacity. The thick coat helps the badger to withstand the cold of winter. It stores a good deal of fat. It is endowed with keen senses, shrewd intelligence, and a capacity for taking things easily without fuss or worry. And yet this is not all. It has an extraordinary catholicity of appetite, which always makes for survival. If one kind of food fails, it can fall back on something else. Roots and fruits, nuts and truffles, worms and grubs, frogs and snakes, eggs and young rabbits, the grubs and the wasps nest, for the badger is impervious to stings, and the honey from the humble-bee's store. Another factor is its burrowing habit, for its earth, or set, goes far in and may have several entrances. It is made comfortable with bracken and herbage, and is kept fairly clean. Moreover, one must attach survival value to the education which the mother badger gives to her silvery-gray cubs. They are usually just two or three of them born in spring. When they have got their sight, some ten days after birth, and had their usual gastric education on milk, they are taken outside the warren and well-groomed. Then comes schooling, and the mother is a stern disciplinarian. She punishes the inattentive and foolhardy, and gradually instructs them in the way in which they should go. The Hedgehog The Hedgehog is an old-fashioned insectivore that holds its own well from Britain to the Ural Mountains. It does so in virtue not of brains or of weapons, but because of other fitnesses. Many of the hairs have been transformed into sharp spines, which are erected by the smooth muscles at their base when the animal is touched. They also serve to break the force of a fall when the hedgehog, a good climber, tumbles from a wall or a tree. A very strong dome of muscles beneath the skin rolls the animal up into an unopenable ball. The senses are acute. The prolonged snout is well suited for probing into holes. There is a wide range of appetite, earthworms, grubs, slugs, and small snails, in the mountain-top, like cusps on the back teeth, are well suited for crunching these. The constitution is very tough, and if the adder, an inveterate enemy of the hedgehog, gets a bite in, the venom has no effect. Experiments with poisons, and with such germs as that of diphtheria, have proved the refractoriness of this common creature. Although it has few enemies, it adds to its safety by resting during the day in a well-hidden recess and hunting by night. There are often two litters, usually of three or four, in the year. And the young is one curious flat and feeble creature, with soft white spines pointing backwards, and a pale blue-gray skin. It is not for some time able to roll itself up. 
yet it develops quickly and is able to follow the mother in a month or two. Hibernation. Many creatures, such as reptiles, amphibians, snails, and insects, pass into a lethargic state when winter sets in, and lie low until the spring. But it is only in mammals that we find true hibernation, a very peculiar physiological condition which is not sleep, nor necessarily connected with winter. It is exhibited by hedgehog and hamster, dormice and bats, marmot and suslik, the spiny anteater of Australia, and the juboa of the Kurzig steppes. To understand the hibernation of so-called winter sleep of these mammals, it is necessary to recall the main facts in regard to animal heat. Inside, the body heat is produced by various chemical processes, but mainly by the muscles. It is of great importance in facilitating the operations of the living laboratory, but the heat tends to be lost by radiation into the outer world through the skin and in the hot breath and in sweating. The non-conducting fur in ordinary mammals and the blubber of whales lessen the loss from the skin, as do the feathers of birds, but there is in birds and mammals a self-regulating system which keeps the temperature approximately constant day and night, year in and year out, and this is what is meant by warm-bloodedness. The regulating center is in the brain, whence orders issue to the muscles, blood vessels, and skin. If too much heat is being produced or lost, an adjustment is effected. But all mammals are not perfect as regards this heat-regulating arrangement, and it is among these that hibernation occurs. A good example may be found in the spiny ant-eater, Echidna, whose temperature may vary 10 degrees centigrade, according to that of the outside world, whereas our temperature varies only by a fraction of a degree as long as we are in good health. Now the spiny ant-eater is a hibernator, and this is the clue we need. Winter-sleeping mammals are imperfectly warm-blooded. When the cold weather sets in, it becomes difficult for them to adjust the debtor and creditor account as regards heat. They cannot produce enough to make up for their loss, and they give up the attempt. They sink back into a state of comparative coldness and cold-bloodedness. They relapse into the ancestral reptilian condition. But if the imperfectly warm-blooded mammals which we have mentioned were to fall asleep in the open, their body temperatures would go down and down and they would die. What they must do is creep into some sheltered nook or comfortably blanketed hole, where the temperature soon becomes much higher than that of the world outside. To this temperature, that of the sleeper's body approximates, without there being any fatal results. Along with the snuggling into a confined space must be taken the great reduction of internal activities. And here hibernation approaches the lethargy of frog and tortoise. Income is nil, so expenditure must be reduced to a minimum. The heart beats feebly, the breathing movements are scarcely perceptible, the excretion or filtering which is the work of the kidneys comes to a standstill. The hibernating body is like a firewell banked up in its own ashes, and in an animal like the hedgehog we know that subtle changes come about in the recesses of the tissues. The gist of the matter is to be found in the three facts. 1. Constitutional imperfection in the temperature-regulating arrangements. 2. A creeping into a confined space which gets warmed up a little. And 3. A great reduction of expenditure, for even the internal activities come almost to a rest. But there are some contributory influences which must be recognized. After the hard work of summer there is naturally some fatigue and a bodily bias towards rest. Moreover, summer has often been a time of plenty, and the body has accumulated stores of fat and other reserves, which may also incline the creature to somnolence. And once the quiescence has begun, it will tend to continue. For the closeness of the retreat must be soporific, and the cessation of the kidney functions will tend to keep the sleepers sleepy. Just as drowsiness sometimes sets in when man's kidneys are not working rightly, so in the hibernating mammal, there may be a poisoning of the body with its own waste products, a sort of auto-intoxication. Yet this is not all. We must not think of hibernation as an individual reaction merely. It expresses a racial rhythm. In the course of thousands of generations, a certain periodicity has been established, like that of our sleepiness at night and wakefulness in the morning. And with the unregistered bodily rhythm, there is associated an instinct which prompts the hibernator to seek out a comfortable corner where the weariness or sleepiness sets in. For ages, it must be remembered, our hedgehogs have not known any winter. They have slept through them all, just as the migratory birds have circumvented them all. 
It must be remembered, too, that the winter sleep or hibernation of an animal like the hedgehog cannot be distinguished from the summer sleep or estivation of the tenrack of Madagascar. Only a few mammals are hibernators, and some of these, like the dormouse, are light sleepers, while others, like the hedgehog, are deep sleepers. In any case, there is some imperfection in the warm-bloodedness, and what has been wrought out is what we might call a rather neat way of making a strength out of a weakness. There is a relapse to a reptilian condition, but this handicap is counteracted. For it is not merely that the difficulties of the winter, scarcity, cold, and storms, are circumvented. The hibernation gives an opportunity for a long rest, which even the food canal may be the better for. There may be an opportunity for processes of recuperation or rejuvenescence to stave off the processes of senescence or aging. Why then are there not more hibernators? The answers must be that hibernation is the answer back made by certain creatures with a constitutional peculiarity. Other mammals meet the winter in other ways. End of part three of chapter thirteen. Section seventeen of the Outline of Science, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 5, Natural History 2, Mammals, Part 4. Section 13, Sex Dimorphism. The contrasts between lion and lioness, between stag and hind, are familiar. They illustrate what is technically called sex dimorphism, i.e., a marked structural difference between male and female. The contrasted characters are called secondary sex characters, to distinguish them from primary sex characters, which have to do more or less directly with the reproductive function itself. The males are sometimes equipped with decorations, the manes of lion and bison, the beards of certain goats, the crests along the back of some antelopes, and the dewlaps of bulls. Or they may have weapons which are either absent in the females or represented in less exuberant development. Thus antlers are restricted to the males except in the case of the reindeer. The horns of bull and ram may be much larger than those of cow and ewe. The male narwhal has a spear-like tusk, which is not developed in the female. There may also be differences in color and in odor. Darwin suggested that when the males fought for the possession of the females, as stags and antelopes do, the males with better weapons would prevail. As they would therefore have most success in leaving progeny, their strong qualities would gradually become racial characters the males with poor weapons would be sifted out. In regard to sex decorations, he suggested that the females would be most interested in, and would give the preference in mating to, the more handsome males, and that the race would therefore evolve in the direction of increased decorativeness. This is, in brief, Darwin's theory of sex selection, which is discussed in the article How Darwinism Stands Today. But one point must be noticed here. If the quality of having strong weapons, or having handsome decorations, is hereditarily transmissible, why does it not appear in the female as well as in the male offspring? How can it be entailed on the male offspring only? The answer must be that the quality is handed on to both sexes, but that it cannot find expression except in a male constitution. Similarly, the foundations of milk glands are part of the inheritance of both sexes, but normally their development is restricted to the females. There are items in the inheritance of both sexes which are like seeds requiring particular kinds of soil, if they are to develop. The male character of antlers, or of shaggy mane, requires a masculine constitution, including the presence or absence of certain hormones, if it is to develop. 
This leads to the view that the secondary sex characters are in their origin bound up with the primary differences of constitution implied in maleness, sperm-producing, and femaleness, egg-producing, respectively. All theory apart, we return to the facts. 1. That the male mammal is often markedly different from his mate. 2. That there are often fierce combats between rival males. And 3. That in certain cases the females seem to show a certain preference, being apparently more excited by some males than by others. It is probably the total get-up that counts, rather than any individual item, such as an extra-long beard. The combats of rival stags are sometimes furious, and the antlers are occasionally interlocked with fatal results to both combatants. A male antelope sometimes punishes an upstart youngster so severely that the blood flows for many wounds. Section 14. Family Life. Some mammals are monogamous, others polygamous, and others promiscuous. The monogamous forms include the chimpanzee, the tarsia specter, the hedgehog, the elephant shrew, rhinchosion, the pangolin, some antelopes, and small deer, and the bandicoot, Paramelis obesula. The polygamous forms include most deer and antelopes, wild cattle and horses, sea lions and elephants. Not infrequently, the males live by themselves, except at the breeding season, as in the case of elephants and stags. An experienced old female leads the hinds and the young. A male, in his prime, leads the stags. Where the pair do not live together throughout the year, and where the care of the family devolves wholly on the mother, the terms monogamous and promiscuous have not much meaning. There is pairing rather than mating. A female mammal may pair with one male one year, and with another next year, or with several in one year. But our knowledge of these matters is sadly lacking in precision. It has to be remembered that in most cases the pairing time is sharply punctuated and of short duration. It is interesting to inquire into family life among apes. The gibbons, Hilobates, of Southeast Asia, are the smallest of the anthropoid apes, rarely over three feet high, but they have disproportionately long arms, the hands touching the ground when the animal stands erect. They are fond of swinging like acrobats below the branches with their arms above their head, they can swing clear for twelve to eighteen feet with the greatest ease, and pass from tree to tree unwearingly. During the day they keep to the treetops, especially on the mountain sides. Towards evening they come cautiously waddling down in the open ground, searching for fruit. Their voice is extraordinarily strong, especially in the males, and not unmusical. They are sociable and talkative. The orang, Simia satyrus, of the forests of Borneo and Sumatra, stands about four feet high, and is very strongly built. It is highly intelligent, but somewhat sluggish in habit, climbing slowly, keeping to the trees except at night, when it sometimes searches on the ground for fallen fruit. It uses its arms as crutches, or goes on all fours. It makes for resting purposes a sort of platform nest of branches, but it moves on and makes another every second day or so. The male orang lives apart, but the mother keeps her family with her for some time. The chimpanzee, Anthropithecus trogloditus, of African equatorial forests may be five feet high, but it is not so bulky as the orang and it is as good a climber as the gibbon. It makes a temporary platform or resting place among the branches. In disposition, it is lively and playful. It is easily tamed, and has a plastic intelligence. The gorilla, also restricted to tropical Africa, may be a little over five feet in height, and is of enormous strength in shoulders and arms. It goes much more on the ground than any of the other anthropoids, and has a shuffling, rolling gait, using the hands a good deal, and keeping the body semi-erect. It fights ferociously with hands and teeth, 
and does not retreat from man. It is said to be gloomy, it beats on its breast when enraged, it has never been tamed. A single adult male usually leads a small company of females and young ones. CARE OF THE YOUNG Some young mammals are born very helpless, blind, naked, and with little power of movement. This implies some sort of seclusion or shelter, such as a burrow or a nest, as in fox and squirrel, respectively. In the case of the rabbit, there are both, for the mother makes a bed of her own fur. During the very helpless infancy, the mother mammal is assiduous beyond telling. In some cases, after a period of suckling, the mother brings animal food to her young ones, and that food is not always dead for the education has to begin early. The play of the kitten, and even of the cat, with the mouse, is doubtless wrapped up with the business of early education. In some cases the young ones are carried about by the mother. Reference has already been made to the marsupials, but there are other instances. A mother hippopotamus is sometimes seen in the Nile, with a calf astride on her short neck. The young are precocious, and the mothers very affectionate. Many monkeys carry their babies about with them among the branches, and so does the quaint tarsius, which belongs to the order of lemurs. Among bats the young one is carried by the mother as she flies, and the holding on is assisted by the front teeth, which grip the rough hairs. On a somewhat different line are the cases where the mother takes a young one in her mouth and transports it to a place of safety. This is familiar in the case of a cat and her kittens, but the squirrel may also shift her young when danger threatens. In some cases, the instruction given by the mother is an important factor in securing the survival of the young ones, and therefore of the race. Thus the badger instructs its offspring in the art of being elusive and in the diverse ways of securing food. Even better known is the otter's schooling, for the young are taught all the alphabet of country sounds, how to dive without splashing, how to lie hiding under the bank without betraying themselves, how to catch frogs and skin them, how to guttle for trout and eels, how to eat the eel from the tail and the trout from the head, how to deal with rabbit and moorhen, and how to find their way home without returning on their outgoing track. No doubt there is hereditary instinctive endowment, but there is teaching as well. Section 15. The Story of the Otter. The otter, Lutra vulgaris, is one of the most elusive of mammals, in great part nocturnal, shy of repeating itself or returning on its tracks, shifting in its hunting, and very thoroughly amphibious. It is much commoner in Britain than is generally supposed. Part of the secret of its survival we have already referred to, namely, the training which the mother gives to her offspring, but there is more. Thus, it is always an advantage to have a Catholic appetite, and while the otter depends mainly on fishes, it condescends to eat the mussels and limpets on the seashore, and the frogs in the marsh, and of course it rises to wild duck and rabbit. Another feature of survival value is the otter's nomadism. In his fine study, the Life Story of the Otter, 1915, Mr. Tregarthen calls it the homeless hunter, the Bedouin of the wild. It has been known to travel fifteen miles in a night, and not infrequently the holts where it lies up during the day are ten or twelve miles apart. It passes from tarn to stream, from river to shore. It swims out to an island in the sea. It explores the caves on the cliffs. It crosses the hills and hides in the cairn. It is always on the move, a gypsy among carnivores. In resourcefulness, the otter is unsurpassed, lying hidden below the waterfall, wrenching a trap off under the roots of the alder trees, diving at the flash of a gun, even hunting for pike beneath the ice of the lake. There are savage fights between the dog otters who desire the same meat. The parents are often severely taxed to provide for the young, but the greater part of the otter's struggle for existence in Britain is in circumventing the difficulties of modern life. The Common Hare The common hare, 
Lapus europius, might be called a gentle Ishmaelite. Everyone's hand is against it, but it is against no one unless it be greatly roused, for instance, by a stoat approaching its leverets at play. Yet it extends all over Europe, except in Ireland, the north of Scandinavia, and the north of Russia. How does it survive? It seeks resting places, or forms, from which it gets a good lookout over the surrounding country. It has long-sighted eyes, quicker ears, and keen smell. It utters a danger call to its kin by grinding its teeth. Its heart is such that it can put on full speed the moment flight is signaled. It rejoices in an uphill race. It criss-crosses its tracks so that even the astute fox is baffled. It disappears like an arrow when it is startled, and even when it is resting among the ferns and herbage, or on a ploughed field, it is almost invisible, save as to its wide staring eyes. Much as it dislikes wetting its fur, which is slow to dry, it will swim across a broad river to balk pursuit, or to reach greatly appreciated dainties like musk and chamomile. Epicure as it is, fond of tender corn and the sweet trefoil, of wild thyme and the seashore pea, it has a long bill of fare, which always aids in survival, and it will pass from lichens on the rocks, which its cousin the mountain hare also eats, to the twigs of firs bushes, and from the leaves of dandelions to the fruits of the bramble. Let us take three more illustrations of the hare's astonishing fitness. How simple and yet effective is its habit of taking a great leap from and into its form or nest, so that the scent track is interrupted. In his fine study, The Story of the Hare, Mr. Tregarthen notes that the doe leaves little scent when the young ones are helpless in the nest, that is, about the month of April. When a particular nest is endangered, it may be by a hungry vixen, the doe hare will transport its leverets to a safer place, carrying one at a time in her mouth at dead of night. It is said that if the litter be over two, cases of four to six are recorded, there may be a division into two nests. Elusive is the word for a hare, but at the breeding season in March, the instinct of self-preservation wanes before sex passion. The bucks race about at a high speed in the open day and in the open field, searching for the does and fighting with rivals. They box with their paws and kick with their hind legs, and a common trick is for one buck to jump over another, kicking back as he does so. The buck is a roving lover. He may consort with one doe for a little while, but he soon seeks another. The hare is a high-strung creature, with quick-beating heart, rapid breathing, tremulous ears, but it presents a brave front to persecution, now saving itself by its alertness, and again by its capacity for lying low. As there is no burrow, it is not surprising to find that the leverets are born furry and open-eyed, very different from the naked young of their second cousins, the rabbits. THE SIGNIFICANCE OF PLAY There are many playing mammals, and the work of Groos, in particular, has shown that the play is of great importance in the life of the creature. Kittens chase a leaf whirled by the wind. Puppies indulge in a sort of sham hunt. Young otters and stoats are delightfully playful, and so are humble mammals like the water shrews, which few people know much about. Lambs have many games, and goats have more. Calves and foals have their races, leverets and squirrels their frolics. One may distinguish gambles, races, games like tig, sham hunts, sham fights, and the endless game of experimenting in which monkeys are preeminent. Miss Romaines writes of her capuchin monkey, quote, He is very fond of upsetting things, but he always takes great care that they do not fall upon himself. Thus he will pull a chair towards him till it is almost overbalanced. Then he intently fixes his eyes on the top bar of the back, and, as he sees it coming over his way, darts from underneath, and watches the fall with great delight, and similarly with heavier things. There is a wash-hand stand, for example, which he has upset several times, and always without hurting himself. End quote. 
This illustrates the game of experiment. Similarly, Miss Frances Pitt records a game which two ravens in a yard used to play with a cat. One of the ravens, with a good deal of bluster, would make a frontal attack on the cat. This was met on the cat's part by the usual arching of the back, and other expressions of contemptuous irritation. Meanwhile, however, the other raven approached quietly from behind and tweaked the cat's tail, whereupon a rapid face around and the second phase of the game began, in which the ravens exchanged parts. There was no use in the performance. It was only a ploy in which the cat had its share. What is the biological significance of the play of young mammals? It has been said that play is a good safety valve for overflowing energy and exuberant spirits. It has been pointed out that motion is linked in a subtle way to emotion, and that pleased feelings naturally find expression in pleasant movements. It has been suggested that the playing period affords opportunity for trying new ways or exercising new gifts before the responsibilities of life become too stringent. There is good sense in each of these suggestions, but the most important idea is that the play period is the time for educating powers which are useful in after life. Play is the young form of work, a rehearsal without too great responsibilities, when mistakes can be made without too severe punishment. As Dr. Gruse says, playing animals do not simply play because they are young, they continue young in order that they may play. In the course of ages, playing instincts have been established in many mammals, and they make for success. The Story of the Weasel The weasel, Putorius vulgaris, is one of the northern mammals common to Europe, Asia, and North America. It is a first cousin to the stoat or ermine, and an embodiment of virility. The spare sinuous body and the long neck suggest the snake, and the convergence simply means that the weasel is adapted, like a snake, to making its way through narrow passages. The weasel succeeds in virtue of a nimble brain, very keen senses, highly developed muscularity, without any spare flesh, and solicitous maternal care, but it would be unscientific to overlook its extraordinary courage. It will face up to a terrier, even to a man. It will leap up and catch a partridge already on the wing. A pair will stand affectionately and nobly by each other in danger, and a weasel mother will defend her young to the last gasp. A weasel will explore a house and defy the house cat. It will bluff a lot of roosting hens that could have pecked it to pieces, whining and daring, snarling and bristling. It will retrieve its young ones from under the feet of man. Section 16. Social Mammals Many mammals are gregarious, and some go a step further, and illustrate some measure of communal or corporate life. It is difficult to draw any hard and fast line. Gregariousness is illustrated by cattle, deer, wild horses, rabbits, kangaroos, and many more. The chief advantage is in the strength that numbers give against an enemy. The members of the vegetarian herd trample the carnivore to death. A small monkey, attacked by an eagle, has no chance, but his cries bring a crowd of comrades to his aid, and they may tear the bird of prey to pieces. Moreover, when there is a herd, there is the possibility of having sentinels or outposts, which warn the main body when danger draws near. The rabbit knocks loudly on the ground with its feet, and the marmot whistles danger. Whenever there is division of labor, there is a sounding of the social note. Thus, when baboons are retreating, the rear guard is formed by the old males, and Brehm tells the fine story of the way in which they faced the dogs of his hunting party and kept them at bay while the females retreated. Quote, but one little monkey, about half a year old, had been left behind. It shrieked loudly as the dogs rushed towards it, but succeeded in gaining the top of a rock before they had arrived. Our dogs placed themselves cleverly so as to cut off its retreat, and we hoped that we might be able to catch it, but that was not to be. 
proudly and with dignity, without hurrying in the least, or paying any heed to us, an old male stepped down from the security of the rocks toward the hard-pressed little one, walked towards the dogs without betraying the slightest fear, held them in check with glances, gestures, and quite intelligible sounds, slowly climbed the rock, picked up the baby monkey, and retreated with it, before we could reach the spot, and without the visibly disconcerted dogs making the slightest attempt to prevent him. While the patriarch of the troop performed this brave and self-sacrificing deed, the other members, densely crowded on the cliff, uttered sounds which I had never before heard from baboons. Old and young, males and females, roared, screeched, snarled, and bellowed all together, so that one would have thought they were struggling with leopards or other dangerous beasts. I learned later that this was the baboon's battle cry. It was intended, obviously, to intimidate us and the dogs, possibly also to encourage the brave old giant who was running into such evident danger before their eyes. End quote. The Story of the Beaver The beaver is an aquatic animal of a very different type, suited for rivers traversing wooded country. It is a thick-furred, plump creature, about two and a half feet long, with a flat, trowel-like scaly tail. It swims well with its webbed hind feet and broad tail, it can remain about two minutes under water. It feeds mainly on bark. Its simplest home is a burrow with an entrance under water, but above the burrow there may be a surface pile of sticks, and from this rough and ready shelter there are gradations leading to a well-formed beaver lodge of sticks and grass, moss and mud. This includes a comfortable central chamber, with a wood entrance and a beaver entrance but the architecture varies with individuals and with the severity of the conditions of life. With more leisure there is more art. Beavers can cut down trees ten inches in diameter. They use their chisel-edged incisor teeth, covered in front with orange-colored enamel, to split off flakes of wood all round the base of the stem, but more towards the side nearer the water. The wind then brings the tree down, and the beaver's object is attained, namely, getting at the more palatable wood on the younger branches. These are cut into suitable lengths, and stored in or near the lodge. The barked pieces may be added to the building. There is no doubt that beavers make dams of brushwood, stones, and mud, thereby securing a larger area for their woodcutting and easier conditions of transport. It is likely enough that some of the dams were started naturally by floods, which carried lodges and stores away, and deposited them in shallow water. Indeed, we can see the beginning of such a dam in many a river in wooded country. But the point is that the beavers strengthen, elaborate, and regulate what the river itself may have begun. Even more remarkable is the digging of canals, by which the transport of the cut branches is made easier. They may be hundreds of feet long, and they are often about a yard broad and deep. They usually communicate between clumps of trees and the pond above the dam, but they may form a shortcut between two loops of the river, or they may go right through an island. In the last case, the work would not be justified until there was an open waterway from end to end. In some other cases, a moist roadway between the pond and a pool in the wood might be gradually converted into a canal. Instances of locks have been recorded, but there is a tendency to forget that animals are more likely to take advantage of what exists or is hinted at in nature than to discover new ideas or principles. Beavers are notably gregarious, for there may be many lodges near a suitable wood. When there is overcrowding, a migration occurs, the old houses being left to related new couples. Isolated males are often found, and some naturalists say that these have been expelled from the community for laziness or misbehavior. There are no beavers left in Britain, but they flourish in Russia, in Siberia, and in Canada, and other parts of North America. It is interesting to notice that in many places from which beavers have been gone for centuries, evidences of their work remain 
as beaver meadows and the like mutual aid prince kropotkin did a notable service in his book mutual aid a factor in evolution 1904 for he showed in a scholarly way the frequency of gregariousness combination cooperation and sociality among animals one answer back that pays in the struggle for existence is to sharpen teeth and claws i e to intensify competition but another successful answer back is to practice mutual aid even the individualistic carnivores may form packs as in the case of wolves and jackals but there is more elaboration among the grazing herds all kinds of beasts and birds of prey have proved powerless against the colonies of russian suslisks combination gives strength to the sociable muskrats of north america and to the prairie dogs as far as the eye can embrace the prairie it sees heaps of earth and on each of them a prairie dog stands engaged in a lively conversation with its neighbors by means of short barkings as soon as the approach of man is signaled all plunge in a moment into their dwellings all have disappeared as by enchantment but if the danger is over the little creatures soon reappear whole families come out of their galleries and indulge in play the young ones scratch one another they worry one another and display their gracefulness while standing upright and in the meantime the old ones keep watch they go calling on one another and the beaten footpaths which connect all their heaps testify to the frequency of their visits as darwin said quote, the individuals which took the greatest pleasure in society would best escape various dangers while those that cared least for their comrades and lived solitary would perish in great numbers End quote. In short, the line of mutual aid is a trend of evolution which has borne its finest fruits in mankind. Section 17. Variety Among Mammals We see the March hares racing over the ploughed field, and the sloths creeping cautiously along the underside of the branches. The porpoises gamble in the sea, and the bats with erratic flight hawk insects in the air. The mole works its way for the most part underground, and the squirrel leaps adventurously from tree to tree. Whales are mammals of the open sea, and sometimes descend to great depths. Monkeys are largely arboreal, antelopes are suited for the plains, and the hippopotamus for the rivers. Wild cattle are gregarious, beavers are social. The sea lion has his harem, the polar bear is solitary. We watch seals resting among the shore rocks, and bats hanging upside down from the rafters. In the winter, the wolves join in packs, the stoat turns into the white ermine, the hedgehog sinks into hibernation. There are herbivores, insectivores, carnivores, specialists like the anteaters, and the fish-eating seals, and others with a catholicity of appetite like badger and otter. A harvest mouse only weighs about a half penny. An elephant's tusk may weigh 188 pounds. The pygmy shrew has a body under two inches in length. A whale may attain to sixty feet. A common shrew seems often to die in the year of its birth. An elephant may be more than a centenarian. But we need not go further. It is plain that there is extraordinary variety among mammals. This raises the question, what have they all in common? General Characters of Mammals Mammals are quadrupeds, except that the whales and sea cows have lost all but vestiges of the hind limbs, and perhaps another saving clause should be inserted for kangaroos, jerboas, and higher apes, which are more or less bipeds. In most mammals there is a distinct neck and a distinct tail, but the neck is practically obliterated in whales, and the tail is often much reduced, as in bear or rabbit, or practically absent, as in the higher apes. Hares are never entirely absent, for even in whales they are present in early stages of life, and some, very richly innervated, often persist on the lips. The mammalian skin shows sweat glands which get rid of surplus water, 
and some waste products. Sebaceous glands, which keep the fur sleek, absent in whales, and milk glands, which are normally functional in the females only. In mammals only is there developed a midriff or diaphragm, a muscular sheet separating the chest cavity, containing heart and lungs, and the abdominal cavity, containing the stomach or other viscera. This midriff falls and rises in the breathing movements, and is of great importance in increasing and then decreasing the chest cavity, and thus helping the entrance and exit of air from the lungs. Mammals have many skeletal peculiarities which separate them off from all other backboned animals. The vertebrae, backed bone bodies, and the long bones have terminal caps which ossify apart from the main part of the bone. The surfaces of the vertebrae are usually flat or gently rounded. With four exceptions, there are seven neck vertebrae whether it be in the long straight neck of the giraffe or the compressed and conspicuous neck of the whale. The lower jaw is one bone on each side and works on a bone of the skull, called a squamosal. The skull moves by two knobs, or condyles, on the first vertebrae, whereas birds and reptiles have only one condyle. The drum of the ear is connected with the internal organ of hearing by a beautiful chain of three small bones the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, by which the vibrations are conveyed inwards. There is a completely bony palate separating the mouth cavity from the nasal passage above. Almost without exception, there are two sets of teeth in sockets, except in the oviparous mammals, the bone of the shoulder girdle, called the coracoid, which is very strongly developed in flying birds and in reptiles, is represented merely by a small process of the shoulder blade or scapula. The cerebral hemispheres of the forebrain are much more developed than in other vertebrates, and their surface is very generally covered with convolutions. See figure facing page 157, volume 1. The heart is four-chambered. The temperature of the blood remains in most cases practically constant. The red blood cells are circular discs, except in camels, where they are elliptical in outline as in other vertebrates. And the nucleus of the mammalian red blood corpuscle disappears as the corpuscle develops. The lungs lie freely in the chest cavity. They are fixed in birds. And inspiration is the active process, the opposite in birds. The vocal cords are at the top of the windpipe, at the foot in birds. The egg cells are very small except in egg-laying forms, and with the same exception, the young are born viviparously, i.e., as living well-formed young ones, which are for a while nourished on milk. This enumeration of salient characters is indispensable if we are to understand how this class of mammals stands apart from the other great classes of back-boned animals, namely, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fishes. Aristotle knew that a whale is not a fish. Unless we understand the general features of mammals, we will not appreciate his insight. The dominantly successful orders of present-day mammals are 1. The carnivores, cats, dogs, bears, seals, etc. 2. The hoofed ungulates, horses, tapirs, rhinoceros, cattle, pigs, hippopotamus, camels, perhaps also including the elephants, and three, the monkeys and apes or primates. These represent three great lines of evolution. On the carnivore line, the premium is on teeth and claws, quick senses and alert movements. On the ungulate line, the premium is on swiftness, on the power of covering long distances in search of herbage, and on such weapons as horns and hooves, rendered more effective still when their possessors are gregarious. On the primate line, the premium is on the power of climbing, the emancipated hand, and the restless brain. Below the level of true primates are the lemurs, or half-monkeys, ghost-like nocturnal creatures, mostly confined to the forests of Africa and Madagascar. Not very far off the carnivore line of evolution, but much more primitive, is that of the insectivores, 
e.g. moles, hedgehogs, and shrews, and the bats, with their power of flight, must be regarded as the specialized descendants of arboreal insectivora. Balancing the insectivores, there is the somewhat humble order of rodents. On a quite different evolutionary tack, the rats and mice, squirrels and porcupines, rabbits and hares, the toothed whales and baleen whales are mammals that have taken secondarily to marine life, and are as specialized for swimming and diving as bats are for flight. And besides these well-known orders, there are the sea cows, or Cyrenians, including nowadays to genera only, the dugong and the manatee, the old-fashioned edentates, sloths and armadillos, anteaters and pangolins, perhaps to some extent survivors of the archaic animals, but more primitive in their affinities than all these are the marsupials, mostly confined to Australia, and lowest of all are the egg-laying monotremes, also Australasian. End of section 17. Recording by Guido. Section 18 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 14, Natural History, Part 3, The Insect World insects almost ubiquitous the immense and varied group of insects constitutes by far the largest class in the animal kingdom it numbers as many as two hundred thousand named species the majority of which are predominantly active types such a wealth of forms the species in a single family of insects may outnumber the stars one can count on a clear night shows that as a class insects are extraordinarily successful many reasons are given for this dominance all pointing to the striking fact that insects by means of manifold adaptations are able to fill many niches and so attain a wide distribution few haunts are destitute of insect life butterflies and mosquitoes are known to penetrate to extreme arctic regions a small kind of butterfly is found in ecuador at an elevation of sixteen thousand five hundred feet Insects inhabit desert tracts far out of reach of water, and limestone caverns have their cave dwellers, often pale and blind unless their descent to this unusual haunt has been comparatively recent. Many forms live in fresh water, even hot springs have their insects, and some beetles, for instance, are found on the tidal zone of the seashore. The actual sea seems very unsuitable for insect life, and yet there is a family of skimmers, Halobatidae, which run about on the surface of the open ocean and even dive when it is stormy. The Success of Insects Insects are typically winged creatures, and their power of flight extends their range. Given the opportunity to colonize new areas and to migrate to fresh localities in times of stress, their bodies are extremely well adapted from the mechanical point of view. Their sense organs are highly developed, sensitive feelers, compound eyes, and so on and their mouth parts are remarkably adapted to suit different modes of feeding. Probably much of their success in the struggle for existence is due to the adaptations of their circulatory and respiratory systems, which enable the nutrition of the organs of the body to go on with great rapidity. The tissues are continually bathed in nutritive fluid, while every part of the body is kept aerated by the extensive system of air tubes. These facts account for the abundant energy and consequent activity which is so characteristic of the class. It may be doubted if the insect's blood ever becomes impure. Another factor tending towards the success is the change of habit due to the change of form which occurs during the course of many life histories. This implies changes in diet and therefore a lessening of the drain on a particular foodstuff. In other ways also the changes of form and habit may lead to survival in the struggle for life. But there is frequently a tiding over of difficult times. For instance, quiescence during periods when conditions of temperature and food are unfavorable many insects pass the winter in a lethargic state inside well-protected cocoons 
Protective Adaptations Another factor which helps to give success to insects in maintaining their hold in various habitats is the way in which general form and color are adapted to the environment. Protective coloring in animals has formed the subject of a special article, but it may be noted that there are no clearer instances of protective resemblance than among insects. Not only do they very often closely resemble the general color of their natural surroundings, but form, as well as color, may add still more to the similarity, which gives security to the insect by concealing it effectively from its enemies. We can thoroughly understand the wonder of this protective resemblance only when we study it under natural conditions. Many very gaudy butterflies can hardly be distinguished from flowers when they alight on plants. Many moths in their resting position hide the bright colors of the hind pair of wings with the duller forewings, which may nearly resemble lichen or the bark of trees. The coloration may afford an effective protection in other ways, by warning and by mimicry. Some insects, such as the wasp or the ladybird beetle, positively court attention with their vivid coloring and markings. They are colored not to be hidden but to be seen. Such insects always have some other form of protection, a sting or an unpleasant taste which their enemies come to associate with their striking hues and therefore avoid. No doubt conspicuous individuals will be snapped at and killed while birds and other enemies are experimenting, but the enemies learn by experience, and the species with the warning colors gradually attain a position of security. Section 1. Pedigree. The pedigree of insects is obscure. They belong to the large group of joint-legged arthropods, which shows numerous affinities with the ringed worms or annelids, but also many advances such as the greater development of appendages in Peripatus and its allies, which are widely distributed over the world, worm-like, velvet-skinned little creatures shy and nocturnal in habit, we find living links between annelids and insects. In their excretory tubes, muscular arrangement, and hollow appendages, they strongly suggest the ringed worm type, but they combine with these and other annelid features distinct indications of arthropod characters, such as the system of breathing tubes and the appendages in the surface of the mouth, which reach further development in the class of insects. General Characters of Insects Insects, peripatus, centipedes, and millipedes have a common respiratory system consisting of tubular trachea, which marks them off from the gill-breathing arthropods, crustaceans and sensitive feelers which distinguish them from the spider and scorpion group arachnids in the class of insects the body of the adult state is divided into three main regions one the head two the thorax or forebody three the abdomen or hind body the outer covering of most insects is hard and firm composed of non-living cuticle made of chitin a somewhat horn-like substance secreted by the underlying living skin. The chitinous plates which make protective armor are firmly fused in the head region, but in the thorax and in the abdominal part the different rings are joined by flexible areas, permitting more freedom of movement. Thus the segmented architecture of the body is more clearly seen in the thorax and abdomen than in the head region, where fusion has obliterated the boundaries of successive segments of the body. In rapidly flying insects, there is often a fusion of thorax rings to form a firm basis for the action of the wings. It must be clearly understood that in the insect's body, the muscles are inside the skeleton, whereas in ourselves, the skeleton is covered by the muscles. The two plans of architecture are utterly different. The insect's head. The insect's head, which bears one pair of feelers or antenna, and usually three pairs of jaws, is relatively small, firm, and compact separated from the thorax by a narrow membrous neck allowing freedom of movement one sees this very well on the common house fly all adult insects except some primitive and some degenerate species have a pair of compound eyes though simple eyes may be present also the compound eyes project on each side of the head as convex immovable structures there is only one pair though each eye may be partially divided as in some of the aquatic whirligig beetles in which half of the eye is directed up to keep a lookout for danger from above, while the other half is scanning the water below in search of prey. The compound eye consists of a great many similar parts, each a complete organ of vision, but requiring the surrounding elements to form the whole image. Each of the many elements of the eye makes a small image, so that the whole image is a mosaic of separate contributions, which combine in a unified visual impression conveyed to the brain. 
for the amorous insect does not see one thousand desired mates one through each of its eye elements the question is not an easy one but it should be noticed that in some cases example fireflies the eye elements no longer act separately but a single combined image is thrown on the back of the eye the antenna are appendages set in sockets on the crown of the head and consist of a series of joints varying from one or two to a large number and of many different shapes they are of the greatest importance to the insect as organs of touch by means of sensory bristles connected with underlying nerve fibers and also in connection with the sense of smell of hearing in insects very little is securely known further the head carries three pairs of mouth appendages homologous with legs which are variously transformed for different modes of feeding biting or sucking it is very interesting to find the same three parts are changed in scores of different ways insect legs the legs which are borne on the three rings or segments of the thorax region show many different peculiarities to suit different habits the front pair is considerably lengthened in certain beetles that climb about on the bark of trees in the mole cricket they are converted into burring implements the terminal joints being arranged as shears for cutting through plant roots the praying mantis and the water scorpion both show the forelegs modified into pincher-like traps for seizing prey usually the middle pair is not greatly modified but in some water bugs like the water boatmen the middle legs are the longest and have become effective oars for rowing on the surface of the water the hind pair of legs of many insects is elongated for jumping as in grasshoppers and locusts and some beetles certain beetles and bees and wasps have a comb or bristle-lined cavity on the leg by means of which they clean their feelers while some butterflies use their feeble front legs to brush off dust from their heads ants are particular about their toilet in the course of the day's work an ant's antenna may become soiled on its first pair of legs it is provided with what we might call brushes and combs as we have described and the ant may be seen to draw its besmeared antenna through this brush and comb arrangement on the forelegs one of the legs will be passed over the head and body its other legs sweeping off every particle of dirt no cat is more fastidious over its toilet ants will even wash and brush each other just as they will exchange greetings as they meet by movements of their antenna the hind legs of bees shows a modification for pollen gathering a broadening of the shin to make a basket into which the pollen is swept by special bristles insects breathing breathing takes place by means of a system of air tubes or trachea which penetrate to every hole and corner of the body trachea arise as inpushings of the skin and the layer of the chitin which lines them is continuous with that which covers the whole body in the larger air tubes this chitin is thickened spirally in threads and this keeps the tubes from collapsing air enters the body by openings spiracles or stigmata occurring on most of the body rings through these spiracles the air is driven out by movements of contraction fresh air passes in passively as the body expands as in birds so in insects expiration is the active part of the breathing process the air tubes fork and refork sending side branches to every corner of the body even to the tips of the feelers so that the whole body is thoroughly aerated the extensiveness of the air tube system compensates for the relatively poor blood system in aquatic forms various devices are adopted to secure a supply of oxygen some water insects come to the surface to breathe others like young mayflies have special structures tracheal gills of different types the water beetle dytiscus has its spiracles on its back and when it dives under the water it carries with it in an airtight compartment between its back and its hard wing covers enough air to last for several minutes the bubble of air method is another plan adopted by the whirligig beetles and some water bugs whose covering of fine hairs and traps in bubbles of air ensuring a sufficient supply of air about the body for a short time under water in addition to the respiratory system there are inside the body of an insect all the usual organs food canal and associated parts a heart excretory organs reproductive organs and so on some insects are so small that they can creep through the eye of a needle and it is difficult to believe that in such minute dimensions all the ordinary organs are packed away locomotion insects are essentially active and they exhibit various kinds of locomotion many grubs and maggots are quite passive but even limbless larvae though naturally not so active as the leg types have their ways of getting about they may jerk themselves along with the aid of bristles or jaws they may make relatively enormous leaps into the air by taking their tails in their mouths and suddenly letting go or they may swing themselves from place to place by paying out silken lines from their mouths young dragonflies propel themselves through the water by means of the forcible expulsion of water from the end of the food canal insects walk run 
and jump with the quadrupeds, fly with the birds, glide with the serpents, and swim with the fishes. It is often asked how a fly contrives to walk upon smooth, perpendicular surfaces, and one answer is that a vacuum is made below a little soft pad which is present on the foot. Another explanation is that there seems to be a slight exudation of a haze of moisture from the foot. Beetles, which have relatively strong legs, very different from the weak legs of a butterfly, can run with considerable speed, while many insects, one has only to think of a flea or a grasshopper, are preeminently leapers. The most primitive insects, the springtails and bristletails, are entirely wingless, but a springtail is an expert jumper. It has at the end of the body an effective leaping apparatus consisting of two elongated prongs, which are bent under the abdomen and pressed down, affording such a leverage when the retaining catch is released that the insect springs forward a relatively long distance compared with the size of its body. From great leaps to the beginnings of flight is an understandable step in progress, and most insects are flyers. There are many patterns of wing, but essentially they are lightly built, mere flattened sacks of skin, often transparent and fragile, but beating the air with an extraordinarily rapid motion. It has been calculated the fly makes 330 wing strokes in a second, a humble bee 240, a wasp 110, a dragonfly 28, and a butterfly 9. The rapidity of the movement produces a hum or buzz. Bees and wasps have two pairs of membrous wings, but the fore wing and the hind wing on each side act as a single organ, for the hind wing has a row of minute hooklets which fit into the curled over posterior edge of the fore wing and lock the two wings together. In dragonflies, the two wings are not attached, but the two pairs are coordinated by the action of very strong muscles, and the larger dragonflies are excellent flyers. They are probably helped in steering by the weight of their bodies, the lightness of most insects being against good steering, as they are liable to be blown about by the wind. Whatever the pattern of wing or the speed of the wing beats, the total distance insects can fly is not great. They seldom wander far afield. Some insects literally fly but once. A mayfly may rise at noon from the water that cradled it, and by sundown its aerial dance of love may be over and its lifeless body be floating on the surface of the pool. Section 2 Instincts and Intelligence Insects are largely creatures of instinct, with inborn capacities for doing apparently clever things, but yet with some degree of intelligence. In an animal's behavior there is often, no doubt, a mingling of different kinds of activities unified in a way that baffles analysis. In many cases their behavior under new conditions, their powers of effectively meeting new ends, go beyond mere instinct. What are we to say of the following? The tailor ants, common in warm countries, make a shelter by drawing leaves together, and their cooperative hauling is admirable. Their mandibles are their needles, if you like, but they have nothing to fix the leaves with. What does each do but take a larva in its mouth so that the silk secreted from the offspring serves as an adhesive gum? The tailor ants nest in trees, and they sometimes find it difficult to bring two rather distant leaves close enough together to be sewn. Then, as Bunyan relates, they have a course to a perfectly extraordinary cooperation. Five or six will form a living chain to bridge the gap. The waist of A is gripped in the mandibles of B, who in turn is gripped by C, and so on, a notable gymnastic feat. Time does not appear to be of much account, but they work definitely towards a result, and many chains work together for hours on end, trying to draw two leaves close to one another. We could not have a better instance of social cooperation. An eyewitness, Mr. L. G. Gilpin Brown, writes from Ceylon, sometimes one will see an ant with a larva on its mandibles stalking aimlessly about on the outside of the nest. It stumbles on a small hole. It proceeds to study that hole, walks all round it, walks over it, and eventually decides that it really is a hole, whereupon it proceeds to business. Feeling around the edge with its antenna, it dumps the head of the larva on one side so as to fasten the thread of silk there moves over and fastens it down on the other side, comes back again, and so on, each trip leaving a thread of silk behind until the hole is completely sealed up. A common harvesting ant of South Europe collects seeds of clover-like plant, lets them begin to sprout so that the tough envelopes are burst, exposes them to the sun so that the germination does not go too far, takes them back underground and chews them into dough, and finally makes this into little biscuits which are dried in the sun and stored for winter use. What a brilliant idea! And yet, it cannot be that. It's suggested by the semi-domestication of green flies by a certain species of ants, 
and what shall we say of the slaves which others bluff into service many white ants or termites grow highly nutritious moulds in extensive specially constructed beds of chewed wood and some of the true ants show a similar habit on the wayside plants in early summer we see everywhere the frothy masses called cuckoo spit each made by a larval frog hopper which whips a little sugary sap a little ferment and a little wax into a strange persistent foam protective against enemies and against the heat of the sun the creature literally saving its life by blowing soap bubbles not far off on a bare sandy patch are the deep shafts sunk by the grubs of the beautiful green tiger beetle the grub with quaint somersault movements inside the shaft thrusts the loose earth with great force into the walls and beats them smooth eventually it fixes itself near the top of the shaft so that the roof of its head forms a trap-door when an ant or some other small insect settles down on this living lid the grub suddenly explodes like a jack-in-the-box hurling its victim violently against the hard upper edge of the shaft wall the sucked body is afterwards jerked out the world is full of these inventions how are we to understand the behavior of one of the digger wasps which lays its eggs in a sunk shaft and provisions this with paralyzed caterpillars while the hunting and storing are in progress the wasp shuts the mouth of the shaft after each visit but it does so in a rough and ready fashion when the larder is full however it seals the entrance with earth and makes a neat job of it nay it takes a minute pebble in its jaws and beats the earth smooth who said animals could not use tools it seems that using the pebble is not part of the instinctive routine but is an individual touch probably with more vivid awareness than is associated with the rest of the agency but the difficulty is to think of the origin of either the routine or the finishing touch without postulating intelligence or at least some appreciation of significance homing it is well known that ants and bees can find their way home from a distance ants evidently take impressions by touch sight or sense of smell of certain signposts there may even be a muscular memory of the movements affected and of the amount of work done probably ants improve gradually in their wayfinding as they learn to make use of a combination of various hints an interesting experiment suggested that bees build up a knowledge of the country round about the hive professor young of geneva took twenty bees from a hive near the lake and liberated them at a distance of six kilometers in the country seventeen returned to the hive some within an hour next day the successful seventeen were taken on a boat to a distance of three kilometers on the lake when liberated they flew off in all directions but apparently they missed the necessary signposts for none of them found their way home on the other hand experiments have given results that indicate that bees have a sense of direction comparable to that of carrier pigeons even bees with their eyes obscured have been known to make a bee line for the hive from considerable distances but there is no doubt that bees make cautious and systematical trial flights of orientation when a hive is placed in a new position intelligent behavior an outstanding feature of ants is that of instinctive socialization they do not live unto themselves but for the general good of the community they are indefatigable but whether they toil consciously for the sake of anything or what we are to read in their capacity for unified action who shall say it is difficult to accept the opinion of some naturalists that instinctive behavior is unaccompanied by any awareness of the meaning or feeling of the end whenever this difficulty is obvious it is customary to say that intelligence has for the time being taken the reins in any case the facts are wonderful enough it is among the social insects that the most pronounced evidences of intelligence are found intelligence is an eminently social faculty as kropotkin says language imitation and accumulated experience are so many elements of growing intelligence of which the unsociable animal is deprived therefore we find at the top of each class of animals the ants the parrots and the monkeys all combining the greatest sociability with the highest development of intelligence the fittest are thus the most sociable animals and sociability appears as a chief factor of evolution both directly by securing the well-being of the species while diminishing the waste of energy and indirectly by favoring the growth of intelligence mutual help is practiced extensively among insects of various kinds the burying beetles which usually lead a solitary life call to their aid a number of their fellows when there is a corpse to be buried many caterpillars weave a silken web to make a shelter for a whole brood while the full-grown procession caterpillars march together from their feeding ground on the trees 
to a soft place on the ground where they can bury themselves and become moths locusts display gregarious habits also which are of mutual advantage for instance it is a common practice for the wingless young to make a living bridge over a moderately broad stream plunging into the water and grappling for sticks and straws and scrambling for a breathing space on their comrades bodies till the whole swarm passes across the stream comparatively few are drowned as the same individuals are seldom in the water the whole time such associations for mutual aid suggest the beginnings of societies but they are not nearly so highly evolved as those seen among the termites ants bees and wasps where the social habits extend to the welfare of the young and cooperation reaches a high level kropotkin says if we knew no other facts from animal life than what we know about the ants and the termites we already might safely conclude that mutual aid which leads to mutual confidence the first condition of courage and the individual initiative the first condition for intellectual progress are two factors infinitely more important than mutual struggle in the evolution of the animal kingdom the fact is that the struggle for existence which includes all the answers back that living creatures make to environing difficulties and limitations sociology pays just as well as intensified competition or it may be pays better end of section eighteen section nineteen of the outline of science volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle the outline of science volume two by j arthur thompson chapter fourteen natural history part three the insect world section three the story of the ants the marvels of the ant hill of all insects ants must be placed on the highest level for none have better mastered the art of living together in a mutually beneficial manner and many ant communities show considerable elaboration let us then take the case of the ants as a particular illustration of the distinctive features of insect societies here we have a community of separate individuals with more or less of a corporate life and with the power of acting as a unity many ants live for a number of years so that one generation may teach another the profitable arts which lead to the success of the community the welfare of the species is the important matter and the individual is often sacrificed as well as specialized for the common good there are three types of individuals winged males winged females and wingless workers or undeveloped females and the workers may be of different kinds large and small or with huge mandibles in the soldier type we see a division of labor the busy workers tread the neighborhood of the nest into a pattern of ant roads by which they come and go on their foraging expeditions smell counts for much in wayfinding within the nest the workers have their home duties they look after the young feeding them and carrying them from room to room to secure a suitable temperature and they bite open the cocoons when the perfect insects are ready to emerge mutual aid and harmony seem to reign within the community but there are terrible wars with other species which are carried out in a well-organized fashion ants have the instinct of acting together and seldom make individual attacks but they never seem to hesitate to sacrifice themselves for the protection of the community sometimes these warlike expeditions are initiated with a definite end in view that of capturing slaves for instance the amazon ants which have jaws well suited for warfare but inconvenient for the peaceful occupations of life habitually keep slaves to wait upon them professor wheeler thus describes them while in the home nest they sit about in stolid idleness or pass the long hours begging the slaves for food or cleaning themselves and burnishing their ruddy armor but when outside the nest they display a dazzling courage and capacity for concerted action scouts report their discovery of a brown ant colony and a raid promptly follows the amazons returning victorious with a large number of prisoners which become faithful slaves darwin's suggestion of the origin of slave-making was that many ants capture the pupa of other ants for food that some of the stored pupa might be unthinkingly reared that if their presence in the community was not resented but proved useful the slave-making habit might make ground like the termites the true ants frequently have guests within their homes certain little crickets find shelter and abundant food in this hospitable haunt they beg food from the ants and usually they shamelessly steal from the newly fed young ants 
Beetles, too, with a peculiar fragrance that makes them welcome guests, persuade the ants to share the sweet substances they carry in their crops by stroking them till they deliver up the coveted dainty. One species of ant carries mites about on the body, feeding them and caring for them, but apparently deriving no benefit from them. Evidently ants are fond of keeping pets. One of the peaceful occupations ants pursue is keeping cattle. Their cows are little aphids or green flies, which they cherish for the sake of the sweet honeydew that exudes from their bodies. Possibly, at first, it was simply a matter of feeding at the same table, when the ants would discover the sugary fluid and get into the way of licking the green flies. The eggs of certain aphids, which are of no direct use to the ant, are brought into the nest and protected carefully from the severities of winter until the warm weather comes, when the young aphids are brought out and put on their food plant, walled in by little cattle pens of earth. By keeping these eggs safe for six months, the ants ensure supply the food delicacy during the following summer. A truly remarkable case of prudence. The Wonderful Leaf-Cutting Ant In North America there are agricultural ants, which weed a space near the nest and only allow plants with edible seeds to grow there. These seeds they gather in due season and store in the form of little biscuits, which are made from a chewed seed dough dried in the sun. Another industry is a cultivation of fungi for food, another point in which they agree with the termites, and this habit is seen among the leaf-cutting ants. The fungus is grown in the underground nest on a spongy framework of chewed leaves, and the ants not only keep undesirable fungi from growing amongst their peculiar delicacy, but they keep their specialty from fructifying, which would spoil it for their purpose. Much has been added to our knowledge of the leaf-cutting ants by Mr. Beebe, who, in his fascinating book, The Edge of the Jungle, 1921, gives us an account of his own observations of a species of Atta in British Guiana. He had the good fortune to see, at one time, a royal procession leaving the nest in preparation for the nuptial flight. The great queen labored painfully up to the tunnel far away from the real entrance to the nest. Behind her came the kings, much smaller than she, but large in comparison with the workers that ran all about them. When the queen reached the surface, she poised herself on the tips of her slender legs and stretched out her great wings, looking like an aeroplane in miniature. Immediately the little workers swarmed over her, inspecting every organ, cleaning her antenna, legs, and gauzy rings. She had endured this for a few minutes, then moved her wings, threw off her load of busy mechanics, slowly rose in the air, followed by the males and was soon lost to view. But on another occasion the observer was able to follow the story farther, for he saw a queen descend in a long spiral to the ground, rest a few minutes, clean her antenna, and begin to scrape at the sand with her jaws, the foundation of a new colony at which for many days she labors alone. She plants the little fungus pellet she has carried with her from the old nest in a pouch in the lower part of her mouth, and tends it with the utmost solicitude. The care and feeding in her past life have stored within her this substance for vast numbers of eggs. Nine out of ten she lays, she eats to give her strength to go on with her labors. And when the first larvae emerge, they too are fed with surplus eggs. There are three castes of workers, large soldiers, ordinary workers, and small workers, or as Mr. Beebe names them, Maxims, Mediums, and Minims. The first brood which hatches out in about six weeks are all minimums, and they take charge at once of the fungus, enlarging the nest, attending to the queen and the young, and other domestic occupations, when the larger workers emerge foraging and leaf-cutting begin. In bands they issue forth and search about until they find one of the ant trails trodden down by millions of their kind before them, and stream along it till instinct impels them to climb a tree and drives each ant out upon a leaf. Standing firmly on the leaf, he measures its distance by cutting across a segment of a circle with one of his hind feet as center. He does not scissor his way across, but bit by bit sinks the tip of one jaw, hook-like, into the surface and brings the other up to it, slicing through the tissue with surprising ease. Holding his bit of leaf edgewise, he bends his head as far down as possible and secures a strong purchase along the very rim, when as he raises his head the leaf rises with it, suspended high over his back, out of the way. From this the ant gets the popular name of parasol ant. Mr. Beebe, with due precautions against attack by the insects, which are formidable collectively, dug out a large nest. At first only workers came forth, but by and by the large, one-eyed, round-headed soldiers lumbered forth to battle, and attacked his well-greased boots. He tells us that their bulldog-like grip, which is not relaxed with death, is taken advantage of by the Indians, who use them for stitching wounds, applying their jaws to the opposed edges of skin, 
than snipping off their bodies. As we have mentioned, the leaves the ants bring in are not eaten, but are masticated to a pulp and used as a fertilizer on which to grow the fungus, which is their only food, indoors at least. Three feet down, the great corridors opened out at intervals to the chambers as large as a football, which were filled with the soft whitish mold, which is the raison d'etre of all the ants' labor. In one of these chambers, Mr. Beebe found groups of workers in the act of chewing up the leaf pulp. The Ways of the Army Ants Of great interest, too, is Mr. Beebe's account of the habits of the formidable army ants. Discovering a nest of these on the ceiling of an outhouse, the naturalist made for himself an observation post by placing, at the cost of several fiery stings, a chair with its legs and tins of tarry disinfectant. There, within a foot or two of these myriads of terrible jaws, he spent many hours watching the home life of the colony. The whole structure, foundations, walls, and ceilings, was made of living ants, their legs stretched out to the utmost, their bodies erect, and their weapons always in a position of readiness for battle. The entrance was guarded by a mat of living ants, and near the door the edges thickened and met overhead to form a tunnel through which every returning worker had to pass with her booty. Returning soldiers dropped their load of plunder near the entrance to be dealt with by the workers. They were then immediately surrounded by a group of workers who put them through a very thorough scraping and cleaning, and they not only submitted with good grace, but turned over on their backs to facilitate the process. Spraying with formal disorganized the colony, which broke up in long festoons, and moved away carrying eggs and larvae. Next morning it was found that about a third of the ants had remained on the floor in charge of the larvae at the critical stage of passing into pupil stage. The workers were very busy gnawing wood to dust and rags to shreds to provide the light covering which seemed necessary before the larvae would begin to spin. The following morning the whole horde had disappeared. Termites, or white ants, are not related to the true ants, but their achievements are equally wonderful. They are abundant in many warm countries, notably tropical Africa. They live together in great communities, sharing a many-chambered earthen nest. The hills, or termiteries, which they build are often twice a man's height and strong enough to stand upon. In South Africa, telegraph posts have to be made out of iron to resist their jaws. There is a striking division of labor, as with the black termites so abundant in Ceylon. When on the march, the black termites move in great armies, sometimes comprising 300,000 individuals. It has been computed that there are 200 soldiers to every 1,000 workers, the number of soldiers guarding a march varying with the danger. The long troop of workers marches between two lines of soldiers. Their tactics are nothing short of extraordinary. There are guides and scouts searching out new lines for foraging. Very carefully, step by step, just like cats, they slink forward one behind the other, and if the foremost detects anything the least suspicious, he draws nervously back, pulling his brave comrades after him. There are soldiers that restore order in the ranks where there is panic. The order seem to be given through the antenna, or by a quivering of the whole body. Professor Bouillon tells of a war which lasted for three days. The black termites often wage a bitter battle with the well-known tailor ant, Oikophila. When the latter draw near, the termites squirt full in their faces, drops a secretion of fluid, which seems to drive the true ants almost crazy. Section 4. The Story of Bees. The Beehive. In the hive bees, Apis, we have a further illustration of insect communal life. Whatever the nature of the communal life of bees may be, we cannot liken it to that of human society. The one is run on predominantly instinctive lines, the other is predominantly intellect. The element of permanence distinguishes their communities. For many workers, as well as the queen, survive the winter. To the industry and food-storing habit of the hive bee is probably due their complex social life. The storing has enabled the community to survive unfavorable seasons and become permanent. When spring reawakens the earth, and the willow trees are bedecked with catkins and gorse and violets and primroses sent out a fragrant invitation, the bee world resumes its busy life again. The workers set to work to spring clean the hive and build new combs of hexagonal cells to accommodate the eggs the queen has again begun to lay. Some of the workers sally forth to bring fresh stores of pollen and honey, while others are nurse workers in charge of the fast-filling nurseries. In early summer the hive is a prosperous and busy city, inhabited by three distinct types of individuals. The head of the community is the queen, not by reason of her wits, for her daughters far surpass her in brains and activity, but because she is the mother bee, who alone can increase or restore the population the queen. One of the most remarkable facts about hive bees is the apparently psychical dependence of the community on the presence of the queen. If she is removed, the bad news spreads quickly through the hive, and there is a strange disorganization. When the beekeeper replaces her, the good news soon circulates, and there is harmony once again, 
according to some authorities the queen has a peculiar odor which is reassuring to the workers there is no doubt that smell counts for much among bees the queen bee is concerned only with egg laying the life of the hive is sustained by the worker bees which are active intelligent but sterile females with their reproductive systems in a state of arrested development thirdly there is the drone section of the community the males who take no part in the work and forage only for themselves and then not sufficiently to satisfy their greed for honey it has been said that they comport themselves in the hive as did penelope's suitors in the house of ulysses indelicate and wasteful sleek and corpulent fully content with their idle existence as honorary lovers they feast and carouse throng the alleys obstruct the passages and hinder the work but this is not quite accurate drones spend much of their time flying about very energetically in the vicinity of the hive they are on the lookout for an emerging queen and they are usually disappointed the bees diligence the stronger workers have to provide food for the whole colony their diligence is immense they toil from morning to night with ceaseless energy gathering in the precious store of honey and pollen and it is said that in summer time the life of the worker bee is only about two months their brains become hopelessly fatigued in a colony of fifty thousand bees it has been estimated that there are thirty thousand workers and if each makes ten trips a day three hundred thousand flowers would be visited about thirty seven thousand loads of nectar are required for the production of a pound of honey to obtain the nectar the bee protrudes its tongue into the flower tube and sucks up the nectar into its mouth and thence into the honey bag where it changes into honey which is deposited in storing cells for the indoor workers to draw on for themselves and also of course for the nutrition of the larva the golden pollen is kneaded into a small ball and carried back to the hive in the pollen basket a little cavity in the bee's hind leg there is a popular idea that bees fly about from flower to flower in a haphazard way sipping nectar from any blossom that takes their fancy but as a matter of fact and as aristotle noticed many bees keep as a rule to a single species of flower for collecting pollen and nectar this is an advantage to both flower and insect if the bee were to go from one type of flower to a quite different one time would be lost in locating the nectar moreover when the bee is constant for a while to the same kind of flower cups pollination is effected and waste of pollen is prevented the mutual aid which is an undoubted fact in the bee society sometimes takes the form of showing each other valuable sources of nectar the nurseries within the hives the younger workers are busily looking after the nurseries and attending on the queen the newly hatched grubs are fed on a kind of pap regurgitated by their nurses but soon they are ready for a more substantial diet of pollen and honey then the larvae spin cocoons and the workers shut the cells with little caps of porous wax and leave their charges to a thirteen-day pupation after which yet another generation of worker bees bite off the roofs of their cradles and join in the busy life of the hive in larger cells the queen deposits eggs which are not fertilized these develop into drones still later in the season royal cells are constructed in which the queen lays fertilized eggs identical with those laid in the ordinary worker cells but the grubs which hatch out receive a special royal jelly from the mouths of their attendants instead of the usual fare of masticated pollen and the effect of this diet is to make the grubs develop into princesses instead of workers it should be noted that a queen bee receives from a drone in the course of her nuptial flight a store of sperm cells with which she may fertilize the eggs she is laying during the next year or more it depends on the egg-laying movements of the queen whether the laid egg is fertilized or not the swarm then comes a remarkable upheaval of the busy hive the departure of a swarm headed by the queen bee whether swarming is due to the overcrowded state of the hive or to the queen's excitement when her young rivals are stirring in the royal cradles or to a sudden desire on the part of the workers a hearkening back to the time when there were no hives and motherhood was not given only to one among thousands a desire to break out of their prison bounds of order commendable toil chill maidenly propriety who shall say but suddenly the routine of the hive is broken through the work is suspended and many of the workers become restless and excited and gorge themselves with honey till at a given signal the swarm issues from the hive in a tense direct vibrating uninterrupted stream that at once dissolves and melts into space where the myriad transparent furious wings leave a tissue throbbing with sound the mad joyous dance in the sunlight over the swarm returns to the earth and now there is the morrow to consider and a new home has to be built scouts go out and when they have found a suitable site the workers at once begin to fashion a new comb in which the queen lays eggs and so a new city springs up the hexagonal cells of the comb are made of thin plates of plabble wax 
which comes from little pockets on the bee's abdomen. To start the secretion of the wax, great heat is needed, so the bees gather together in a great pendant mass, till a strained sweat, white as snow and airier than the down of a wing, is beginning to break over the swarm. The worker bee removes the wax scales from her body, and with a pair of pinchers she has at one of her knee joints and then shoes them into soft paste which can be moulded into the delicate fabric of the cells honeycomb the bee's comb is one of the wonders of the world in spite of its extraordinary fragility it is able to suspend a weight thirty times as great as its own a small block of wax attached to the roof of the hive makes the foundation from which the layers of the cells grow downward and sideways leaving a gangway for the streams of bees to pass to and fro the usual shape of the cells is hexagonal individually well suited for the cylindrical body of a grub together ideally constructed to prevent the waste of space but bees adapt themselves to unusual circumstances and build triangular square or, or other cells in odd corners if the need arises the cells are not quite horizontally placed having a slight upward tilt which prevents the spilling of thin honey extreme delicacy of touch is required in the moulding of the plastic wax for the one to one hundred eighty part of an inch is the thickness of the tissue paper like cell walls the nuptial flight while the new colony is rapidly growing up life continues in the old hive it is in fact about to renew its youth one of the princesses is awaking and the remaining workers are watching over her she appears from the shelter of the royal nursery and the workers brush her and clean her and caress her impelled by some strange instinct she immediately seeks the other cradles tears open the cells and relentlessly stings her sisters her possible rivals to death a few days later on a bright and sunny day she leaves the hive for her nuptial flight she soars aloft into the blue sky followed by a crowd of drones from neighboring hives and somewhere in the solitude of the blue the strongest male overtakes her and meets love and death in the same instant and the bride widow returns to the hive massacre of the males for the remainder of the summer the busy life of the hive goes on as before the queen perpetually egg-laying the workers foraging and nursing the drones leading a life of ease but one day the decree goes forth that those who do not work shall not eat indeed shall not live and the massacre of the males begins vigorously and pitilessly the long-suffering workers at last turn on the drones and slay them all flowers are becoming scarce and the days are short and chilly so the bees cease their labors and prepare for the long sleep of winter if sleep it could be called for the life of the hive is slackened but not completely arrested the bees gather together in a great cluster with their queen in their midst and by the beating of their wings they keep up a current of warm air the bees nearest the store cupboards pass honey to their neighbors and so food is circulated through the drowsy mass enough to keep the fire of life glowing ready to burst into flame again with the return of spring among different kinds of bees there are different degrees of sociability some such as the leaf-cutting bee are quite solitary others show a certain amount of cooperation combined with a large amount of independence end of section nineteen section twenty of the outline of science volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michelle the Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. Chapter 14. Natural History, Part 3. The Insect World, Section 3. The Humble Bee. The humble bees, Bombus, live in communities, which last for one season only. The queen humble bee, after her autumn nuptial flight, creeps into a hole under a sun-warmed bank, and there lies torpid throughout the cold weather spring awakens her and she sets to work to prepare for her expected brood she secretes wax makes a few cells and lays her eggs in these she has herself to discharge the whole labor of foraging for honey and pollen keeping the cells clean kneading the bee bread and feeding and tending the hungry larva she is a queen in the sense of being the mother of the whole colony but she is a very hard-working queen for a time later when the first batch of young ones which are always workers are fully developed they take the domestic details on themselves and the queen can now devote herself to her true business of motherhood as in the case of wasps the community dissolves at the end of the summer workers and drones all dying but a few young queens surviving through the winter to found the colonies of the following year 
In this and in many other cases, it is difficult to know whether one should speak of a large family or of an incipient society. Section 5. The Story of Wasps' Nests Even solitary wasps instinctively provide for their young, though they die before these hatch out. They deposit the eggs in a shelter and leave with them a larder of fresh meat in the shape of living insects rendered unresisting by the paralyzing effect of the wasp sting on their nerve centers. The social wasps live in communities which last from spring to autumn. Winter is a time of inactivity, but in some secluded spot, a cranny in a wall or a sheltered nook in a rubbish heap, the queen wasp who made it at the end of the season is sleeping her winter sleep tiding over the hard months in a state of passiveness in much the same attitude that her body assumed during the pupa stage with the coming of spring she reawakens and the season's activities are soon in full swing the queen's first care is to choose a suitable site for the nest she is about to build and a cavity in the shelter of the gnarled roots of an overthrown tree is as good as any then she sets to work to collect wood fibre which she rasps with her jaws from posts and palings this wood pulp she kneads with her saliva into thin paper with which the nest is built she spreads the first layer on the root she has chosen as the foundation from which to hang the structure and gradually hour by hour pellet by pellet she moulds a disc and then a stalk and then a canopy to shelter the first layer of cells in each cell as it is completed she deposits an egg which she cements to the cell wall for the open end of the cell is directed downwards in a few days the legless grubs emerge and the queen becomes a nurse as well as a home builder until the older grubs mature and a staff of worker wasps is ready to take on the manual labor and allow the queen to devote herself to egg laying the workers add to the original comb and suspend a new story from it by little stalks one story is added after another the rounded outer covering is also extended by being hollowed out inside and added to outside this outer envelope may consist of as many as a dozen layers of the paper, which is a waterproof and non-conducting material, so that the necessary temperature for the development of the young is kept up. The entrance opening of the envelope is always at the foot of the pendant nest, and all the openings of the combs point towards it, so that the young are reared in inverted cradles. The young wasp grub at first keeps its position by clinging with its tail to the egg envelope, while it pokes its head out for food, but later uses its jaws and a sort of sucker foot on its tail as grasping organs. If it does happen to fall out, the worker nurses will probably throw it out of the nest, just as they do with rubbish when they are cleaning. The first thing the fully formed young wasp does, if it has safely passed through its head downwards larval and pupa stages, is to crawl about and visit the grubs, tapping them on the head till they emit a tiny drop of fluid, which the young wasp licks greedily. Then, it is ready to help its mother with the housework, and in a few days it is strong enough to go out on foraging expeditions. The mother wasp also visits the grubs for this delectable drop. How the wasp works and dies. The young wasp's duties at first consist mainly of paper making and building, for the nest is continually growing. She works backwards so that she does not tread on the newly applied pulp, and she molds her material to the proper thickness, testing it with her feelers but after a week or two her salviary glands are exhausted so that she has to give up the manufacture of paper and turn to the older wasp's task of caring for the young feeding them with the soft parts of insects and occasional sips of fruit juice or nectar and cleaning them with care so through the summer the busy life of the community goes on the queen has laid thousands of eggs and a great army of her daughters is engaged in enlarging the nest which may now have seven or eight tiers or combs enclosed in a great ball of gray paper in keeping it scrupulously clean and in caring for the rising generations some of these workers though they are never impregnated may occasionally lay eggs which like the unfertilized eggs of the queen invariably develop into males as the summer wanes the workers build larger cells in the lower combs these are the royal nurseries in which a brood of perfect females not sterile workers and males are reared on this brood the future of the race depends a few weeks and a great change takes place summer is still here and the wasp colony is at the height of its prosperity a healthy active community then the chill finger of autumn passes over it and the first shiver marks the beginning of the decline of the colony prosperity is succeeded by starvation and there are no stores to fall back on and the deadly numbness and demoralization break down the orderly routine of the nest 
the exhausted workers die in their thousands and with them the parent queen none but the young royalty survive and the males only long enough to mate with the young queens thereafter they also die the young queens destined to found new colonies next spring alone escape the common fate but the demoralization shows itself in them too for they devour the remaining eggs and larvae and on this rather cannibal fare they are able to survive the winter section six life histories story of cabbage white butterfly the food of insects is extremely varied not only in different species but also within a single life history and it naturally follows that there is much variety in the ways of obtaining it and in particular in the structure of the appendages associated with the mouth insects depend greatly on their sense of smell we are in search of suitable food the organs of smell minute olfactory pits or bristles are found chiefly on the antenna some insects move their feelers markedly on coming near strong smelling substances and some are unable to find their appropriate food without the aid of their antenna for instance carrion beetles which have had their antenna removed were found to be incapable of locating their evil smelling food a very striking example of change of diet is seen in the life history of a butterfly such as the common cabbage white butterfly the small sculptured eggs are laid in large numbers on the plant which is to form the food of the caterpillars the caterpillar emerges from the egg as a worm-like short-legged little animal green against the green of its natural haunt with simple eyes short feelers stumpy abdominal prolegs in addition to the three pairs of jointed thoracic appendages and strong hard jaws well suited for gnawing green food its business in life is to feed and to grow and it feeds rapidly and almost continuously it may eat many times its own weight in a day but probably only digests the fluid part of the food it outgrows its inexpansible chitinous covering and has to molt it an exhausting and dangerous process then it feeds and grows and molts again until at its limit of growth it passes into a resting phase it becomes a pupa or chrysalis the cabbage white butterfly larva suspends itself in a quiet corner by a silken thread with its tail against a support and the larval skin forms the pupa case but in many other pupa example many moths have the additional protection of a cocoon either of pure silk secreted at the jaws or of silk mixed with leaves moss or other extrinsic matter the larva example the caterpillar now undergoes the great change which is called metamorphosis within the cocoon the body of the larva is broken down and is built up again on a new architectural plan when the reconstruction is completed the fully formed insect emerges what a contrast it is now an intensely active butterfly having left behind it the shriveled skin of the creeping caterpillar and for a brief season it lives its aerial life growing not at all feeding but little and then only on liquid nectar by means of the long sucking tubes so different from the strong biting jaws of the caterpillar hunger is no longer the preoccupation the butterfly lives for love and before it dies it deposits its eggs on the green plant which it cannot itself eat but which forms the right food material for the offspring it does not survive to see beetles beetles are essentially biters with very strong and hard mouth parts one part of which the mandibles are sometimes of relatively enormous size with sharp saw-like edges many of them such as the weevils are vegetarians feeding on green plants or on the bark and wood of trees but many others are carnivorous and destroy numbers of wireworms leather jackets the larva of the daddy long legs sawfly larva and other insects which are detrimental to crops others again feed on the decaying flesh of dead animals and the busy burying beetles which join forces in their work act as useful bands of scavengers an important linkage other groups of insects with quite different mouth appendages belong to the sucking types which feed on liquid food instead of cutting toothed jaws they have sucking tubes often accompanied by sharp piercing needles such as in the mosquito which pierce the skin and suck in the blood of the victim the nectar of flowers is another great source of liquid food and it is sought by bees butterflies moths and others which have sucking mouth organs perhaps the most important linkage in the whole system of animate nature is the linkage between flowers and their welcome insect visitors for these visitors secure cross fertilization and this is often essential to seed bearing section seven life histories 
There are various ways in which the young forms of insects hatch out from the shells within which they develop. Some caterpillars eat through the shell, some maggots wriggle until it breaks, and some larvae have special instruments for the purpose. Thus the larval flea has a temporary piercing organ on its head. Many larvae differ markedly from the adult forms, and they are of several different types. They may be active, long-legged, flat-bodied, campodiform larvae, very like the primitive bristle-tails, example, many beetle larvae, mayflies, stoneflies, etc., or they may belong to the more worm-like eruciform groups such as the caterpillars, example, young of moths and butterflies. Maggots and various grubs, these may be more sedentary in habit. In the course of the life history of many insects, a marked change of form takes place, metamorphosis. According to the degree of metamorphosis, insects are divided into three groups. 1. When no metamorphosis occurs and the young are hatched as miniatures of the adults, example, the most lowly insects, as the springtails and bristletails. 2. An intermediate group comprises those insects which show partial metamorphosis. In this type, the insect is able to move and feed practically throughout its development. The change is a gradual one, through a series of molts made necessary by the inexpansible armor of the chitin. The insect reaches adult condition. For instance, the young locust, as it emerges from the egg, has a pale, soft body swathed in transparent skin. It sheds its mantle and, gaining strength in the sunlight, becomes firm and black, only differing from its parents in size color markings and the absence of wings it feeds hungrily on vegetable substances and grows and molts each molt leaving it larger brighter and hungrier than before until after the third molt its wings begin to show the molting process lasts only about half an hour and the locust only stops feeding for a few hours no phase of torpor or quiescence occurs in this half metamorphosis type and after the fifth skin casting the locust is a perfect winged insect, soft and helpless, and very vulnerable for a time, but rapidly regaining firmness and vigor. 3. When complete metamorphosis occurs, a quiescent pupil or chrysalis stage comes between the larval and adult stages. Growth occurs during the larval stage, a period of voracious feeding, rapid growth, and numerous molts. The larva eats far more than is necessary to maintain its life and lays up a reserve store which provides for the resting pupil stage which follows the pupil stage is a time of little or no external activity but great internal changes the larval tissues are broken down and their substance is restructured into the very different tissues of the adult from the pupa case the adult insect emerges different in form and habit winged and aerial the metamorphosis implies far more than the acquisition of wings and one of the most marked differences between larva and adult is in most cases of difference in food and the method of taking it. This is so great that the transition from larval to adult habits could not take place along with continuous external activity. The quiescent period of reconstruction is essential. Section 8. Insects and Man A great many insects live their busy days and perish without affecting man at all except that they delight him with their exquisite colors and markings and interest him with their ways but some are his friends and perhaps more he reckons his foes even the bee he too often shrinks from remembering the weapon she carries and forgetting her honey and the infinite service she renders by securing the pollination of many flowers the termite may be as much a tiller of the soil as the earthworm is but she attacks his furniture and the wood of his house the cocknail and lack that insects provide are relatively insignificant and locusts and honey may be thought of as a dainty dish in the east but a locust swarm will blight every green thing in a district he scatters the seed and when he looks for green heads to appear the earth opens and lo an army of long-faced yellow grasshoppers comes forth locusts wherever locusts are resident they do a great deal of damage but it is their sudden migratory swarms which are so disastrous they increase in numbers during favorable seasons then one year when the food supply is insufficient they collect in immense swarms and travel long distances devouring every green thing in their path a tobacco grower saw a swarm of locusts descend on a plantation of forty thousand young plants twenty seconds later not a leaf remained the old testament speaks of the locusts as one of the plagues of egypt 
they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left and there remained not a green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field through all the land of egypt in addition to the formidable list of insects larvae and adults injurious to plants another list must be added of those which affect the health of man and of his stock there are a number of ways in which insects may affect the health of man they may have poisonous bites or stings as in the case of certain bugs bees wasps etc which cause inflammation and sometimes feverishness or they may be parasitic true parasites such as fleas and lice or accidental parasites such as fly maggots which sometimes reach the stomach and cause great pain again they may carry disease germs most important of all are the cases in which an insect is an essential host in the development of a disease producing organism without which the life history of the organism cannot be completed for example the mosquito is not only the means of introducing into the blood of man the protozoan which causes malaria but the life history of the malaria organism cannot proceed without the insect the different stages can only be reached within the bodies of man and mosquito respectively so that the extermination of mosquitoes would wipe out malarial fever in other cases the insect is not necessary to the life of the disease producer but acts as a transmitter as in the case of plague where the bacillus is conveyed from rats to man by means of rat fleas which inoculate the victims while biting further cases of disease carrying form another list those are the simple carriers such as the common house fly it is not a blood-sucking insect but it has a body and legs thickly covered with hairs particularly well suited for transferring germs such as those of typhoid fever from place to place and it thus brings the microbes of the garbage heap to its next feeding place our dinner tables there is a long list of diseases in which insects play an important part typhus fever and lice sleeping sickness and tsetse flies relapsing fever and lice and many others many insects also affect the domestic animals for example the bot flies which cause severe boils and other disorders in cattle such examples out of the list serve to show some of the complex interrelations between man and insects and to indicate some of the aspects of the struggle for existence man's enemies are innumerable he tames the wild beasts and domestication brings its own penalty for a sucking insect wipes out a whole herd he exterminates great flesh-eating animals that would rival him but a common house fly brings microscopic germs to his table and spreads death through his cities it is hardly too much to say that the tendency of injurious insects to prolific multiplication is a continual menace to civilization and it should lead us to attach increasing importance to the preservation of the numerous insectivorous birds which maintain the balance of nature but this is a subject which will be discussed in a special article dealing with interrelations end of section twenty Section 21 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. JXChristopher at Yahoo.com. The Outline of Science, Volume 2 by J. Arthur Thompson. The Science of the Mind, Part 1. The Science of the Mind, The New Psychology, Psychoanalysis It is something of a paradox that the most difficult thing the mind finds to master is the mind itself. In recent years, science has applied itself to the problem with a new keenness. Much attention has been given to the special study of the mind of the child, and valuable results have been obtained from the study of animal behavior. In particular, there have been many investigations at work on what has become known as a new psychology, which concerns itself largely with abnormal mental phenomena and subconscious operations, that part of mental activity which lies beyond the region of normal consciousness. Practically all the recent work in psychology has gone to show that there are elements in our minds of which we are unconscious, and that these elements often take a greater share in shaping our behavior than do the elements of which we are directly aware. The conception of the human mind has, in fact, undergone a profound change. It is revealed as a larger and more complicated affair than we had supposed, and we now see that what we had taken to be the mind is, in reality, a superficial, although very valuable part of a man's total mind. The Senses Sense experience forms the foundation of our mental life. In the course of long ages of evolution, our sense organs have evolved, 
and have given rise to that wonderful organ, the human brain. It is through the senses that all materials with which the mind builds up the higher forms of experience, memory, imagination, and thought, are obtained. For the senses are the gateways of knowledge. It would be going beyond the scope of our subject to describe fully the evolution of our various organs of sense, the mechanism of the eye, the ear, and so on. By these instruments, we are able to image and focus the world outside of us. A sensation depends on some physical influence, the stimulus affecting some part of the outer or inner surfaces, or tissues of the body. In most cases, there is a special organ adapted to receive the stimulus, and so to transform its action into a nerve impulse for transmission to the brain, such as the eye, the ear, parts of the skin, and so on. The acquisition of the sense of sight vastly enlarged the horizon and widened the mental range. And so with hearing, which is the most recently acquired of our specialized senses. We know that the senses are not infallible. They are limited and imperfect. But there is no evidence whatever that the development of our senses has reached finality. The Brain The structure of the brain was briefly referred to in the section dealing with physiology. We need recall only that there are several main divisions of the brain, each with its own peculiar functions. The brain proper consists of the cerebrum, or larger brain, which occupies the whole of the upper and front parts of the cavity of the skull. It is divided into two great cerebral hemispheres, right and left, which are linked together by numerous nerve fibers. The outer surface, or cortex of the forebrain, is the seat of sensation and volition. It is a wrinkled or convoluted fold of gray cellular matter, which, if smoothed out, would cover a little over a foot and a half square. There are, in the convoluted part of our forebrain, the cerebral cortex, five or six times as many nerve cells as there are human beings in the world, and the complexity of interrelations is past all telling. The cerebellum, or lesser brain, lies at the back of the head, and below it is a medulla, whose functions have been previously explained. We need not, therefore, further enlarge on the outline of our nervous system. The cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, spinal cord, and nerves. That marvelous structure, the human brain, is the product of millions of years. Its history begins with life itself. The brain is a republic of nerve centers. Each part has its own peculiar function, and all in interaction. There are parts of the brain whose function is unknown, parts which we believe serve for memory, judgment, and imagination. There is reason to suppose that one part is the seat of the processes associated with remembrance of articulation, that another is similarly associated with memory of the sound of words, yet another part of the brain is associated with visual images of words and letters. There is no lobe in the brain that is the seat of intelligence. It is the whole cortex, we might almost say, the whole nervous system, or the whole body, that is concerned in intelligence, not any single region of it. It is by the plasticity, the power of adapting itself to new ways of learning, registering, and repeating new coordinations of actions, that the brain is marked out from the rest of the body, and even from the rest of the nervous system. Great ability, great intelligence even, are not dependent primarily on the brain. Mind in Evolution When we look back over the vaguely discerned evolution of animal behavior, we find that it had its starting point in the tentative movements of simple creatures, as has been explained in a previous chapter. We see such tentative movements in the very lowliest creatures. At an early stage there must have been established a number of particular answers, involuntary muscular and nervous movements to stimuli, which became enregistered in the creature, and these ingrained capacities increase in number. We discern a persisting state of the organism which varies the answer. There is probably a very simple expression of conation or endeavor. And in time, we come to perceive something of purposive behavior. With the establishment of a nervous system, there was opened up the possibility of a new kind of organism, that of reflex actions and tropisms, which play an important role in behavior, an organization which heredity perpetrates. Reflex actions are automatic movements of nerve cells and muscle cells of lower animals, which secure a fit and proper answer to a recurrent stimulus. Tropisms are on a somewhat higher plane. 
they are forced or obligatory movements of the animal as a whole. That is to say, every creature of the same kind, and in the same physiological state, will behave in the same way. On a still higher level, we have instinctive behavior, which reaches its purest expression in ants, bees, and wasps. In birds and mammals, it is more likely to occur in cooperation with intelligence. Instinctive behavior agrees with reflex acts in not requiring to be learned, in being dependent on hereditary nervous predispositions, and in being exhibited approximately in the same way by all similar individuals of the species. We have discussed previously the history of these progressive evolutionary advances culminating in intelligent behavior, and we saw wherein lay their survival value. We need not consider them further here. Reflex actions, tropisms, and instinctive behavior have become part of the inborn hereditary constitution of all higher animals. The question may be asked, what, besides what we call our mental faculties and our instincts, forms part of our natural inheritance? In other words, what compromises the innate constitution of the human mind? The question is not easy to answer. Dr. McDougall puts the question in the following form. Does the native basis of mind comprise any disposition in addition to those which enter into the composition of the instincts? And if so, to what extent are they systematically linked together? We cannot answer this question with a negative. There is certainly much besides the faculties and the instincts comprised within the native basis of each human mind. If there were not, it would be impossible adequately to account for the vast superiority of mind of the human adult to that of the highest of the animal. Some of those who regard the mind purely from the physiological standpoint, and who believe that all we have called the structure of the mind can be adequately described in terms of the organized structure of the brain, take the view that the superiority of the native endowment of man consists chiefly or wholly in the presence of the brain of the infant, a great mass of unorganized nervous tissue which offers unlimited possibilities of progressive organization. But, even if we accepted the assumption that the structure of the mind can be wholly described in terms of nervous disposition and their connections, we could not accept the view that nothing of the mental organization beyond the instincts is innate. The bearing which all this has on our present problem is this. Can we say that the particular kind of activity known to us as thinking, feeling, and willing is implicit in the germ cell just beginning to develop into an organism of great complexity, an individuality in the one cell phase of its being, a mind-body or body-mind telescope down? It varies, it makes experiments, it makes its own essays, an internal rearrangement, and self-expression. The germ cell is a sort of blind artist, its sketches are submitted to the criticism of the fully formed organism, the seeing artist, who will put them in the proper light and bring out what there is in them of value. If the amoeba has in its small way a mind, an aspect of itself corresponding to our mind, and if the amoeba uses it when it goes hunting, two not unreasonable hypotheses, then it may be that the germ cell also has its analogue of mind, a not unreasonable hypothesis, since it develops into a creature with a mind. It is not the province of psychology to explain what mind is. That belongs to the region of philosophy. Still, the great problem which holds an interest for us is concerned with the relation that exists between body and mind. Is mind independent and distinct from the body, or is it merely an activity of the brain cells, a product of nerve stimulation? Mind and Matter Men have argued endlessly on the relation of mind and matter. To discuss even briefly the various theories, and there are many, would take a volume. What the precise connection between mind and body is, no one as yet has been able to say with any degree of certainty. On the mechanistic view, as it may be called, the mind is a direct product of the brain, and has no separate independent existence. Every act of intelligence, every mental activity, is due to a physiological mechanism. Every thought is a result of chemical or mechanical changes in the brain. An idea is but an explosion or discharge of the brain cell. An emotion is an activity of the brain bursting into flame. Every feeling of love, aspiration, or fear can be explained as due to purely physical changes which produce the vapor of thought, or the aroma of virtue. If it be held that during life all mental processes have their physiological concomitants, it is clear that these physiological concomitants, namely the molecular changes in the nerve center, 
would, if completely ascertained, afford an accurate index of the mental processes. But no one has ever shown what the chemical or mechanical changes are by which thought and feeling are produced. Mechanism, as applied to mind, remains a mere hypothesis. An hypothesis, it may be added, to which philosophy gives no support. Another view is that the mind is a separate existence. The relation of mind to body is, on this view, frequently held to be one of parallelism. The two series, mental and physical, are independent of each other. Each runs its own course, as two railway trains running side by side on a double track, or two rays of light projected towards the same infinitely distant point run parallel with one another in time and space. There is no cross-effect from one to the other. Each is a closed system with its own laws. When consistently held, this view does not carry us much farther than the first view. Each point in the mental series must have its counterpart in the physical series. The laws that are established for the physical must also account for the psychical events. A third view is animism, the soul theory, the belief that there is an individual mind in each living animal body, that between the mind and its organism a vital relationship holds, that the life processes are both mental and physical that the directing force in evolution is to be found in the minds of the individual organism, the urge of feeling in the lower, the increasing strength of emotion and will, with the widening scope of interest and of thought in the higher organisms. Many arguments can be brought forward both for and against this theory, but we cannot discuss these here. There has also been much discussion of what is called the two-aspect theory, to which biological facts incline many inquirers. The theory assumes a psychophysical being, a reality which we know under two aspects. We think of the organism as one, as, while it lives, an indissoluble psychophysical being. The living creature gives an account of itself in two ways. It can know itself as something extended and intricately built up, burning away, moving, throbbing. It can also know itself as a seed of sensations, perceptions, feelings, wishes, thoughts. But there is not one process, thinking, and another process, cerebral metabolism, vital processes and nerve cells. There is a psychophysical life, a reality which we know under two aspects. Cerebral control and mental activity are, on this view, different aspects of one natural occurrence. What we have to do with is the unified life of a psychophysical being, a body-mind or mind-body. The advantages of the two-aspect theory, if it is tenable, are that it does justice to the extraordinary intimate independence of what we may call mental processes and brain processes. It regards them as two equally real aspects of the continuous life of the organisms. The objective side is the body as a living whole. The subjective side, in man's case, is the unity of the mind. In these days, the now old-fashioned materialism of the previous generation, as Mr. Bertrand Russell says, receives no support from modern physical science if, as seems to be the case, physics does not assume the existence of matter. We saw in a previous chapter, The Foundation of the Universe, what the new view of the constitution of matter is. The atom of every element of matter is revealed as a particle of electricity. What electricity itself is, we do not know. But we see how it comes about that the physicist tends to think of matter as less and less material. So does the chemist, and so the biologist. In that sense, the old-fashioned materialism has gone. The view of Mr. William James and others is that the stuff of the world is neither mental nor material, but, for lack of a better name, a neutral stuff, out of which both are constructed. Mr. Bertrand Russell, in his work The Analysis of Mind, endeavors to develop this view as regards mental phenomena. We cannot sum up the problem better than another writer who says, Supposing we were able to understand all the phenomena, chemical, physical, physiological, of this intricate mechanism, we would be no nearer a solution of the problem of the connection between the objective and the subjective impacts of the phenomena. A philosophy which recognizes both sets of phenomena, mental and physical, mutually adjusted and ever interacting, recognizes the facts of the case, and does not delude the mind by offering a solution which is in reality no solution at all. The difficulty is somewhat lessened if we assume that behind all physical and mental phenomena there is a metaphysical essence, conscious or unconscious, 
and that the phenomena we term physical and mental are only different sides of the same kind. Such an essence can never be known to science, and the discussion of the possibility of its existence and of its properties belongs to the province of philosophy. Mental Processes Psychology is the science of the mind, or more strictly, let us say it is a science of the behavior of living things. It includes the study of consciousness. In the sense that the brain receives all those nervous impulses that result in consciousness, it would be true to say that the brain is a seat of consciousness. But that does not provide a solution of the problem of the origin of consciousness. No one doubts that consciousness has a material substratum. But the problem of the relation between the mental state and the molecular movements on nervous matter is as far from solution as in the days when little was known of the physiology of the nervous system. The old-fashioned method was to assign to the mind certain so-called faculties, perception, conception, imagination, reason, will, to explain the operations which they denote. The mind has not its will here, its consciousness there, and its reason somewhere else. It reasons, wills, and is conscientious as a whole. Thought, feeling, and will do not lie side by side, as it were, like stones in a mosaic, any of which could be removed without destroying the rest. They rather resemble the functions of the body, none of which are possible without the cooperation of all the others. Another way to describe mental activity was to regard every idea as capable of existing in two conditions, or forms. On the one hand, it might be a conscious idea, or exist in consciousness. Consciousness being spoken of as an illuminated chamber into which ideas enter in turn, to be lit up and active for a short period. And on the other hand, it might exist as an unconscious idea in the memory, a sort of Hades or dim underworld to which each idea, or its ghost, returns after its brief exposure to the light of consciousness, there to await and to seize any opportunity of emerging again into light and life. Within this underworld, ideas remain linked together in complex groupings. The whole assembly of ideas, thus linked in the obscurity of memory, constitutes the structure of the mind, and mental activity consists in each idea dragging up after it into the light whatever ideas are linked or associated with it. When we come to the mind proper we may, using a purely pictorial analogy, regard it as consisting of three layers. The top layer we may call the region of the conscious life. It is, as it were, a vividly illuminated region where everything that goes on is clearly seen. It is to this region that we normally refer when we seek the explanation of our conduct, and, as we shall see, the explanations we obtain in that way are often wrong. A little below this clear region is a semi-conscious region, a region which can become accessible to us by effort. It is in this region, for instance, that the information, which is not present to our minds, but which we can remember, may be considered to be stored. Sometimes the contents of this region can be exhumed only by considerable effort. Sometimes a very slight stimulus is sufficient. Beneath this layer again lies the region of the unconscious, and this region is, normally, quite inaccessible to our conscious mind. The description we have given is, of course, figurative, since we cannot suppose that the mind occupies space. But this division into layers is helpful in enabling us to understand the modern theories of the mind. The unconscious is the seat of the mental elements associated with the great primary instincts, and it is a great source of psychic energy. Of the activities going on in it, we have no direct knowledge. We can infer something, however, as we shall see later, from observation, and more especially, according to some authorities, from dreams. The unconscious is the very basis of the psychic life of the individual. The Importance of Complexes Mental phenomena never occur singly, but always in some complex combination or another. It will help us in understanding the nature of the mind to consider it as a network of mental elements. Every mental element, every idea as we say, which comes into the conscious mind calls up others. There are associations of ideas, to use the language of the older psychologist. It is because ideas are associated that we are able to go about our daily lives. If no idea suggested any others, or if others were suggested purely at haphazard, we should never be able even to cross the road. 
A number of mental elements associated together so as to form some more or less loosely knit system is called a complex. To some men, for instance, the sight or sound of a typewriter may always, or usually, suggest to them an office. The smell of a certain flower may always bring back some early experience, and so on. Associations of this kind, associations of ideas, as it were, are called complexes. We may think, if we like, of ideas forming groups, and the whole of the contents of the mind as made up of groups of ideas, complexes. Further, complexes vary enormously in the emotional energy associated with them. Besides the great number of minor complexes brought about by a man's education, the nature of his work, and so on, there are so-called universal complexes. These are the complexes which center round the three great primary instincts, or groups of instincts, and they are known as the sex complex, the ego complex, and the herd complex. Complexes which directly center around the great primary instincts such as sex are associated with a great fund of emotional energy. The actual mental elements present in the sex complex of any particular man, besides depending on inherited characteristics, depend also on his personal history. The ego complex, associated with the primary instincts of nutrition and self-preservation, has most of its elements beneath the conscious level. And the same may be said of the herd complex, which depends upon the gregarious instinct in man, and which plays an enormously important part in his life, as we shall see. Amongst the three great universal complexes, the ego complex is the oldest and most profound. This is the complex with which is associated man's recognition of his self. This very powerful complex may give rise to all sorts of unpleasant manifestations, to various exhibitions of greed and of the desire of self-aggrandizement. But it also gives rise to some of the most beneficent of man's activities. Amongst these, we may mention the desire for construction, for the making of something which is a personal achievement, whether it be a house, a poem, or a system of philosophy. The desire to construct has certainly been one of the most potent factors in human advancement. The Herd Complex The second great universal complex is the Herd Complex, and this, as we have already said, depends upon the fact that man is gregarious. We do not know at what point in man's development he first developed the gregarious instinct. It must have been quite early, however, that man began to live in association with his fellows. The advantages bestowed by gregariousness are obvious. But the instinct of gregariousness brings with it certain consequences which are of the utmost importance in the psychic life. This instinct brings with it great suggestibility. The individual, as a member of the herd, must be very suggestible to impulses coming from the herd in order to act in harmony with it. He must be able to yield unquestioning obedience to the voice of the herd. In the case of man, his rational faculty, combined with his suggestibility as a gregarious animal, leads to the most diversified manifestations. The great bulk of man's opinions are, in reality, strictly non-rational, and are products purely of herd suggestion. But that does not prevent him rationalizing them. Many of them he does not trouble to rationalize. They appear to him obvious as obvious as that good food is desirable. They come with instinctive force. The moral code in force in a community furnishes a set of beliefs of this kind. This set of beliefs changes from time to time and from country to country, but whatever set of beliefs may be in vogue in any particular community at any particular time is obviously right. Two Main Types we cannot consider in detail the manifestations of the three great groups of primary instincts, but we may discuss, for a moment, two types, and one or other of which nearly every human being can be classed. These two types of human beings are called by Mr. Trotter the stable and unstable types. The stable type is the type which is often described as forming the backbone of the country. A man of this kind is energetic, strong-willed, and full of settled convictions. He is perfectly at home with the laws and traditions of the community of which he is a member. His aims are of the kind that the community as a whole can understand and approve, and he is steadfast in his pursuit of them. He has decided views on moral questions, and on political and any other subjects. He is never in doubt as to what is right and what is wrong. 
The great drawback to this type is its insensitiveness to experience. It is incapable of surveying any question from an entirely fresh standpoint. Indeed, it is apt to regard the searching questioning of accepted and established things, such as a code of moralities or a system of politics, as either foolish or wicked or both. Great changes in current practice and ideas, however desirable such changes may be, cannot be affected by the class of people, and it predominates in numbers, which has the strong prevailing gregarious instinct, in other words, in which the herd complex is strongly ingrained. The unstable type has qualities almost exactly opposite to those of the stable type. Thus, a man of this type has very few settled convictions, although he may have plenty of enthusiasms. He can easily be won to a new cause, and he as easily falls away therefrom. He may undertake a number of projects, but it is unlikely that he will persist with any one of them long enough to carry it into a successful conclusion. He has what is called a weak will, and he can by no means accept the ruling of the community on all questions. His great positive merit is his sensitiveness to experience, and indeed it is from this that all his trouble springs. He is always changing his mind, because he is always open to fresh impressions. He is usually the intellectual superior of the stable type, although the stable type often despises him. But each type has its great disadvantage, and neither represents what a human being could and should be. Conflicts The fact that different complexes may be incompatible with one another leads us to the important question of conflict. A perfectly healthy mind is a mind which has established complete harmony between its different complexes. But the perfectly healthy mind, in this sense, is very rare. We usually find that several of a man's complexes are incompatible with one another, and on those occasions when more than one are aroused, there is a conflict between them. Thus it may often happen that a man's selfish desires, those springing perhaps from his ego complex or his sex complex, conflict with the moral code of the community, a code which has great weight with him, because it is associated with his herd complex. Such conflicts are favorite themes for novelists. The father, torn between patriotism and his love for his son. The intending monk, torn between his religion and his love of his family. The man torn between an illicit love passion and a sense of morality. Conflict plays a prominent part in the psychic life of most people, and it leads to very important consequences. For the conflict must be settled, and there are two very important ways of settling it. There is the method of rationalization. One of the conflicting complexes is allowed to triumph, but not consciously. Reasons are invented for the resultant action which have nothing to do with its psychic cause, but which prevent the man from feeling ashamed, as we say. Thus, a primitive, brutal desire for revenge may be disguised as justice. An exhibition of ruthless greed, as in some unscrupulous business deal, for instance, will be explained by pointing out that it is for the good of the community that its most efficient citizens should come to the top, and so with other conflicts. Another very important method of settling a painful conflict is by repression of one of its factors. It is this method which has been chiefly studied by Freud, and he has succeeded in showing how very great importance it is. A man decides completely to ignore one of his conflicting complexes. He puts it out of his mind, but, as Freud has shown, the ignored complex is not thereby destroyed. It is repressed into the unconscious, but it is still energetic and may manifest its existence in a number of ways, ranging from certain phenomena of forgetfulness down to hysteria and insanity. It may happen, for instance, that the repressed complex leads to a certain kind of forgetfulness, a forgetfulness of those things with which it is associated. A man may forget an appointment from which he anticipated something unpleasant, he may forget the existence of unpaid bills. Such cases are cases of active forgetting, and are to be distinguished from cases of passive forgetting, where the matter is forgotten simply because it made very little impression on the mind. A slip in speaking or writing may sometimes testify to a repressed complex, the substituted word corresponding to a wish, but a repressed wish of the speaker or writer, as when the president of the Austrian lower house announced that the sitting was closed when he should have said it was opened, the reason being that he privately expected no good from the sitting, 
and would have liked it closed. End of section 21. Recording by James Christopher. JX Christopher at yahoo.com. Section 22 of The Outline of Science, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson. The Science of the Mind, Part 2. Psychoanalysis. Professor Freud's Theories. A comparatively new branch of psychology is that closely associated with the work of Professor Freud of Vienna. It deals mainly with the phenomena of the unconscious. Whatever may be said of Freudian theories, they have at least opened up a wide field of study. Part of Freud's doctrine has become fairly well established. On the other hand, a great deal of it is regarded as merely ingenious theory, which is not generally accepted. This new psychology is of very great interest because of the bearing it has on medical practice and the work of the teacher. The chief theory of the Freudian psychology is that there is a great part of the mind of which we are unconscious, that this unconscious part exercises an enormous influence upon our thoughts and actions without ourselves being aware of it. Freud conceived the idea that the influence of the unconscious mind was especially active as a cause of dreams and thus he was led to his now familiar theory of the interpretation of dreams. The work of Professor Freud, his disciples and his critics, has thrown a flood of light upon the working of the human mind, and led to curious alterations of our own views upon dreams, insanity, myths, art, and religion. In dealing with patients who were suffering mainly from functional diseases of the nervous system, Freud found that what had been regarded as the symptoms of the disease such as paralysis of the limbs, blindness, deafness, and mutism, were frequently connected in some definite way with the original onset of the disease. Blindness, for example, might date from some violently painful occurrence of which the patient had been a witness. This connection was not, as a rule, recognized by the patient's waking consciousness, but it revealed itself occasionally to the doctor when the patient was hypnotized. Sometimes, also, it was brought out by the dreams which the patient described. But in general, the ordinary consciousness of the subject resisted all attempts to probe back to the original cause of the disease. Turning his attention to dreams, Freud found that in the case of normal individuals also there were painful experiences, never revived in the fully conscious mind, but playing a great part in the dreams of the subject, appearing there in a more or less disguised form, and that the interpretation of the dream in both normal and abnormal subjects invariably led back to some wish or desire of the individual which it was impossible for him, for physical, moral, or social reasons, to realize in waking life. The dream was the mimic realization of the wish. The instinctive or voluntary forgetting, Freud called repression. The repressed ideas were not, however, destroyed, but were constantly endeavoring to force their way back into consciousness. He gave the name of the unconscious to the mass of repressed memories of all kinds. For the repression of a wish involves also the repression of the whole system of experience to which the wish belongs. Hence, for example, the fact that we can rarely remember our infancy time at all. The Subconscious We have all some experience of what is called the subconsciousness. An idea, as it passes to and from the focus of consciousness, gradually becomes clear and vivid, then fades away into dimness and vagueness, till it is merged in the general mass of feeling and loses all distinctiveness. A word is on the tip of the tongue. Later, it is clearly thought and spoken. I have an appointment to remember. I do not think of it for hours, and then, in good time perhaps, it walks into my consciousness. I resolve to awake at six in the morning, and, if my mind is of the right kind, as the clock strikes six, or just before it, I awake. These are different cases in which an idea, a thought, is apparently not in consciousness, and yet not wholly out of it. The term subconsciousness has been used for this class of phenomena, where, apart from the dominant, or personal consciousness, certain strands of experience, 
which have once been conscious, continue somehow to live, and in due time make their influence felt in the dominant consciousness. The theory of Freud is that in the unconscious part of the mind there lie dormant memories of the past, and especially repressed impulses. These repressions represent the resistance we make to a wish or impulse which we think we ought not to satisfy, because it conflicts with some other interest, or they mean the effort we make to put out of our mind some unpleasant memory. The effort to repress may not be deliberate, it may be unconscious repression. In any case, there may be a repression to such an extent that the memories pass entirely from us, or, as it is held, they are pushed deep into the unconscious, where they continue to exist. We are asked to believe that the unconscious includes many impulses and memories which remain buried in the depths of the mind, and that they persist in trying to return to the living mind. Further, it is said that to some extent they do so, influencing the mental life even although we are not conscious of the influence at work. In this way, repressed tendencies are supposed to get a partial satisfaction. Cases of Mental Disorders the records of medical men and their work connected with nerve cases in military hospitals during the war has provided much material for the study of abnormal psychology of this kind. Cures for paralysis of various organs, of morbid obsessions, and unreasonable fears have been recorded and described by responsible members of the medical profession. The origin of many mental troubles has been traced to repression of disturbing emotional experiences, bygone and forgotten by the patient. The recalling or revival of such lost memories of patients by medical men skilled in psychopathology have, by clearing the mind of the patient, enabled physicians to effect many striking cures of mental disorder. The theory is that the bringing to light and the reliving of the suppressed emotional experience is a means of getting rid of excessive emotion. The patient is enabled to assume a new attitude towards them. By way of illustration, we may give one instance. The following case of the influence of forgotten experience is described by Dr. W. H. Rivers in The Lancet, and we take this excellent summary of it as given by Professor Valentine in his Dreams in the Unconscious. It is a case of a young medical officer who, even before the war, had a horror of closed-in spaces, such as tunnels and narrow cells. He would never travel by the tube railway and was seized with fear in a train which passed through a tunnel. One can imagine his intense distress when on entering a dugout he was given a spade and was told it was for use in case he was buried alive. His sleep was greatly disturbed, and his health became so bad that he was invalided home. Instructions to keep his thoughts from the war and to dwell exclusively on pleasant topics proved useless. He had terrifying dreams of warfare, from which he would awake, sweating profusely and thinking he was dying. At this stage he came under the care of Dr. Rivers. The patient was asked to try and remember any dreams he might have and to record any memories which come to his mind while thinking over the dreams. Shortly afterwards he had a dream, and as he lay in bed thinking it over, there came into his mind an incident which seemed to have happened when he was about three years of age, and which had so greatly affected him at the time that it now seemed to the patient almost impossible that it ever could have been forgotten. He recalled that, as a little boy, he and his friends used to visit an old man in a house near his own, and to take him odd articles discarded at home, in return for which they received a copper or two. On one occasion he went alone, down the long, dark passage leading to the old man's home, and on turning back found that the door at the opening of the passage had banged to, and he was unable to escape. Just then a dog in the passage began to bark savagely, and the little child was terrified, and continued so until he was released. After another dream, the patient woke up to find himself repeating, McCann! McCann! It occurred to him suddenly that this was the name of the old man. Inquiry of the parents of the patient revealed the fact that an old rag and bone man had lived in such a house as the patient remembered, and that his name was McCann. The result of this recovery of memory, with the explanation of his abnormal fears of closed-in spaces, had a great effect on the patient. A few days afterwards he lost his fear of closed-in spaces, and he afterwards traveled in tube railways and tunnels without discomfort. Indeed, he was so confident of himself at once that he wished Dr. Rivers to lock him up in some subterranean chamber of the hospital as a proof of his cure. The particular point to be noticed here 
is that an entirely forgotten experience continued, apparently, to have an influence upon conscious mental life. Other points of interest are these. That the original experience was an intensely emotional and disturbing one. That the experience was recalled through reflecting on a dream. That the conscious effort of will to banish the unreasoning fears had no effect. That the fearsome experience, though repressed until forgotten, found its way out to consciousness through the repeated emotions of fear. This constant fear was stimulated by being enclosed in spaces, that is, by situations similar to the original one, though that was forgotten. There are many such cases as this on record. A great deal of work has been done on similar lines, and the study of disorders of various kinds having a mental origin has been put on a scientific basis within the last few years. This is not the place to describe the methods of the practitioner. The principles followed depend on individual cases. Dreams Much, probably far too much, has been made of the claim that psychoanalysis may be applied to the interpretation of dreams. The starting point from which Freud's theory was developed was the interpretation of dreams, based on the assumption that dreams are the symbolical expression of repressed tendencies. To claim that every dream is determined by the subconscious working of a repressed tendency is unwarrantable, and the theory is not accepted by those most qualified to speak on the subject. On the other hand, it would be an extreme view, as Dr. William Brown says, to deny meaning to all dreams, and regard them as merely the confused and jumbled reappearances during sleep of memories belonging to the person's past history, strung together in any chance order. The recent work on dream analysis, however, has added immensely to our knowledge, and we now possess a theory which undoubtedly covers a very large part of dream phenomena, even though it certainly does not cover the whole. This theory is, briefly, that a dream is a symbolic fulfillment of a repressed wish. The wish has been repressed because, for one reason or another, its appearance in the conscious mind is attended with pain. But, as we have seen, repressed elements do not lose their vitality. They continue to work and they endeavor, as it were, to manifest themselves in some way or another. Now, during sleep, the barriers between the conscious and the unconscious are to some extent relaxed. Elements which are ruthlessly repressed in the waking life are now subjected to a less severe repression. But these elements cannot emerge in their naked purity, as it were. They exhibit themselves in a disguised form often of the most fantastic description. In this way, the wish secures a partial satisfaction. In his book on the interpretation of dreams, Freud gives a large number of such cases of symbolic fulfillment, and explains the technical process by which these dreams are related to forgotten episodes in the life of the patient. Many of these cases are more ingenious than convincing. Not all dreams are due to repressed wishes. Many dreams are more or less inchoate reproductions of impressions received during the day. Such dreams, however, have a fragmentary character. In very many cases where the dream is a rounded and completed whole, it is also an allegory, a symbolic manifestation of elements which have been repressed into the unconscious. The repressed elements, even so, do not secure complete fulfillment. Repression is still operative, although it is relaxed there is still what Freud calls the censor. Dreams may illustrate very interestingly, in fact, the indirect ways in which psychic energy seeks an outlet, when direct satisfaction is for some reason or another denied it. Many works of art are similar to dreams in this respect. In some cases of very deep and powerful repressed complexes, a dream fulfillment may not be satisfactory. An actual pathological condition may be set up, hysteria, insanity, and dissociations of personality, as in certain well-known cases of double personality, may be caused by the repressed complex. Many cases of this kind were brought into being by the terrible psychic strains of the war. It is admitted that a certain class of dreams may be possible of interpretation, but we cannot discuss the subject further here. It cannot be accepted that Freud's theory of repression accounts satisfactorily for all dreams. Another view is that which regards dreams in quite a different light. Dr. William Brown puts it in these words. The function of a dream is to guard sleep. 
Sleep is an instinct, like fear, flight, and the rest, and has a function which has developed in the course of evolution. At night this instinct of sleep comes into play, but it finds itself in conflict with other instincts and tendencies, as well as with external impulses. Desires, cravings, anxieties, the memories of earlier days, all of which are the lower and fundamental elements of the mind, well up and stride towards consciousness, while the main personality is in abeyance. If they reach consciousness, sleep is at an end. But the dream, which is a sort of intermediary form of consciousness, intervenes and makes the impulses innocuous, so that sleep persists. This theory covers the entire ground of all types of dreams. There are other aspects of abnormal psychology which imply subconscious operation with which we have not dealt. The subject of telepathy, clairvoyance, materializations, and other phenomena which appertain to psychic experience will be discussed by Sir Oliver Lodge in the following chapter. End of Section 22 And End of The Outline of Science, Volume 2, by J. Arthur Thompson Recording by James Christopher, JX Christopher, at yahoo.com, for LibriVox, at LibriVox.org.